little bit. It started off with a raid in Mirror, and it ended up with Ninja clutching it out with Liu Kang at the end. So is Ninja going to start with Liu Kang? But before we go that, big shout-outs to Mountain Dew for powering our instant replay machine as we get to kind of relive these awesome moments throughout the set. But this set was honestly very one-sided. All yeah, Zombat. Awesome moments. <laughs> Zombat uh, the Zombat like highlight. Some awesome moments. It was just Zombat doing some work right now. No awesome. wreck at all, but like, <laughs> man, he just knew. He knew. I mean, look, keeping it close there at the very, very end, it could have gone either way. But Zombat, just on point, even in the mirror match, even against Liu Kang, like, just perfectly calling out the throw attempts, the, the, the very brave decisions to let go of block, hoping a throw would be coming, and just challenging with mids. Zombat was all over it. All right, Ninja Killer, Zombat. It ended up with Liu Kang at the end. Is Ninja going to pick Liu Kang out the gate? Both players free to pick whoever they want at the start of this set. Uh, the read is, I'll probably, I would assume the Raid Mirror again off rip. Yeah. If not, it would be, yeah, it would be the Lou versus Johnny, but like, I feel like the Raid Mirror again off rip. But like, but think about it. Uh, if you're Ninja, like, Raid and, the Raid and Mirror was not working out for him, especially not in the beginning. Like, I, I want to say Zombat took the first game. I mean, he, he could have learned something, but but it still required him to get off of that character and land with Liu Kang. I want to see Liu Kang. I want to see Ninja Killa at their, their, their peak peak performance, Ninja Killa. And I think it's always with Liu Kang. I don't care what game it is. I don't care. Like, it's just that's that's his character. That's that's Ninja Killa. And I'm, oh. and I'm all for it. I'm so hyped to see it. I, I I guess cannot tell you how this is going to end up either way. So it, it's going to be tough. I feel like a reset is definitely possible. Zamba definitely has some great momentum going on. Like you said, it was three two in that winners finals back and forth affair. It just came down to the last decision. Yeah. So it was close. Yeah, it, it, it can go either way. I really feel like, I really feel like it. And that's what I love to see. You know, you don't want to see it like so one sided. You don't want to see it like and and you know as the games evolve, like people learn things and. It's so easy to say, like, yeah, Ninja Killer is just Ninja Killer. They're a completely different, you know, warrior. They're a completely different combatant. Like, they do things that nobody else is doing, and I will never be as good as them. But, you know, Zombat cemented himself in that circle, playing with players like Sonic, playing with players like Ninja, and just, you know, putting in that work. <laughs> and it, it, it's, it's not that many people in this world can say they can go two three with Ninja Killer. Not too many people at all. It's, <laughs> it's definitely a tough challenge to go, um, just, just go with in general. So yeah, it, it's going to be interesting to see um, the matchup and everything like that. But guys, thank you guys for so much for the support. Remember, you guys can sign up for the other um, Pro Cop events that's going to be coming up in the future. For, that's right. Um, number three that's going to be coming up. And make sure you follow NRS Esports as well. Big shout out to production, Nintendo Media, all the guys that's been helping out in the background, been doing such a good job. Make sure this thing runs smoothly. Shout out to Mountain Dew. Shout out to LVB. It's honestly a great time. <laughs> and, um, man, it's... I, <laughs> I can't tell you how this set is going to go for real. I, I truthfully cannot. I mean, it's... Uh. it's Ninja has just been one of those players that... A, again, like, Liu Kang is that core, and, and, and you love to see it. It's, it's kind of like, you know, rooting for the underdog. And, again, looking back at, like, what Ninja Killer was at their inception of, of, of a player, they were someone who was, like infamous for being so good at Mortal Kombat X after Injustice 2 was released, after all the good, quote-unquote, good players moved on, Ninja Killer was still playing MKX, and everyone's just like, well, hold on a second, this guy is probably the best Mortal Kombat player out there, and everyone was like, no, he's just online, he's not playing the current game, and then MK11 came out, it set the stage perfectly, and Ninja Killer cemented himself as one of the best Mortal Kombat players by being able to do what they did. We're living up in any games off rip armor is going to be immediately Goro, Johnny, and Luke Kang Chameleon. Interesting. No Kung Lao this time around. We got the Chameleon on the screen. That means on uh, combos. Like, crazy combos like that. Good block, good block, good block by Zombat. Easy punished here. Johnny Cage just dashing up to you with the speed of light and able to get you before you recover. 
pretty good. Off of it. Sweet. Yeah, so I love I, I love the low profiling there on his wake up, just in case that shadow kick does come out. But it, it got a little wonky there on the punish attempt. Give your support, bro. That's the most damaging throw out of dog three. Oh, but gets clapped by the shadow kick. It's so fast, bro. Hey, frames, this is gonna come in at you. Oh, that overhead is so good. Little corner carry, glaive. So that was, so he kind of like baited out that he was gonna poke back with that against Katana, I'm sorry, against Chameleon and just, just perfectly whip punish there. A lot of people try to uh, know that if you poke the million on the way back with the glaive, you're gonna get a. Um, the glaive doesn't come back, but Ninja being wise, know he's gonna poke back. He did a back dash with the back too. Yeah. yeah. Woke up with the EX Dragon Tail, by the way. This man is crazy. <laughs> like it's MKX. This guy's insane. <laughs> oh my god, that killed. Who is this, who is this guy? The most damaging. And, and remember, 900 health. 900 health on the side of Johnny Cage. 50 of it because of Goro, and another 50 because of Johnny Cage. Hello? What? The combo wasn't done. I thought it was over by now, but apparently not. 422 is going to be the damage. And right now, the pressure is on, but get off me. I am Luke Kang. I'm Fire God. You forgot. I'm old. I'm telling you, man. Ninja Killer just brings something else to the table when it's Luke Kang. Ooh, get off me. It's not best and wise. Kicks go off. Oh, the dragon kick's coming through. And what? Brother, <laughs> brother, 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 brother. Chameleon came onto the screen. I didn't even notice the Molina size, but he did. Got sniped, and that is going to do it. That is crazy. <laughs> I've Ninja. never seen that. And, like, just to have that presence of mind to know which costume is up for Chameleon. Because you don't always, two out of the three times, you don't have access to that specific side. So... He knew it was there. He knew it was up. He knew it was ready. Saw the situation and, and oh man, just cooked him in the air. I love how the brutality like reset him down back on the ground. And just... oh, I had to. It was like, you know what? It was, it was so clean. This is reset him. You know? Let's bring it back. So combat switching up the, I'm sorry, Zombat, formerly known as Combat, <laughs> switching up the, the cameo and going for Chameleon instead of uh, instead of the Goro pick. Oh no, is he get a combo from this? I don't think so. He's only with Katana, so. He, yeah, I was gonna say, I think with Katana he gets the combo. Doesn't watch his feet, but that's okay. Just a little bit of damage taken. Ooh, trying to challenge back with uh, some standing buttons. Katana just getting punched in the face for helping out. It's okay. Oh, he bad enough trying to back dash and still convert that has crazy overhead, but we blocked those. Full combo coming out of Zombat here. Push it to mid screen. Not gonna break his ninja. Combo's pretty much over, but he still has a life lead. Safe jump coming through. Oh, we, we good. We good. We're not so good. Oh, Are we good? Oh, Are, no, we good? No. Are we no. good? Are we good? Are we good? No cojones. It's not looking too good, actually. Sweet. Full stream. Oh, that is a full combo with Melina. That's crazy. <laughs> I'm surprised he didn't hit Melina right there as she, she spawned. Brother. That was so Don't. Don't jump in. I mean, the fact that you you were so confident to anti-air Johnny Cage's jump three, which is almost feels unanti-airable, but you know, it could have been the up block bait, he could have not pressed a button, but ninja all over it. Oh boy. And because you were stuck in the summon animation, you still gotta hold that, and that was gonna be a punish. Then we got a knockdown from the Pop Tart, and guess what? Going right back in. Wait for the carries on deck. It's always there. Super scaled though, but is gonna leave him in a nice spot. It gets up the up against the ropes in the corner. The trade of the glaive, and because the glaive was coming back, knew it was gonna be his turn to swing. Ninja Killer coming off tons of bar here and finds himself in another combo. This is not looking good. It's Chameleon coming out here. Oh, try to. I wonder if that was supposed to be ball roll instead. I, I was. I was gonna say like I don't. I don't see the situation where. Where it would have oh, worked it hit, there. It would have bounced up a little bit, so then he decides what it hit. I see, I see, I see. Okay, okay. Conversion? Oh, yeah, he does. Not gonna break his arm, but... Oh, oh, boy. Oh, the extension. Hello? Ninja's looking for something. Anything. Fall is blocking the glaive, making sure it doesn't. What? No! It whiffs! No way that whiffs! That sucks so much. Oh. That whiff, he was max screen away, and the awareness to do the one-two punish. 
my god. I mean, people talk about spacing when you're talking about normals, you're talking about like sweep range things, you know, making down ones with or challenging, you know, standing buttons with, but there's also spacing at that full to mid screen range as well. You know, he knew exactly where that shadow kick was going to end. Combat was getting a little crazy with shadow kicks throughout this whole set. Just trying to constantly keep him in check there. Ninja Killer threw out the bait and just made it whiff right in front of him. Made it whiff and it's going to cost him dearly. Now he's down 2-0. Zombat needs to bring it back three games straight so he can get the reset. And then another three games to see if he can take the event. Ninja, one game away from doing it two times. Take an NA number one east and NA number two. He can do it. Oh no. He start off so strong, Harma. Could be back to back, back to back winning performances from Ninja Killer. The only person that could stop him right now is Zombat. And this is going to be tough. You got to win three in a row just to reset the bracket. Does, however, get that back throw extension thanks to that katana. And I love how he just keeps the corner here, too. Keeps the corner, gets a position to wait a second. Ninja go on wide. Say, hold on, I know this overhead goes. Side switch too. I don't even know that combo. Works. <laughs> However, you dropped it and you're not ready for prime time. You know what that means. Side back is a chance. What was that conversion? I had no idea you could side switch with that. Oh, he's dead. Oh. Well, you said that to me before. Oh, no, he's gone. He's gone? He's, he's out of here? Is he, he mashing? He, he, he's, he's not getting up from this. No! That Jeez. last hit does so much damage. It's like 14. That oh, last... The rising star, man. Does so that, much damage. It's, it's that last hit. That very last hit after the... No! Just so much. Chest cavity gets caved in by 600-pound camera. <laughs> you hate to see it. Yeah, you need a harness for that. That's going to be a punish. Dash forward into the back 2-3. Little combo push to the corner. Oh, I thought, bro, he wants a sweep anti or he just goes to sweep to low profile. Either way, it worked out for him. Three stand. Nice armor. Oh, no. Because he's I, the bar, he can't break. And just a challenge right on the on the wake up here from Ninja Killer. It's a nice, easy throw. That's going to be match point for Ninja Killer. Ninja on. Oh, this, is, this is too insane. It's too insane. What's the read here? The low does get blocked correctly. Ninja Killer wise to it. And it's it's that low projectile just has so much block stun that like it just locks you in. You want to anti air, but you can't. You literally have to just hold the jump in. Now watching his toes, that second hit of it. That is super unsafe up close like that. And you're not going to want to do that to a player like Ninja Killer. So what a conversion. Is that what? What? Is that done? What? I even though that combo, this combo's not even done yet, and you might go into a brutality, but he does not. Never. Hello? 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 Okay. He got it. He got it. He got it. He do got it. it. Do he, it. Do he, it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Oh, it, my God. You got it, bro. You got it, bro. You In it. pure Ninja Killer fashion, of course he's going to be the showman. Of course he's going to do that extended combo. Just to show that he can do it. Just to show that Ninja Killer is one of the best out there. Ninja Killer back-to-back. Pro Comp NA East Qualifier Champion. He doesn't even need to come back for a third one. He literally doesn't need to come back for a third one. This was the best outcome for him. Why did he do that combo? I thought Zombat was your homie, bro. There was no need for you to style on him like that. That looked kind of destructive. me. See, see, me personally, you had Tell to me. see me outside for combo breaking for that one, bro. I, 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 I just couldn't let that fly, okay? It, it, that, mm -mm. That, that was insane for you to do that to him. Look cool, but that's crazy. That's your homie. There's, I think there's literally only one person in the world that didn't like that combo. <laughs> there's literally just one person in the entire world that was so flashy and so awesome. And on top of that, it's also a newer cameo. So that's like something that was just added to the game and Ninja Killer able to just show it off like nothing. And that, that speaks so much. It's like the signature of Ninja Killer, being able to end a tournament, end a set, just super duper flashy. And I don't think it I don't think it means any respect disrespect yeah. at all. I don't think it means any disrespect <laughs> at all. Ninja Killer back to back champion, dude. Back to back NA East regional qualifier champion. He how did. do you how do you stop this man? He did it. After that.
Hello everyone and welcome back to Mortal Kombat 1 Inter Intercontinental Combat. I'm History Behind the Warrior, joined by none other than Darth Armor on commentary for the European Eastern Regional Qualifier. This is awesome, man. I'm really excited for this. It's a great region. We have a great tournament ahead of us. Um, you know, a lot of legends, you know, who've solidified themselves in this realm of fighting game players. And we're going to be seeing them just duke it out in the most recent Mortal Kombat. And this is just going to be a treat for everyone to watch. I'm excited. I'm also excited to finally be on the broadcast alongside you, my friend. I know it's been literally i guess this is the first time this is literally the first time we've commentated together so mm -hmm. it's, it's I'm, I'm looking forward to it and you're just a, you're just a treat i love seeing everything you're you're involved with i love seeing everything you've done for yourself i love seeing what these guys have done for themselves as we see them going into the top eight fed in from a bigger bracket so the guys who are staying in winners the guys who are staying in losers up at the top a uh, name we haven't seen so far uh throughout this entire competition, Omi, uh, is going to be going up against Magic T. But I know you've got some some stories about Omi. Yes, Omi is quite a prolific player. Definitely one of the uh, enforcers of the Link Way back during Ooh. MK11. Actually, I believe he did win the regional finals for East and West back to back in the same weekend with Sub Zero, of course, during the age of forward two and back three slide. So, you know, <laughs> there's some PTSDs ah. there, but it's good to see that much later down the line, he still retains his form and he still is able to make top eights. Yeah, and he's going to be going up against Magic T, who is one of the most popular streamers out there in terms of, yeah, I feel like just an NRS and, and in the EU for those hours. So big shout outs to Magic T and everything he does on Twitch. Definitely check him out if you want to see some some great high level uh, Molina for the most part is what I've seen from Magic T. Uh, then we have Fish Like Steve versus Takanata. Both players uh, have been in this situation before. Both players have uh, placed pretty high in the first two rounds of qualifiers. Uh, Fish like Steve rocking Astra, uh, sometimes going to Striker. And then we're obviously gonna be going down as the lower bracket. We're gonna bring up the bracket a little bit more. I guess we took too long to get to it because we got a match. We got a match and we're ready for you. Melina versus Sub-Zero. I heard Sub-Zero is not a good character. I don't know about you. I think the age of that opinion has actually, it's changed considering now that we have Chameleon, she's done so much to his utility and toolkit. Covers a lot of the areas in which he's kind of been a little bit weakened. Gives him a little bit of extension in the range. And, you know, the rotational nature of Chameleon kind of gives him a lot of options and versatility with his toolkit now. And, you know, in saying that, he is going up against Magic T of all players. A very, very strong Melina. And, you know, if Hourglass of Rain is anything to prove, is that people have definitely been sleeping and, like, downplaying this character for quite a while. Yeah, just a little bit, you know, a lot of um, a lot of fun set play to deal with along with that Kung Lao hat that hits as a low. You got to watch out for the overhead, you know, the timing, if she can bait you out from like mashing on your wake up. But here's where Sub-Zero does a lot of great pressure. Uh, and look at that, man. Sliding and being able to combo from side is insane. <coughs> Getting tons of damage thanks to both <laughs> cameo call outs here. Pressing buttons and look, she's back to square one, but we ball roll out of here. It's every Melina player there just cheering in the crowd. I felt it in my bones, but really well played from Magic T. When you play against Sub-Zero, one of the things you really hate just being is in that corner. Ice Clone is such a bully in every game it's been in. A little miscalculation there. It looked like the Ice Ball was going to pick up Melina as he used the Melina cameo to knock her out of the sky. And if he just did that ice ball a little bit later, that would have been a convert, but still picks it up anyway after the scramble, getting a little crazy right into the slide. And hey, we got Katana, fa Katana fan lift. Whenever it's coming, whenever it's active, you know Sub-Zero is going to slide because he's just going to cancel out of there just in, in, in case you block it. Yeah, one thing I do want to know, Oh, that was actually kind of sick. I think that was like an extra big level brain read from Omi. We're going for the triple ice clone, trying to read that reversal on the teleport. But, you know, just that range in that corner was not in his favor. And Magic T just goes in, doing a lot of big damage. And as anything, when it comes to just playing against Magic T and his Melina, he looks the set play on every touch. Yeah, that's the set play that we were talking about before. Oh, so you thought he was, you thought you were punishing him. No, 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 no. He's punishing you. 
He's yeah. punishing you. You have to be so cautious. It, it almost kind of like reminds me of like the striker mindset where it's just like, okay, if he's got that cameo ready to go, uh, punishing is not going to be that clear as day. And I think this is going to be it. Not going to build up enough time to, to build a breaker, but oh, drops the combo. Drops the combo. I believe he can do one, one, two. But we still find it. We that still find so it. Cheeky. That was I, so, so cheeky. I mean, also considering what he's risking there. Oh, ho, 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 brutality. I love it. Sending a message in game number one to Magic T. And off with his head. Yep, starting off this top eight in style. One point up to Omi right now against Magic T. And, you know... Whilst Omi definitely couldn't start to control like the, the pace of that match, you know, mm -hmm. like Magic T is never, ever a player you really sleep on. So for Omi to do this right out the gate and start off this top eight this way, mm -hmm. it's definitely sending a message. Oh yeah, big, big time sending a message, and it's it's so cool to see the utility of Sub Zero now with Chameleon, like you touched on a little bit before, you know she's kind of like filled in these holes that he's had in his gameplay before he's made his slide comboable he's made his slide the chameleon has made the slide comboable a little bit more safe or at least an added mind game to how to punish and you know you have the mobility you have the combo extensions from the melina air size like everything really just kind of fitting like a puzzle for sub-zero 100 percent and i think that goes to show like the actual like big importance of how a single cameo can really change a character in this game you know like for a long time a lot of people just originally play paired like reiko with darius now we see a lot of reiko tremor just goes to show the different utility that the cameos really add to this game yeah and they're adding new cameos all the time like we have a whole schedule of cameos and characters coming so the fun's not over yet canceling into the and yeah i think he, he was thinking about oh, oh no he didn't get there in time that. yeah he tried to up block it but then like he didn't hold it or didn't hit it at the right timing um kind of missed the punish there with melina's ball roll so i, I would like omi to, to kind of tighten it up if you will don't 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 let those opportunities get by you True, but insane. Bat does get hit with the glaive, getting full combo punish, and this is going to do a lot. Yep, that's 37%. And this originally wasn't damage that you really saw Sub Zero do on the game's release. So, again, man, it's just, it goes to show what Chameleon has allowed him to do just reinforce his pressure and just kind of bully his way in right now. Yeah, yeah, he's just kind of like, just, just going head first. Like, I need to get this done, I need to do this. Oh, that was so sick. Now, one thing I do want to point out that I've been seeing Omi do quite a bit, and I believe it, it's kind of what I would deem to be the MK1 special, is down one into special. Like, we see a lot of Raiden into down one Storm Cell. Omi's been landing, like, was it? Must be three for three or three out of four when it comes to down one into slide. He's getting full combo punish off Chameleon Assist like that, because it gives him that air combo that he needs. Yeah, and even the, the, the mind game of slide there, normally the string ends with an overhead, but instead, canceling it into the slide, so of course it's going to hit. Oh, the combo into Ice Ball. I love it. Haven't seen that since the beta days <laughs> with uh, Sub-Zero and Kano. Oh, this is the breaker right out of Omi. Full screen slide. That was man believed into the one, two. Nice, nah, gonna get the full corner combo. This isn't gonna kill, it's gonna scale pretty heavily, but it's gonna be off the Ice Clone, the Oki that grants him. Ooh, by the Stray Glaive, and I think we're gonna get another Brutality in round two. Yes, we are. <sighs> they never get sick of it. They never get sick of it. It's just an easy, it's like a great Brutality to like combo into, depending on the string. You can even like non-combo into the Brutality if you kill someone with a down one and you cancel into slide. It doesn't combo, but the game still gives you a Brutality. I mean, so much style. And I will say it's one of the, uh, the pleasures, I suppose, of commentating this game in its lifespan as we go from patch to patch is that we do get to see a lot of characters like this like sub-zero gum release was deemed as one of the weaker characters of the game kind of grow and flourish in its own way i think you know shout outs to mk javier you know scorpion loyalist went overseas did extremely well at liga latina and goes to show that you know people might be downplaying some of these characters and you know the impact of patches is starting to really affect everyone in like the grand calculus of this 
I mean, look, who's downplaying? Who's downplaying the characters? The people playing <laughs> the characters. So it's it's propaganda. It's, <laughs> that's that's how I see it. No, no, it, it really is impressive. I love seeing underdogs. I love seeing people using you know underused characters because it, it just gives it gives the game a little bit more variety. He's getting crazy with that, but look, he went to go. He blocked the slide. He went to go punish, and now who's in the combo? You tell me who's in the combo right now. That is so sick, because that is the extra edit uh, layer added to mind game. Something I pointed out, of course, was the down one to slide special. Now, Omi knowing that magic, he's keeping an eye out for it, canceling into the upwards jump, crossing up, going into the dive kit, getting full combo punish, man. Like, that is just crazy. Insane, man. It is so good. Oh, love the stagger here for Magic T, but he drops the combo. So unfortunate. He was going for the crispy optimal right there, but he did come at his tournament life. And, well, let's say tournament life. Match life as Omi is on match point right now. Ooh, good, good call out there with the teleport to get around the ice clone. You kind of have to anticipate that ice clone. Certain moves will go through it. Moves like Kung Lao's low hat. Mm -hmm. Nice hit confirm and even faster reactions with that breaker. Ooh, that was actually quite smart right there, but the neutral jump to the forward one, two into the slide. Just constant checking off that button. This is gonna be a full combo right now. Omi has the corner to work. We're gonna go into the ice clone. Yep, into the dive kick. Gonna get a bit of Oki off this as well. The challenge as soon as he landed, ready to test those standing buttons. Awesome, do love damage. Gonna go for the setup in the mix. Beautiful blocks from Omi as well. The neutral duck ends in the overhead. Goes into the low. <gasps> Just the neutral it. ducks it. But yeah, forces the breakout of Magic D. This is so intense. This is so close to down one. Stopping him in his tracks. The low, is it gonna be enough? Ah, that was the, he, he, he bet it all. Of course, the end of that string is overhead. He was like, I'm going into slide because you have to guess it. But very well played from Omi. It's nice to see him back, but does send Magic T to lose his side now, quite decisively with a free O. Now that last round, I, I think Omi really deserved it after he blocked that hard to blockable in the corner. Uh... It was just perfect set play. It was great placement. It was great placement by Magic T. And Omi was just, just ready. Just ready for it. And that that is super hard to do with the pressure on. He had great call outs on those throws, great call outs on those highs, a lot of ducking. Um, but I, I, I feel like he's he's getting really aggressive, really feeling himself, if you will. So I love to see that kind of gameplay. Mm -hmm. That was uh that was pretty straightforward, man. 3 0, super decisive very decisive and here's the thing right as i pointed out just before we started i think this is the first like online tournament omi's participated in in quite a while as well yeah. from what i've seen so to have such a, a big display on a grand stage like this is very very impressive yeah especially because like it's just a, such a, a a strange you know instance where like you're just not used to it everybody like the pressure is on you know the points are up for grabs the money's up for grabs uh but omi's killing it you know solidifying the spot into winner's finals here just taking it 3-0 over someone who's pretty much a veteran at this point um that, yeah. chame that chameleon doing doing so many wonders for sub-zero i really love the synergy here very very much so but with that said that means we'll be diving deeper into our bracket, so Omi will be going on to winner's finals, which means that our next match will be Fish Like Steve against Vat of Takenada. And we are we're gonna have a bit of a bloodbath in our match, I feel, because I believe we're gonna have Ashra against Baraka. Both characters that just throw out devastating damage on every sneeze. They are they are just monsters in this game. On top of throwing out damage, also the range of these characters, you know, the extended hitboxes from Ashra's sword, extended hitboxes from Baraka's, you know, arm blades. It's just it's just a great way to kind of, you know, have more options in terms of like, when can I hit you? When can I apply that damage? It very much so is that. And I think because of that and being quite familiar with both these players, it very well could be quite momentum heavy because once they like getting the ball rolling, they really like to enforce their game plan, kind of suffocate their opponent and just put them out as quick as possible. And it's quite understandable in a tournament set because it, if you can just overwhelm your opponent and just flush out the set as quick as possible, man, 
it's pretty good for that morale, especially this early in the top eight. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely, definitely good to have all those things in mind. All right, whose overhead do you think is better, Ashra's or Baraka's? Baraka's. Baraka's. Everyone says they can block back three like they could. They said they could react to Sub Zero's forward two and MK11. You're not. You're just getting hit by it. <laughs> <laughs> You're just getting hit by it. It anti airs as well sometimes. That's the crazy thing. That that is the crazy thing. With me, like I feel like I personally have a hard time blocking Ashra's overhead only because like the beginning animation of it looks like a jump. So in my head, I'm like, oh, I have time to anti air. Let me let go a block. Oh wait, I'm getting hit. <laughs> So that, that's just me. I, I just, just, just curious. Just wanted to put you on the spot there and see. <laughs> I, I want to see what you think. I want to see how you feel about it. Well, let, let's not forget. I, I was there during the analogy last year where the age of Baraka Sarax was born from Azerbaijan. So that's right. <laughs> I saw it during its prime. That said, let's quickly jump back into our match as Fish Like Steve starting things off with a pretty hefty life lead, I must say. And keep in mind, Baraka has, well, at least paired with Kano, has a smaller health pool. So it's currently a 950 health bar up against a 1051. Yeah, yeah. So pretty much like a, around a 10% difference in terms of mm. like how much more you can do to them. Here comes the Kano ball to force uh, fish like Steve to block that as that Kano ball does hit mid. So any projectiles is going to be a little bit extra chip damage. Uh, and backing off, really no reason to go in. Instead, getting bit for your troubles. But hey, here comes the Kano knives. Here comes the pressure afterwards. Good block of the low and good challenge afterwards. Not sure what Takanato was doing, but he definitely was not blocking. Yes, no. Fish like Steve playing very methodical, honestly. He's, he's taking his time, choosing to overextend. And when he feels like Takanato's are going to overextend, just gonna throw out uh serena and something i do want to point out is that this is a team that i i feel like has only grown much stronger with time especially with seeing players like uh, shouts to another eu player makaran who's been using the defensive aspect of serena to kind of absorb the hit and then take the favorable trade it's it's been a very very formidable team yeah, it's really cool whenever you need to like dive into that and you know give up half your cameo bar to you know get that clean hit, get that clean pressure. Oh, the jump in kick pressed a little too early, didn't make the connection, but does get the back throw. Here comes the Kano afterwards, and smart of fish like Steve to duck under the knives to kind of minimize you know the the chip damage. Yeah, negate as much as possible. That's the thing with both of these characters and talking about the life as we did earlier. Every touch really does matter, but I feel like it's definitely more so for Takinada in that sense because of how small Baraka's life ball is. And even said, with fish like Steve in Fatal Blow territory, he actually could take this round off one touch. If he gets the right hit, he can actually still win this. But with 15 seconds left on the clock right now, Takinada just needs to back up. Let fish like Steve overextend, punish him for it accordingly. Yeah, Fish Like Steve needs to make the move right now. Five seconds left. You need to find it. Serena draining too much time. Why are you backing off? Are you just oh, yeah, waiting? He's, yeah, he's just content. Not, not even trying. Okay, we had another round to work with, but that's okay. Yeah, I feel like Fish Like Steve was quite content. If he jumps in, he's going to... If he stops attacking Takanado, he's going to give him a little bit of meter going into that next game. Maybe wanted to just prevent that, not give him that break. But he needed that a beautiful neutral duck into a full combo punish. And this is going to do a lot, especially with the corner in play. And the crumple state. And yep, just Ashra doing Ashra damage. I was looking for that. Mates gets clipped with the wake up down one. I almost feel like he's, he's fish like Steve is just so ready for those Kano knives, not respecting any of it. A little bit of overextension here from Takanada, committed to a button as he jumped to the air, but nobody was home. Fish like Steve using that great walk back speed from Ashra. Wonderful, but this I don't know if this will be enough, but it's gonna do a lot of damage if he spends enough meter. And yep, just <laughs> enough. I don't know why I was wondering. It's it's just it's Ashra. <laughs> it's the <laughs> so much damage. You forgot which one, which which of the characters had 950 health. It was definitely yeah. Baraka, and uh, it uh, it hurts. I mean, a lot of times you think it's not going to come into play, but if you think about it, it literally comes into play almost every single game that you lose. Every single game that you lose, it's uh, I could have died or I could have survived. It really is the case, and I feel like we're definitely seeing a lot more of that as the game's lifespan has gone on. Because, of course, now we're in the game's current meta and state, we do have two characters with 900 health, which is uh, both Johnny Cage and Quan Chi. Now, of course, in the recent patch, 
with the buffs that Korn now has, we can see why he has that 900 health. He's quite the juggernaut at this point. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He's, uh, I feel like for a long time debated in the conversation for possibly the best character in the game. So not too much has changed. Uh, if you ask any one who's not a, not a Johnny Cage player, not too much has changed. <laughs> There's the overhead I was mentioning before from Ashra. I feel like that was the first time we really saw it come into play and it was blocked like nothing. So maybe it's just me. Uh oh, and then right after I say that, the Barack overhead works. Yep, it's gonna apply for bleed as well. And this will slowly take down over time. And something I do want to point out, uh, tucker has been going for like a lot of low, just point blank down ones at the start of this game, just staggering fish like Steve. He's playing a way, way different from what we saw earlier. Yeah, seeing so, you know, again, the, the utility here with those Kano knives, I think uh, I, th I think Fish Like Steve is purposely taking the last hit of the Baraka Barrage to not be forced to block those Kano knives because it'll leave Baraka super duper plus. So you'd rather give up some health and, and just be on knockdown versus super negative. You get challenged again afterwards, just like last game. Yeah, unfortunate for fish like Steve to get that punish, but didn't have the meter to capitalize off it. But down one into spin, it's just eternal, man. Just down one special, so strong. It's been a win. I feel like we've uh, we, we've said that for a lot of moves throughout all of NRS history. It's been to oh. win. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's eternal, my friend. Eternal. <laughs> for blocks, Steve now opting for the dark starts. Oh, no, with punish off the string. Yeah, it's just pressing button into down one, just constantly challenging fish like Steve. Seems, seems to be kind of suffocating him. Yeah. Yeah, I want to see. I want to see fish like Steve like challenging back in those instances, but he's like too scared to because of that. And that this is the situation I'm talking about. Forced to block those 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 Kano knives afterwards leaves Baraka super duper plus. Fish like Steve finding the hit, getting a little bit of damage on. Good blocks here from Takanada, knowing the second hit of that string is a low. Just backing off, trying to bait him. That was bait, 100%, and Steve did not take it. You purposely threw yourself at super negative. You purposely whipped in front of me just so I would take the bait to eat those Kano knives. Mm, and something I actually want to point out, because we did touch on it at the very start of this game. I don't think we... That was really sick. Right <laughs> that was way. super sick. That was super sick. Uh, we actually haven't seen Steve actually go for Ashra's overhead just one time in the beginning of this game it got blocked and he never went for it again mm, that's quite interesting keep in mind because you know when you you play against someone and you don't utilize a tool it might be an instance of they may be saving it for a last game last round scenario where they can throw it out and it's at that point it might be guaranteed to hit see we'll see what happens right now takanada slamming on you know that back button trying to get away a little bit of a trade for both players but who's gonna get the better hand now we got the dark stance is gonna have a little bit more full screen presence but not as much vertical presence as the light stance over the other side but didn't get there just in time and we're just gonna armor our way out of here yeah Sony takanada has realized that steve does like to throw out those point blank serena ranks that do come back now quite comfortable just ducking he's got a screen to work with gonna go for the four fours gonna go into the spin beautiful flawless block on back gets the back three just checking the knees over and over again that down four is such great range and just puts baraka at super duper plus on hit and very easy to recognize the low the low connected had that been the double rang that would have been this would have been a completely different story but takanada lives to see another day <gasps> he baited it out that was so smart that yeah, was so smart this. yep this this i don't think this is going to kill i think it's going to lead to bleed state yeah yeah so this one does uh i want to say th like 30 or three percent less damage but you're left in a bleeding state so all he has to do is make him block like two or three more things that's two Two more yeah. things and he's guaranteed. Ducks under it. Last, Last breath, breath, no more. No more, nothing. You have to follow this block from here on out if you want to survive. You've yeah, got to follow this block. seconds left on the clock. This is absolutely in Takanada's favor, but Steve, not choosing to overextend. Oh, what a... oh, Serena doesn't count. Serena doesn't count. You can't die from the cameo. No. So much patience being shown, but Takanada, very smart to just back up, play things a little bit slow, a little methodical. Get some uh, cameo trades in there, which I was very surprised <laughs> to see, but very well played.
Yeah, so so when you hit the cameo in this game, you get at the at the round start, you or the first round start, you get the bonus meter, but uh you can't kill anyone by hitting their cameo. You have mm-hmm. to kill you have to hit the main character. So, you know, at the end there you saw fish like Steve had absolutely no meter at all and no way to kind of avoid that projectile. So kind of threw that Serena out there, threw her out to the wolves because it doesn't matter if you get hit. It only matters if I get hit. You know, that is very, very true. And it's also a little important thing when it comes to cameos. It's the defensive properties they have are actually super duper good. And I feel like the defensive properties have only been highlighted through the inclusion of Tremor. Now, Tremor, when it comes to switching out his cameo or switching out his variation for that matter, he stands out a little bit in front of you, and because of that, his defensive properties allow you to actually shut down some uh, some of your opponent's projectiles. It's super duper good. Yeah, I think it's super good too. Just like a great way to like tank a hit, popping him up for a big combo. Misses the little bit of the ender though, but keeps the defense going, challenging. Now, I, I see that a lot from Fish Like Sea, challenging with those stand buttons. And I think, you know, Takanata can kind of whiff onto it. And, you know, if, if you go for like a very offensive, like micro duck afterwards, like when you know a challenge is coming, you can see right through it. No, very, very true, but right now, Fish Like Steve bringing things back in comparison to what we saw in the previous game, forces the break right out of Takanada, but, ooh, gets caught with the jab into the rang. There it is again. I'm cringing a little bit. I don't I don't like that breaker just because of the whole, the whole scenario. Like, he had a huge life deficit by the point of, you know, when he used that breaker. It just seemed very bleak. Here comes the armor, as we saw before, eating through that gap. Oh, interesting over- way of trying to cover your tracks there. The overhead easily blocked over and over again. The down four, super duper plus frames, knowing he's going to be holding on to the block because of it. And that's when Fish Like Steve striking in with throws. Back to back forward throws from Serena. Is he going to do it again? No, backs off. You never know, just spacing things out. This is like the most appropriate and comfortable space where Osho wants to be, but oh, and saying that Baraka of some range of his own goes into the back. 3-1 to the 2-1 into the spin. Gonna bring things back to the middle of the screen. Great awareness. Yeah, I think normally Fish Like Steve would have liked the breaker, but the Serena got hit, so breaker was not accessible for three seconds. It was just too deep into the combo anyway. So Takanato really bringing this back here after some bad decisions in that first round. Gets the back throw, corner back on his side. Takanata poking back with those down fours, doing so much. That's the challenge that we see time and time again. Are we gonna pick up on that? Yes, on. Oh, Takanata playing quite fearless in that game. I must be said, he was challenging a lot of fish like Steve's, uh, just like plus frames, his presence, and his screen control, considering the previous round. You know, like the range of Ashura is always something to kind of contest with. Yeah. Oh, this is a scary oh, time. Yeah. You think it's your turn, but it's not. Here comes the cancel into some good, good damage. Down four trades. He's backing off. Takanada's got a nice little life lead here. Can he hold on to it? Can he solidify it even more? Chipping away any little bit he can. Didn't believe the full string was coming. Instead, went to go challenge the stagger opportunity. Don't want to whiff like that. You don't want to whiff like that. Definitely not against Baraka of all characters, and Steve has to break that. Keep himself in the game because he started off this rap, this game in particular, like very, very strong. And Takanali slowly but surely just been pulling things back. And that life deficit we've been talking about doesn't seem to be as much of an issue right now. Yeah, and it's, 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 I think Fish like Steve playing in a very uncomfortable position. Um, you know, at full screen, Ashra's projectile doesn't really go there. There's the overhead. You were right. You were right. Baraka's overhead is better. Yeah, like, that's the thing, right? As we pointed out at the very start of it, we're like, who's overhead is better? I'm just like, Ashra's one's really cool, but it, it's been blocked more times in this set and whiffed, and Takanada's one's been landing. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely more of a success rate for uh, Takanada's overhead. Um, you know, could be per- personal preference, could be the, the threat of the Kano. Um, so what we were saying before there with, with Takanata sitting on that life lead, sitting back, I feel like because of Kano Nice, because of Kano Ball, and even just Baraka's projectile, like at full, full screen, he's got more options. Serena ranks don't quite go full screen. 
Ashra's light projectile doesn't quite go full screen. So I think Takanata is kind of picking up on that that idea, that the fact of like, I will take a little bit of a life lead, even if it's just a little bit, and it'll be in my benefit to just back off and just do little damage, little by little by little. You even see it with the combination, Kano Ball into the, the Blade Spark, a really, really good uh, combo here, like that. Forcing, you have to block that. You can't not block that. Yeah, absolutely needed. In some instances, with some particular characters, you may choose to want to be hit by the Kano Ball. Like, let's say, for example, uh, Raid and Kano, for example, very, very popular team. You may want to just be hit by the Kano Ball because you just don't want to be jailed because of that offense. So, with that said, we don't see that same kind of style and mindset applied with Takanada, but he's, he's kind of using a similar format, but changing it up so it's tailored more towards Baraka's offense. Oh, beautiful catch, and Fish Like Steve starting off this game very strong like he did previously. However, if he is able to maintain that momentum, that is yet to be seen. See what happens here. Takanata was able to kind of run away with it last time. There's the overhead, just dashing up, and thanks to the double Serena ranks, able to continue the combo, keeping him there. And I love the challenge from Takanata right away. Just showing him, like, no, I know I can swing after this. I know you're not pressing anything after this. And in case you do, you're going to get comboed. Back throw from Takanata, challenging afterwards. And the respect from both players. Actually, no, never mind. The respect from Fish like Steve. Takanata is pressing and pressing and pressing. And Steve is just trying to catch his breath. And Takanata needs to make it happen now. He smells blood in the water. He's going in hard. Yeah, beautiful flawless block fish like Steve negating the chip, but there it is. The back three one drops the combo. Can check the back one, goes with two one, down ones constantly from Takanada, just kind of threading and weaving his way in and out. Yeah, he's I, I feel like he's in, he was in control. Good block of the overhead, but didn't let go of, uh, of block for that second rang. If had he done that, I think he could have at least gotten like a downpour check on the way back. Whiffing. He's whiffing. He was. Who was he swinging at? Who? Yeah. Who was he swinging at? No one was there. Well, that's the funny thing, right? Like what Takanada? The way Takanada has been playing since the second game, he has been throwing out. But I think it's to largely challenge the range that Fish Like Steve does have. There's five it's... seconds left on the clock. There's no yeah. time. Oh, yeah. There's the break. I don't know if I'd agree to using the breaker right now. What? Oh, no way. Whoa. He just pulled that off. No way. He just pulled that off. <laughs> Okay, all right, we are firmly believing just goes into the low into fatal blow that mind you does not scale with one no. second on the clock literally one That was so clutch. I mean, that's what he bet it all on and it was it was it's the mix-up I mean that that low could have easily been the overhead It still would have had enough time to go right into fatal blow because that was the only option I have to I have to dash in and mix, and by the skin of his teeth, Fish Like Steve brings it to a game five. Yep, tying up two and two apiece. And I uh, meant, like, I even pointed out at the very start of it, this this match is going to be a bit of a, a bloodbath between the two. It's always going to be very momentum heavy, but I did oh. not expect it to literally be this close coming down to the final second. But Takanada Don't do it. Don't do it. floating over subs. Oh, Don't oh. Do it. There we go. All right. We're, we're choosing to stick <laughs> to our it. guns here. Yeah. There can Fair be enough. only one. Only Ami. Mm. Ami, so we... Omi. Omi. <laughs> Omi. Omi. Thank you. But that means we could have very well, if Takanada wins, we could get a sub zero winner's final. You never know. Oh my god. Then then the downplay has to stop. Yeah, then it will definitely have to stop. Forced to stop. Like they're going to, a court order to stop all downplay from all sub zero <laughs> players. Just kidding. All right, back, back throw here. Fish like Steve starting off great. And, you know, still riding on the coattails of that momentum from that last big brain play at the end of game number four. Like, huge. I can't believe he just did it. Kano, get out of here. You're not. You're not free. This is a Kano free zone. Oh, he challenged perfectly right before the active frames came out of Asher's sword. It just got stopped completely in its tracks. Beautiful blocks right now from Fish like Steve. Oh, does get clipped. Did he think that down two was going to hit Kato? That was, it, it could have. It could have easily. I think he might have been just a little too far away. I do believe so. The, the range of like Ushers down two is quite deceptive in nature. It, it can reach quite far, but that may have just been a bit of an overextension there from Steve. 
trying to stay out of that down four range. You can see fish like Steve trying to, to make it whiff, but even if you do make it whiff, you have to be like ready and on point to, to go for the whiff punish here. Ooh, beautiful spacing right there from Takenada. Looking to tie things up, put himself in match points. Fish like Steve's got to tap in here. This is do or die for him. Do or die from single ranks coming out to try to just kind of pester away at knocking out of defense. Yeah, a lot of slow gameplay compared to what we have seen previously, but oh, the stray two ones gonna catch fists like Steve, force him in the corner. The Canada looking in a very favorable position, looks for the meaty 4-4s, four gonna be covered by the Kano knives. Super corner. Super plus after those Kano knives, after you force them to block. Uh, really not in your best interest to, to, to poke back afterwards. You're gonna get stuffed. You're gonna get stuffed easily. Saying that, this is also a very comfortable position for fish like Steve, actually staying at this particular range, but Takanada doesn't want to have to deal with that. He wants to get in, do as much damage as possible. This could be a one-touch death scenario, depending on what he's hit by, but oh, straight overhead. And he didn't really commit to the uppercut afterwards. I think he's just kind of testing it out and maybe even just keeping that in mind of, hey, here comes the low instead. Next time I need it to kill you. Draining the meter, draining the meter. Not going to be doing extra damage. So not enough. Gave up the corner positioning as well. But I think if Fish Like Steve takes the round, I think that's fine. I think that's good enough for him. But watch out, Takanata on the jump in. Takanata with the overhead. Oh, this is oh, it. My days. <laughs> oh, Clean. Christ, it's always come down. Like, these two have been running down the clock as far as they possibly could. It is yeah. insane. But Takanada is going to take it over Fish like Steve. 3-2. Which means he will now advance to winner's finals against Omi. It was, it was just so poetic and perfect. Like, almost cinematic. The way that, that Fish like Steve brought it to a game five. And the way that Takanada ended the set like okay you're gonna do that to me he did it right back to him with an overhead instead of a low had access to the fatal blow and you know the the clock was ticking that was definitely fish like steve's round to lose and takanata just came out of nowhere with that overhead and again such a great set between both these players the entire time like you couldn't get any closer you couldn't get any more back and forth and just the adaptation over and over again as you can see there takanata knowing that the pressure was on knowing that fish like steve looking to to use that cameo to get out of dodge to use Use that cameo to, to to alleviate some of the pressure and just easily baiting it, backing off. And there's the other overhead, of course, throughout this set. That Baraka overhead doing so so much work. But here's the big brain play. Ooh, dash up. Here comes the low <laughs> fatal blow. I thought you were gonna lose it. I thought you were gonna lose it, bro. Like, that was definitely <laughs> the last thing in my mind. But yeah, as as pointed out at the very start. Baraka overhead, no one's reacting to that. You're just getting clipped by it every time. Look, we're we're scientists, okay? <laughs> we're scientists. We're 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 conducting research. We're figuring it out. We're 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 making notes. Baraka's overhead is good. <laughs> I don't want to hear anything else. That's it. Case closed. <laughs> Loser side. We didn't really get to touch too much on that. Uh mm -hmm. we got uh Ben rocking the Tanya Goro. We could get the mirror match against H Dope. Uh, and then on the other side of the loser side, we got Disarded versus K-Top. Now, Disarded playing a bunch of different characters. And, and K-Top, for the most part, also Rock and Tanya, if I'm, not, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Has previously used Tanya, but in previous NeverRealm games, he's obviously used Raiden. And I, mm. I think in the last qualifier he played in, he opted to, of course, go with one of the more popular teams currently, Raiden Kano. And I don't see a reason why he shouldn't play that team. But it's a good team. Yes, <laughs> it is a very, very strong, formidable team. But one thing I do want to point from the players in Losers Round 1 is that three of the four of them, uh, I believe, actually made it into the last qualifiers top eights. And Disarted did make it into the first qualifier top, uh, top eight. So again, these are these are these are players that were we're used to seeing, like I said, legends for a long time in the uh, in the realm of the NRS games, if you will, not to be redundant with you know realm NRS realm. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's all blending together. It's, it's all blending in, but yeah, it's 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 cool to see again, like these these parts of the world getting this exposure, the parts of the world getting these opportunities to you know put on 
you know, not only just for, for us at home, but just put on for the community to represent themselves. And, and then a really, really big shout out to the whole pro comp scene just for, you know, putting something out there for them. And, you know, I love seeing the opportunities going to, to anyone. You know, I want to I want to reach the whole world, if you will. I want to I want to see the love for Mortal Kombat go as far as we possibly can. And one day we will get there. Absolutely. And, you know, that's the beauty of this scene as the more and the more time it's put into things. You know, we're seeing more and more offline events. The scene just grow more and more every day when it comes to offline and online tournaments. So it's great to see them here. But saying that, right now, decide opting for an extremely strong team and one we just saw with Baraka Kano. Of course, since the most recent patch, Baraka Striker that isn't a team we typically see anymore. Of course, for the changes that have been applied to Striker, Kano seems to be the next big best choice for him. Yeah, Kano's pretty good. It's it's, and I, I think people are kind of uh, testing. Hey, in case Striker like really really gets nerfed, not not this fake nerf that happened. If in case he really gets nerfed, uh, let's let's explore some other options here. Uh, now of course Kano Kano knives are high, but you know something that Striker doesn't have the utility of that Kano ball as we can kind of see here a little bit more in, in the hands of the started Kano ball coming out and 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 kind of being his way in but K top not letting him shake it not not really like what real estate did K top just give up I mean I know they're not hitting each other but just the walking the pace look what side of the corner we're on and then they're just fighting back and forth for position here super important in a fighting game very much so and one it's also something I did want to kind of touch on and since you yourself are from you know, the New Jersey scene. There's always been a difference of style when it comes to the European style of play and that of the American style of play. I tell you, it's a uh, different uh, it, it, in terms of like what you have to do to to succeed. Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be different, a different mindset approach. You know, some 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 players love pressing buttons and some players love watching you press buttons. Saying that, however, let's talk about that very big neutral jump from this side. Definitely scoping out a little bit of what K-Top is doing. Now, something I do want to point out, and this has definitely been one of the weaknesses with Tanya as a character. If you jump a lot, it seems like you can avoid a majority of her offense. I mean, you have some of the strong jump in, like Baraka, you can really enforce your game plan. And, oh, there's the unseeable overhead. It's ugly. That was ugly. I love it. So by ugly, it's, it's it's every compliment. Every compliment I could give you. I just love seeing the dirt. I love seeing the the the, the dirty stuff, if you will. Yes, but again, there's the back three, the unseeable, getting clipped. Okay, now one round apiece. Okay, top can absolutely bring things back. Definitely has his throw text on point right now, but Zod is never, ever a player you actually sleep on. Oh, oh catches him up the sky. I think if that was a jump kick, it might have hit her out of that, but I'm also not very sure. What a strange little interaction there. Chandeliering her way into the corner. Here comes Kano Ball for the easy hit. And and that's that. I was actually talking about it yesterday when when Tanya's fighting against Kenshi. You know, her moves are like multiple hitting and they're all around her because she's like spinning around. So it's a great way to kind of stop you know, a 2v1 situation, uh, whenever, whether it's, you know, a Kano cameo like it is in this case, or what or if she's like fighting a Sento. Like, get off of me. Like, everyone, get off of me. You're behind me, you're in front of me. Like, I get moves to get you off. Yep, that is kind of one of the beauties of this character, because that's also a special that can be utilized in the oh. air, but oh, beautiful reaction right there from this side, knowing that K-Top was going for it. And this is going to even things out pretty pretty well i think this is gonna put k top and maybe yeah near fatal blow that bleed state's gonna go down right into it yeah especially if he forces him to block some things with that kano ball yeah there, there it is go. force block it's close man but now it's not close gonna go for the breaker, breaker right here yep goro coming in with the assist <gasps> whiff it for days but he doesn't get punished just a lot of pressing right there yeah at that point the solid just kept pressing kept enforcing his game plan it's felt like K-Top was a little bit reluctant to press a little bit after that breaker came out. Was a little bit scared of that range that Baraka's infamous for. What I saw there was a deer caught in headlights. Like, that yeah. was the opportunity. And, you know, sometimes you're just, like, overwhelmed by the opportunity. You're like, oh, my gosh, everything's telling me to hit. Uh, it, could have, it could be a little PTSD from, like, playing a Baraka striker where... 
they're whiffing and you're like, no, don't punish because if I try to punish, I'm going to get punished because of striker grenades. Um, but it's it, it could be the pressure, it could be anything. But I, I definitely think the opportunity was there, especially when you have a character like Tanya with such great range, great buttons, standing challenge, easily could have won K-Top that game. But hopefully K-Top is shaking it off, not too cemented in that, 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 that dropped opportunity, that dropped potential win. Look at that. Just like that. Now we're seeing it. Now we're seeing K-Top here coming in heavy. Yeah, applying a lot of damage. Seems like he's a bit more comfortable in this round. Maybe needed that first loss just to kind of adjust to the start of game plan, but gets clipped by the low of that back three. So good. 2-1 into the, the spin. I, that carry is insane as well. That took him from, was it the right side of the screen? Right bang into the middle. Yeah, it was a very, very far corner carry, if you will. And then pop up. Not going to have enough for that breaker. It's going to use the fatal blow here. Yes, he does. Is that this might just actually be enough, I believe. Toro is giving you less damage. Uh, yeah, I think this is it. They're mashing for their life, though. Yep, that is more than enough. Gonna seal things out right now. The solid game up despite a very strong start from Kate's off that game. Super strong start. Watch your life deficit and change. Definitely felt quite a bit of a factor here. Or full combo punish. Gonna have the corner. Gonna go for the buff. Gonna kind of bully the sorted, but he's gotta be careful here because this is where the sorted did bring things back. And there's the overhead once again. The two one getting grounded and crushes the armor. <laughs> now, something I do want to bring up, and I, I noticed this in the previous game, the Salted has been staggering a little bit with back three. And that's largely due to the fact that when it comes to, you know, Tanya, her armored, uh, her armored option, super good, has the carry. Because of that, the Salted's been going for the back three, knowing full well that hits twice and has armor breaking properties. So he's kind of been staggering with it in order to challenge Ktop. But there's the neutral jump as pointed out, and Big damage being applied here, placing him in right in the corner, and yep. You, you should even see that he tried to break the armor there. Going right into the Fatal Blow. Uh, 950 character, thanks to Kano, you're losing around 50, 50 of your health, so... If it's not death, it's very, very close. Yes, this will be chip territory, and the chip is something that Tanya is quite comfortable with applying. There it is. Hey, what Guaranteed win. What were you going to do about armor into Goro? <laughs> Just nothing. flawless block and pray, my friend. Nothing. I mean, even if you do, Goro, the Goro coming out. Oh, I'm plus and it's still my turn. Flawless block something else. Ooh, cancels the charge. Very sneaky stuff there from the side. K-Top slowing the game plan down a little bit. Definitely needs a bit of a breather here, considering that the side does have a tiny, tiny life lead. Just a little buff. bit. Yeah. No, again, we, we saw shades of this before. If you can get the conversion from that jump cancel, it does, however, get that back throw. But in doing so, rewarding to start it with so much real estate. To start it getting opened up, whipping that down one, and forced to use that breaker. And I think K Top's kind of picking up on that range of the Kano ball. It doesn't really go full screen, but, you know, just kind of not letting the smoke and mirrors really bother him that was a sick combo oh that was even a, that was an even sicker jump in to start it yes sign this up that is something about. that k top needs to be careful of always with the jumping options so good against Tanya as a character but all oh, the blocks right now from the side down one to spin goes into the kano ball but beautiful massive challenge off there with k top Bringing it back, making it 1-1. One, one. Yeah, I feel like a lot of players aren't willing to press after they block a Kano Ball because it is an ambush and it has nothing to do with the main character's recovery. Um, but in that situation, that was the right call from K-Top. Disarted went for, I believe, a slower option in either the back three or the forward three um, to try to apply you know, a pseudo mix-up, uh, thinking that, hey, he just bought Kano Ball. There's no way he's going to press a button. So I am free to go with my slower mix-up moves. Just kidding. K-Top slamming those buttons, slamming that challenge with those stand, that stand one. And uh, that was great, man. That was that was a really good call out. Oh, yeah. It always comes down to the option, really, when in this game, because uh, Armored... Reversal armored launches were kind of an MK thing. They didn't come back for MK11. So with that being absent for like six years, now of them back, 
every it's catching a lot of people off guard who've become very accustomed from Eleven's style of play. Yeah, just getting getting used to it. <laughs> it's like coming back. Certain characters have it. Certain characters have it. Certain characters don't. Yeah, it was something I do want to touch on that we did see there another big overhead and Desarda has been landing these quite frequently and it has just been free damage against Kato here. Alright, all right. it's good. See, another test. Another test for the Baraka overhead. It's working. Oh, smart, smart patience there to not press, but then at the end of it decided to press. Like, it was great. You called it out perfectly. You didn't fall for the down one death spin, but... I don't know why he let go later. Maybe he didn't realize that it was it was the amplified version that pops you up for a combo. I'm not sure. Oh, speaking of popping up for a combo. Dearie me, just decided running a bit of a clinic this round. He's just been a, an offensive juggernaut. Beautiful blocks from <clears throat> decided right there. Even an eye out for what K-Top is able to do. Throws out the knives, catches him. Doesn't quite get the full combo, however. Yeah, it was a very weird situation where, like, the, the overhead was timed too close to the knife, so, like, the knife kept them down, the second knife kept them down. Very, very weird, but, hey, that's okay. We got going for the assist, the forward throw. K-Top in control here. K-Top locking to start it down right here in this corner, not letting them go, not letting off at all, and just pressing after sequence after sequence after sequence here in this corner and say hey let's mix it up just a little bit gora with another throw and keeping them locked in this is this is this is total lockdown here oh goes for the punch walk we rarely ever see looking to enforce that chip game just goes to a standing one that it, that is just goes to show how momentum heavy both of these characters can really feel when they place you in the corner, right? The started first round ran a bit of a clinic. Same thing can be said for K-Top during that previous round. Now we're back to the middle of the screen. Let's see how things change and look for the up block. This going to be a lot of damage as well. Catches it. That 17% ain't bad for a throw, especially after that up block punish. Backing off those Kano knives, catching K Top, sleeping just a little bit. Didn't quite get the whiff punish, but here comes the armor, here comes the launch up from Goro. And huge corner carries, we said. I locked you down in the last corner. Now, this time, we're going to switch it up. We're going to keep you here. Now, that Kano does come back pretty slow, but hey, we're going to have access to things like Punch Walk, which I believe is plus in the corner there, as we saw just K Top challenging afterwards. But we're not going to see any of that. Disarted finding the hit, Disarted bringing the fight back to the middle of the stage. That's an easy punish. Why would you do that? Why would you do that there? So unfortunate and big, huge damage from K-Top, bringing things back and making things 2-1 now. I, I don't know what happened. After. I feel like that first round was very definitive and very clean from the started, but whatever that did just lit a fire in K-Top for those next two games, and he just he just plucked him apart there yeah yeah just just really turned it up here uh and, and we see in, in k top but I, I i can't help but linger on that last play there for to go for that string which is super unsafe every time he's done it in the set it got punished and to really just like bet it all on that towards the end especially like after the momentum was finally on your side but i guess maybe he he was just tired of of k top challenging after every low attempt that he's just like you know what they're definitely going to be pressing after this let me finish the string i know it's super unsafe but i just risk reward i don't i don't see it i, I don't see it being worth it it's hard to not agree with you there. I, I feel like that was a little bit of a fumble on his part. Mm -hmm. But even so, with that said, I, it looks like the side is analyzing his options. He's played a plethora of different characters in this game. It looks like he's kind of just juggling his options, considering that he is on tournament. Uh, is, yeah, he's in tournament life right now. Yeah, yeah, this is the lower side. This is the loser side of the bracket, so... You know, if he loses this next game, he's betting it all on on Liu Kang. Can I tell you, I, I, I it makes me very uncomfortable that this Liu Kang is just like super. Like it's just, it's like something out of a of a nightmare. It's so scary. It's just ghost Liu Kang. I, I'm just convinced. It's, he doesn't have any eyebrows. You know? I think that's what's also throwing me off horribly. <laughs> it's just I'm just like, what are you doing? What is coming after me? Like I'm, 
I am terrified. So they just started trying to trying to get a little a little scary here against K-Top, trying to scare him with his costume. Poking with a down three, recognizing the super plus frames, and then just going in with a challenge afterwards. Really smart stuff from Jusardi here. That Goro is so it always catches me off guard when the Goro whiffs because like I'm never ready for it. I'm never ready, and this guy's ready for whiffs. Disarted ducking under that. Disarted standing up with a button of his own. And Liu Kang so good at that. So good at getting in that range, getting right next to you, but also having what? Did you see that interaction? That was crazy. That was such a late time the EX utilization of the fireball. So that fireball in particular, if you spend the bar of meter, it does its projectiles, and it's super duper good for that. But it was just very strange because that was like frame perfect and land. Right, right when it was on her. But was it two EXs or was Liu Kang's not EXed? Uh, that's I what I don't remember. It was because of course it's a mid, and in most trades actually it does go in Liu Kang's favor with beating the projectile. I believe it's because it was so incredibly late that I think the Tanya projectile did take priority. I, I would I would love to see that again in slow motion. If we don't get it, I'll I'll, I'll look at it later. But that was so so strange. <laughs> Disarded making the right choice here with this eyebrow list Liu Kang, and he's 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 ready to instill fear. He's ready to take this round, and he wants to take this entire set. K-Top needs to come in. K-Top needs to take this game to stop this momentum because right now just started running away with it. Doesn't even have to get near him. Oh, as soon as he gets near him, though, in for trouble. Yep, now has the corner to work with. Just going to go off the low, just standing button. Just going to stagger the Sotted as much as possible. But I must say, for a character that the Sotted has just pulled out the hat, he's utilizing Liu Kang extremely well. But no hit confirmed to the big damage. Going to whiff the button into the forward throw. Things not looking great for the Sotted right now. K-Top definitely looking quite strong in form. But it's choosing to decide to back off where Liu Kang has been dominating majority of this screen. Yeah, he's, he's, he's backing off, and, you know, that, that's the thing, like, K-Top doesn't really have anything at full screen except that. That's what he can counteract any projectile with, but he needs to use meter, and, but for the most part, K-Top needs to go in to do damage, so he knew he couldn't just stay back, or else Liu Kang was going to slowly, slowly, slowly chip away low hats, the low fireballs, the mid fireballs, everything coming at you. Super nope. plus because of Goro. Yep, we're gonna pat the chest, we're gonna get the full back throw combo for the back 2-3 to the 3-3 free, free, free dragon kick. Yeah, 20%, not too bad for a throw, I will say. 22% ain't bad at all. Very, very good, but they started slowing things down, just letting K-Top overextend a tiny, tiny bit. Oh, can't quite get the combo off that, gonna have Goro cover his back. Beautiful blocks. Both players just keeping it very safe, very simple, but oh, the stagger from K-Top. Definitely looking for that big damage right now, and the screen control slowly pushes him into the corner. Ooh, bit of disrespect right there. It's pressing right under. Yeah, K-Top is challenging so much with those highs. Like, you get so much reward for it, but again, they are highs. You can just duck them again, and, and I'm not seeing that coming out of Disarted but it, it is also scary because he could also just not do it. So K-Top doing a good job of kind of mixing it up, not doing it every time, but I, I, I'm seeing a lot of it. The Tanya chandelier going right over that Lao hat, leaving it completely useless. Challenging back with a button of his own. Doesn't get a real hit confirm though, but does find the follow-up. Here comes the chandelier, easy combo, and this is gonna be all K-Top, three to one, but still a really close set, a very entertaining set to watch. Yes, I, and I must say, uh, I was a pleasant surprise to see the Sartid's Liu Kang, and I, I do believe that if he maybe had pulled out the Liu Kang in the second game, yeah. these games actually might have wound up being a lot, lot tighter. Yeah, and it, you you saw like how comfortable he was at that ma at that max range, and the movement from Liu Kang, and and just wanting to be up close, kind of like you know bypassing that 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 comfort zone of tanya she's got some great buttons but Liu kang's got some great strike throw game once he's up close uh but of course disarted more known for the barack as we see here getting that first game and <laughs> again the whole set was pretty much back and forth here um you know to start off just huge adaptation from k-top
Yes, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised at all when it comes to K-Top, you know. K-Top's been a player that's been the scene for a very, very long time, infamously known for having a very strong raid and across MK11 as well as MKX, uh, where he used to participate during the ESL days. Very, yeah. very old school player. Oh, taking it taking it all the way back to those to those <laughs> to those ESL days. All right, so as we can see here, that was uh, K Top taking it over to started. Where they're going to be facing off against Magic T, uh, and I believe the next match we have up is uh, is Ben Twenty Six versus H Dope. Is it Ben? It's C. It's C Z U Ben. Yeah, C Z U Ben. There you go. Mm -hmm. That's what that's what we're seeing on the screen here. Yeah. <laughs> They're going to be going up against H Dope, uh, and like we said before, this could possibly be a Tanya Goro mirror. But everyone has their approaches to the mirror differently. Some people are very confident in outplaying an opponent that knows all your options, and some players aren't so confident, and some players aren't so comfortable with you know chasing after the same win condition as your opponent chasing after the same range as your opponent so mm -hmm. uh, people will approach it a little bit differently uh, but the way i look at it a mirror match is just one matchup of many some people are great at it some people aren't so interesting to see who's going to be coming into this super confident and, and and sticking it out with tanya goro but there could also be that idea of you know i know my character so well that i know what my character loses to and all i have to do is just know it for that one matchup just, mm -hmm. and, and you know we could we see players all around the world playing like that you know players like mighty unjust players like el kakui who will pick certain matchups just for the counter play yep I, I feel like that is a style that ha also has been infamously cemented by tekken master you know oh yeah when tekken master traveled overseas one of the big things he's always very proud of is not being so much a character specialist but a counterplay specialist being able to work around your opponent's game plan is a really really important thing but having that added layer of overall game knowledge and fundamentals and knowing what really works and what you can work around is super good which is also why uh tekken master's uh one of the best in the business uh don't let yeah. his loss yesterday against Faisal shout outs to him by the way um you know it makes them such strong well-rounded players and I'm very excited to see what goes on next because I believe currently as well uh, Tekken Master Mo is placed at the top of the uh, league currently yeah yeah uh you know th that was I believe their their third qualifier mm -hmm. um but also Tekken Master having those 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 offline points thanks to uh, a win at ufa uh possibly going to be seeing some tekken master over a combo breaker but who knows who knows what's going to happen uh point system so many different variables so many different ways to qualify but let's focus here uh czu ben highlighting natara what do you think about natara as a character oh this is gonna be, this has been a team has been a, this is seen. a team what a statement yes. <laughs> <laughs> quote me on that uh it is a team i have seen uh, sonic fox experiment with a lot that's and right the, the mix potential soon. and set play that this character has paired with chameleon it, it's it's absurd because it gives us so many air options so many mix options she becomes just a scary character being receiving end of because she will just slaughter you if you keep guessing wrong what also stands out about natara versus the, the entire cast is her mobility and her air mobility specifically like she can set the pace whenever like you, you almost don't want to let her go into neutral because you know that she can just kind of back off and go in and out in and out in and out and it is very very tough to deal with immediately throwing after those negative frames trying to get a little tricky there with the uh with the, the unfloat the float cancel if you will coming back down but the throws doing a lot for for ccu ben right now mm -hmm. that one thing oh Oh, that mix was disgusting. You thought you had to worry about the just the Natara mix? Oh, but this is going to do a lot as well. 35% going to go for that. We're going to get plus frames of Goro. You know, we've been talking a bit about Natara, but we haven't really talked about h -Dope. Now, h -Dope is the twin brother of K-Top. Very strong, very prolific player. Did make top 8 at Viennality last year for this game, actually. 
He's going to take this round. Not convincingly, because that was very close. Super close. He's very strong. Now, one thing I want to point out, because I've just realized this and noticed this. Tell me. Look at that health pool, Nitaro. That's 900 health. That's right. It's why every single hit I saw at the very start from h dope right now, I was like, this is doing so much damage. And I looked at the health pool and I was like, yes, of course, the health difference is such a big factor in the role in the matchup here. Yeah, a lot of people kind of like forget about that aspect, uh, especially because it's like, it's, it's, it's a slightly newer aspect in the NRS realm. Like traditionally, you know, going back uh, uh, not too long ago, characters all had the same exact health in, in Mortal Kombat. Oh boy. Mm. Oh boy. The life change alteration was initially made through MK11's help balance out some of the stronger, overwhelming characters like Joker and Cetron. And it's kind of had Echo's hit. That was such a gorgeous read. That was a call out. That was a call out indeed. <laughs> Super big call out. Gonna get some more damage on the board here thanks to that bar. Not gonna be enough. And that last hits of the chandelier just kind of barely whiffing, giving Natara another chance to live. Trying to cancel into the fan lift, but so smart of H Dope to just press those buttons and make sure you're not going anywhere. Now, one thing I do want to point and highlight that I feel like has been catching up to Sizu Ben is th that health pool is definitely showing quite a bit here. Oh, and yeah. The thing is, when you play against Tonya, isn't really known for her consistent, really, really big damage output. And if I've definitely noticed it, then th I, I feel that small health pool is definitely a bit of a problem. And whilst Natara has some life drain capabilities, you know, of like saying that up, we did not see that get set up in the last round. So hopefully that is changed here because that can be to the character's benefit. But it's either you go for mix or you go up to set up into the set plane. With the momentum that both of these characters and players carry, man, like it's, it's hard if you want to do that. Oh, yeah, yeah. I love how she just kind of floated out of out of danger there, thanks to that katana lift. Just kind of like a free check with that dive kick. It is punishable because it's blocked, but hey, katana can get you right out of there. Comes yep. Jade with the glaive toss, trying to get some free damage, as you will. And I think that was a was that an anti air attempt, but she just dashed down, got out of danger, and just kind of came in. Oh, uh, too predictable, too predictable with that Molina wake up ball roll. Oh dear! Oh, oh, that still keeps going. That was sick. That was so insane. The down two normally launches you over to the other side to like kind of negate the corner damage. But because Tanya was on the other side, because Con Tanya was the one in the corner, the down two kept Natara just straight up in the air and she was able to keep that going. That was huge. That was such a cool combo. Now, one thing we've definitely seen from h Dope here, especially in this matchup, he's now starting to challenge a lot of Sizu Ben's air options and air mobilities of going for the big three. And I'm surprised we haven't seen him, seen him jump into the air for that chandelier kick, but oh, oh there it is again. Yeah, that, that was what he was looking for before, but last time Natara just kind of like dashed under and like got away from it. But you see the reward is so good. Super plus after the Goro, but still willing to press a button afterwards. h Dope is just so surprised by that approach. Understandably so. You know, this character is very, very mix heavy. So when you just see her randomly press up, well, you kind of catch you a bit off guard, but h Dope just not phased and seeming very comfortable in the matchup, honestly. Very, very comfortable. Yeah, just, just really chilling. And again, you know, going into this, we we kind of reiterated and we highlighted the fact that uh, that that these players are both Tanya mains. So, you know, which one of these players is a little bit more uncomfortable? The one not playing their main character, maybe going for like a cheekier pick with this with this Natara. And, and I feel like Natara, you know, despite how everyone says like Sub Zero and Scorpion are the worst characters in the game, like Natara is the one I see the least. But it could also just be because they're a little bit more difficult to use with the air mobility, the flight cancels, the, you know, it, it, it's so unlike any other character in this game that it takes some time to get used to it. And on top of that, we're also talking about 900 health damage. Like 900 health is, is devastating in this game. Yeah, so the thing is the character is built like a bit of a gloss cannon this instance, but you know, it, you live by the sword, you die by the sword, you gain the benefits of the mix, and a lot of 
just heavy set play option, but you yourself are caught off by it. It will come to bite you, but ooh, goes for the big dive kick. Is going to get punished for it. Big damage being locked in. Oh, looking for the optimal 38 damage and just the... Oh, quite get the, everything off that. Goes for the armor. And h on match point, looking to knock Zizu Ben out of losers round one. Yeah, in a convincing fashion, too. If he does win this round, that's going to be a decisive 3 0. CZU Ben needs to fight back right here. And speaking of those fighting back opportunities, those fighting back options, just find those, those, those buttons on that stand up. But just like I would say, just kind of throwing it away here. These dive kicks are just not placed very well. These dive kicks just getting blocked and, and h seizing the opportunity, making sure it hurts, making sure it hits as hard as possible. Yeah, taking a lot of really big risks here that just aren't paying off. And there it is. h is going to take it off Tizu Ben. 3-0 and there I say quite a comfortable 3-0 in those last two games especially. Yeah, yeah, no, like it seemed like the Natara pick was like starting like in the very beginning that first game it was like kind of doing some stuff like you saw the coming in and out the whiffing and it was just it was it was like CZU Ben barely lost I, I believe it was a, a fatal blow combo that that kind of sealed the deal for him mm -hmm. and it was I, I just saw morality going out, the, the morale of, of, of the situation just going out the window afterwards. Um, I would have liked to see the Tanya pick at least the attempt to see, hey, what can I do if we do the mirror match? But again, some people just, just don't like going that route. This 100%. Yeah, and look, you can even see that the, the second round here in game number one, pretty close, man. That was one decision off, but afterwards, it was just h cleaning up easy, punishing things easy, blocking those dive kick attempts easy. Like, we, we honestly don't even have much to show here. It was just, hey, I'm going to do it. I'm going to armor out. Yeah, the second that h Dope started to adapt and challenge a lot of the air options, you know, where Natara kind of thrives, that's where we started to see things crumble apart. But with that being said, h Dope is now going to advance into losers round two, playing against fish like Steve. And I like do Steve, who we saw uh, using Ashra a little earlier mm. in today's broadcast. And then these guys are all familiar with each other. I think that the one that's just a little bit different, a little... And 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 doing great here so far. Left uh, a face that we don't haven't really seen a lot of is uh is Omi just mm -hmm. kind of kind of uh, in in a favorable position here, guaranteed for third place or better, as they're sitting in the winner's side uh, up in the winner's finals, hoping to sit on the winner's side of grand finals. They just got to go through one more person. Mm -hmm. And you never know, we may actually have a Sub-Zero win one of these qualifiers, a character that has been looked and frowned upon for quite a while. Let's not forget, let's not forget, coming back to League of Latina, we did have recently, we did have MK Javier, Scorpion Specialist, go overseas, and we did see a Scorpion vs. Sub-Zero matchup in pools. That's true, that's true. We did see that live on a broadcast. We did, uh, we did see, you know, and, and it's... You know, you can sit here and say characters low tier, characters low tier. You can even call them Lopian, but you know, it's it's really about the player, like how far a player mm -hmm. can take somebody. And, and not to discredit uh, MK Javier at all, like very like super talented player. Um, but look, man, the evidence is there. You're showing us this character can do so much, and you know, I, I get it. I get that there's no reason to upplay your character. I get that there's a, there's only ways to benefit from uh, quote unquote downplaying um, Lopian, but it's it's still a fun treat. No matter if a character is good or bad, I love seeing the diversity. I love seeing you know people picking what they like, people sticking with what they like, and even just kind of like adopting the persona or or the the style of play um, of these different characters. I'd love to see more Natara in the future. And it, it is really cool that, that super high level players like Sonic Fox are are putting a little bit more spotlight in onto characters that you don't see as much. Because I feel like Natara we've 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 barely seen, man. I feel like we've barely scratched the surface on on what this character can do. Yeah, I think that's also I, I find that characters seem to be very region regional dependent because yeah, over yeah. here in the eu like we have a lot and i mean like a lot of tanya players 
<laughs> oh yeah, it's so it's so straight. Speaking of, speaking yeah. of, here comes more. <laughs> Yeah, and, and that's the thing as well. I've noticed with the Middle Eastern players as well, they're very fond of Baraka. I feel like in America, you have a wider array of like regions, of course, with like going as you slowly go from coast to coast. So there isn't really a set character, but I feel like there's a lot of specialists in each different state. I mean, it's I I I, I think some people just like being known for a character. Like I uh, look, man, I've been in and out. Like I've. I've been a part of a lot of like NRS competitive communities and there's you, you meet players who just want to play one character. Mm -hmm. They'll run into 8-2 matchups, 9-1 matchups, 7-3 matchups and just say like, no, this is my character. Like, this is who I'm playing with. I don't care if I can learn another character just for a matchup. Like, I will sit here and I will suffer. <laughs> like, I will just, that's, this is me. If I pick Price another character. <laughs> <laughs> shout out to Costner. Oh yeah, shout out to Costner. Love saying that let's quickly jump back into this game because this has been extremely back and forth between magic t and k top these two have duped it out time and time again i see these two fight against each other all the time and so i definitely don't see this as a character matchup but definitely more so of a, a player matchup i know what you know I know what you're going to do. So how am I going to mix it up and how am I going to change the tempo of this game? Yeah, it's kind of like you want to you want to play to the player's expected tendencies, you know, how aggressive they're being in certain situations. Whoa, 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 Goro. Oh, no, that, that actually might do it. That is such an unfortunate drop. That could have actually been the win for K-Top right there. Yeah, yeah, this is going to be enough. Melina just, she sweats damage, man. Oh man, 45% on a normal character is going to feel like a lot more on anyone rocking Goro. A yeah. lot more. That 950 health is really felt, but all oh, the challenge, beautiful reaction and scope from K Top there. That air ball has been something we've been seeing a lot on Twitter recently. You know, it's like, you know, big shout outs as well to another UK player, Muji, who has been utilizing a lot of that in his combo exhibition with what Melina is capable of. Yeah, it's kind of weird. It's it's kind of like a, a call out. Like, hey, do you know how to deal with this? Because if you don't, I'm just going to get away with it. <laughs> oh, Ooh. drops the button. Doesn't get. He went for an instant jump button and is just totally whipped. We're right into the special move, but that's okay. Gets the best of the scramble situation. Going to be close to the corner. Too close to really set up any kind of loud hat pressure. That's okay. We get the back throw. Huge likely here for Magic T. What are you going to do, K Top? The fact that comboed was disgusting. <laughs> that was so cool. <laughs> the armored reversal into the, the Lao hat, that was crazy. But that was so, so unfortunate for K-Top. Because he had that in the bag, that unfortunate drop, that little bit off center he needed to be in order to hit Melina. That, that would have sealed him the first round, and it just felt like he lost the momentum from that point onwards. And again, as we pointed out with Magic D, once he gets one touch on you, he's looking for that instant set play. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's just, it's kind of like this because Melina's combos like take so long after the successful overhead string into the low hat or low hat into the overhead string. It it lets Kung Lao load up again, and it's just like this 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 vicious cycle or vicious circle, if you will, of of just I have to guess for my life. Very, very much so. And good call out from K Top, actually. One of the benefits of that arm and reversal is that it does go over the low hat, but this is clearly a matchup that, you know, Majesty is very comfortable with. As we did see uh, uh, just a second ago, he just went for the neutral duck, was looking for the punish instantly. It's something that is very, very strong against Tanya in particular. Yeah, very, like, you're seeing so many shades of that here. Whoa! Didn't anticipate the amplified one to go full screen like it does. Kind of uh, expecting the normal one, which it does kind of throw you off. You got to really pay attention to the meter here. A lot of reversal throws I'm seeing coming out of Magic T this round. And, you know, you're walking on thin ice when you start doing things like that. Oh, what a punish. What a punish. He was ready. Do you believe? Do you believe? I, I agree with that break of this late into the game and the chip territory. And so unfortunate for K-Top. I believe that he he probably would have been better off just holding on to that and going into the next game. But oh, beautiful anti-air. Something that K-Top has clearly scoped out from watching and playing against Magic T. Just challenge him once he's in the air. 
Yeah, it's just a nice little easy snipe out, if you will, as uh, as you mentioned before. So a great way to kind of kind of say, hey, uh, no way. I'm Tanya. I got this option. You're not doing any of this. I don't have to put myself at really big risk. Also, I do want to point out that we have been, uh, unlike when we have seen Tanya on screen, we have been seeing that a lot from h Stroke and K-Top, so that might be something the brothers have, like, purposely kept an eye out for, but this round, all oh, K-Top playing so well at the moment. Oh, oh fuck. Flawless block. Flawless block, dude. He punished. This is going to be enough, though, because oh, you got to get a few more hits. Well, going for the setup. Oh, what's he got? The corner hits the Goro. Damn, what? That was so scary. That was scary, because had the Molina ball roll been like micro dash just a little bit before, it might have been able to get there in time to punish the chandelier on the recovery. But we will not live to see another day here. Instead, going into the final round, K-Top slowly, slowly taking this life lead. Magic he needs to tap in here. And I, I think I think K Top was expecting a reversal throw there, but Magic T giving the, the, the slower mids from Molina instead. Yeah, this is going to be a lot of nice damage, 30%. And don't forget, that life deficit on 950 is going to add up slowly but surely. And these flawless blocks of Magic Team, man, they are just adding up. But going to get caught by K-Top, going to even things out, get the buff locked in, looking to slowly chip out. This won't kill, but yep, Magic Team forced to break right now. This is very scary. Yep, full combo punish, and that is it. That is yeah. very unfortunate for K-Top. I don't believe he had kept an eye on Goro there to actually make himself very plus, allowing Magic T to just full combo punish right into Fatal Blow and secure himself another round and gain to the set. It's uh, that, that resource final of uh, a Fatal Blow, you know, that one time that you need to use it, it's, it's so powerful like once you get you tap into that range once you lose 30 once you, you lose your life and you're down to 30 percent or less you become so much more dangerous you get so much access to to damage and you know as long as your opponent doesn't have full bar they're not stopping it you know they get opened up once they make one mistake they, you know, put themselves in a punishable state just one time, one time. And depending on the character, you can access so much damage. And speaking of accessing some damage, we got Raiden on the screen. Mm -hmm. uh, this is so the first time we have seen him today, I believe. Yeah, yeah you, you did allude to it a little bit before that K-Top does play uh, Raiden Kano. We'll use Tanya in those matchups where he needs Tanya. Where I could feel like on paper, like getting over the Kung Lao stuff with Tanya Chandelier is really good. But I just, I don't think K-Top's feeling it today. I don't think he's feeling the Tanya, so he's switching it up with Raiden. We're going to do some Kano, some cheeky Kano knives where you summon the Kano Knives and you Superman over to the other side and they're just like, what is coming at me? That's an easy punish, but he missed it! So, so unfortunate. Um, with K-Top, when he does switch over to Raiden, I don't know if this is necessarily a character he's put too, too much time into because I've seen him utilize Raiden quite a fair bit, but they're, they're like the small little micro indecisions he's making, like misguiding the Superman fly and just the wake up shocker there that are just leading to free damage that's just being taken out on him by Magic T. But K Top not out of the fight just yet. Can't quite catch things out, and I think, no, that won't be enough. So. Oh, 50 50 getting hit with the low, gonna cancel into the fatal blow, has to seal things out. Nice. It's going to do a hefty amount of damage, but Magic T is still absolutely in this fight. And that still said, K-Top could be a resource down if he does lose this, but oh, there goes the Storm Cell into the dome. That is exactly what K-Top needs to kind of stop Magic T's momentum. But, you know, he's absent of a Fatal Blow and that free damage, so he's got to really fight him to bring things back. Yeah, he's, he's got he's to tap in here. You know, this is... Um... Raiden is a very devastating character. He's seen as, as one of the best. Great down four range, uh, safe overhead, and, and just access to, to so much damage, all from a starting low. That's just perfectly timed with delay wake ups. So, you know, you really gotta like step up the defense whenever you're fighting against Raiden because you're you're risking so so much. 
Okay, so that said, there's another big combo drop. We're seeing a lot of drops from K-Top at the moment. I don't know if this is a version of Raiden that he feels too confident in or too polished right now, but it does look like he's he's able to take this game, which is super, super good on his half. Going to seal things out with a brutality, but I think this is what K-Top kind of needs to bring things back because it's very possible that he can do a reverse Frio. Yeah, I mean, especially after seeing that first game, um, how one-sided it was, and it almost seemed like this could be a a personal weakness of Magic T. Not necessarily saying that, you know, this is a character's bad matchup or this is, you know, something you don't know. Maybe it's just something that, you know, plays against you. Uh, all of Raiden's strengths just perfectly complementing against you know holes in defense and and that's that's kind of what i'm seeing here i'm, I'm kind of seeing raiden roll over melina so to so to speak yeah but it's that's the thing right i think this is going to be a very momentum heavy matchup because the second that raiden's able to get a touch on you he's able to apply a lot of damage with that said Kato has dropped three really big combo opportunities and it's been letting uh, Magic T slowly slip through his cross. Whereas Magic T, he goes for that instant set play. He's always going to mix up his options, especially with the Lao Hat. But now that Kato's looking a little bit more warm, he may have needed those like first two games and rounds to really get the engine and momentum going here. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's, he's revving up, if you will. Token with the down one after mutual respect from both players. And that was super smart there, teleporting and, 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 and using that armor to get out of that pressure. Because it's not free. It's not free pressure. That armor is always going to be an option there. Uh, so I feel like K-Top's going to be looking to bait that out next time. Breaker coming in play here. Chase them down? She chased them down? Oh, no, you're not too far. What? What? This is such an awkward... Just It's just so scrambly right now, man. I can't even lie to you. <laughs> Beautiful blocks right now. Oh, blocks the overhead. Gonna get the back throw. I think K-Top's... Yep, K-Top is still alive after this one. Wake up buttons. The MK11 player coming out. And just the ball. Air ball. Match point. Magic T. Magic T doesn't want to get uh, K-Top started too well, too high. And, and that's what you got to watch out for here with the Kano Knives. And that, that's really what Raiden's doing to get out of the corner. Summon those Kano Knives or as an ambush, ambush those Kano Knives. And, uh, and Superman out of here. And hopefully you're going to get somebody, you know, not paying attention and eating a comboable knife. Yeah, that said, though, K-Top is making some bold decisions that is slowly... That was a very interesting anti-air right there. Full combo punish. He's playing a lot more comfortable at the moment. And, you know, it, it, I definitely feel like he should have started off playing Raiden because he, he just looks so much better at the moment. Yeah, but, you know, Magic T, not really getting things going here. Magic T does have full bar, though. Three bars to contest against K-Top's none. Um, however, did spend one already. So after a hit, there's some successful <laughs> combos and moves. You're going to be slowly building up here. Good challenge here with that mid. Pretty slow, but hey, here comes the overhead low mix up. How are you going to block that? Duh. How are you going to block that? Tries to go in for the throw after the block down one instead of giving him a check of a down one, trying to bypass a part of that poking war game altogether. But K-Top ready to swing, like absolutely ready and committed to swing. Yep, oh boy. forces Magic T to break. And like I said, this is such, oh, this is the punish. This is such a momentum heavy game. And just, oh, I feel very bad for K-Top because he could have actually won that. That these small scary. little, yeah, it's these small little micro decisions at these tiny, tiny, pivotal points in time that he's just choking at. And Magic T is going to take the game and set 3-1, eliminating K-Top from losers' quarterfinals. He blocked the ball roll. He just like, and then again, that that was how the switch to Raiden started. Is blo I start, he he blocked the ball roll, didn't get the punish, like, and it was just. It was just so heartbreaking seeing him throw away the entire set because of that, because that was his game. That was that was us going into a game five and he just he just dropped it. It was it was the ball was totally in his court. It was his control like magic. He did it like ball roll was done like it was done. Mm -hmm. It was over. All I can do is hope he misses the punish. And that's exactly what happened. So 
my heart goes out to you, K Top. That was yours. You, 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 you that was a hundred percent yours. Not to harp on that, but yeah. In fact, we just see it here right now where he just missed that tiny little ender and it just led to so much damage. But you know, K Top definitely shown a lot of experience in that matchup, especially with Tanya. But again, I, I feel like if he started that off with Raiden, I feel like he could have really done some devastating damage and bring things out a little bit longer yeah yeah he, he could have he could have he could have like it, it it was starting to go and i feel like again it was just magic t's like i gotta do this because if, if we go into a game five i don't think i have the energy to stop this raiden because k tops raid in that first game was looking great and and again game number four really really down to the wire and that's the miss punish he had there that should be just like punishment 101 dealing with Melina's ball roll again because Melina's ball roll just gives her so much that there's no reason to not just throw it out there there's no reason to not just do it next game we got coming up the next set we got fish like Steve going up against uh H dope who is the twin brother of K top mm -hmm. uh, fish like Steve to avenge yeah. things <laughs> definitely looking to avenge things uh probably going to be seeing a uh, uh, uh Ashra coming from fish like Steve and H Dope a little earlier, uh, Rock and Tanya Goro. Yes, and uh, as pointed out, the <laughs> the EU scene as you have seen, they like we like our Tanyas. We like our Tanyas, and I got to imagine that's got to be quite a big factor in this matchup. Yeah. You know, when 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 it comes to fish like Steve, this is a player who I've known and seen around for a very long amount of time. He's grown so much since he started here, and he's placing incredible incredibly incredibly well and rather consistently like in that sense so it's yeah. good to see it in that instance but with that being known kind of on the table here i want to see how his experience plays up against someone that's been around the scene as long as h because i feel like this is a uh, it's always good to see new faces but i feel like these are battles of very different generations and not to make you feel quite old here darth armor but um, keep in mind that we are now in an age <laughs> where some of the 3D characters in the game are older than the current fans watching. That makes oh me boy. feel old. Uh, if you feel old, I feel ancient. <laughs> I feel ancient. <laughs> Bitch like Steve rocking the Oscar Serena. Serena giving her access to tons of tons of damage on top of also having a little bit of a, of a full speed fast recovering projectile. What a call out here from H Dope. Ready to press those buttons, ready to convert with that team, with that with that Goro cameo. And now just having Fish Like Steve completely locked down in this corner. Fish like Steve fighting for his life. The down force do hit. Trying to fake the double Serena rank to kinda you know keep it a little keep it a little interesting, a little different. You know, you don't want to get too predictable. Oh, one million percent. And the thing is, H Dope, he seems very confident here. And I'm not so much in this matchup, but in his overall performance in like decision making, not to overextend, but that is also very important data right there. Using the Serena cameo to kind of just push push off H Dope and that offense to land that really big damage, but the same that, ooh, this is gonna do a lot. 40% with corner pushes, a scary situation, and jumps right out to it. Beautiful understanding of the matchup. Fish like Steve taking a round here. Round two. Feeling himself, you know, despite being knocked into the lower bracket, you know, you gotta just fight through it. You gotta fight your battles and, uh, you know, try to try to get get it where you can. Mm -hmm. And I, I've, you know, we've always pointed out the life deficit when it comes to these matches. Because, you know, when we've seen quite a bit of Goro today, but when it comes to, that was such a beautiful hit, by the way. Incredible reach in Tanya. But when you're playing against a character like Ashra, where, you know, she just, she smears damage wherever she touches, that's got to be such a big, important factor. And we're going to see that right here. H Dope choosing to not break, just hold this. And Fish Like Steve not choosing to overextend. They'll commit to it. Ooh, is going to get punished. The armor gonna go for the buff right now. H Dope putting himself in the corner, goes for the low spin. 
double poking. That is a big no-no here. You're definitely not free to do that. As you can see, H-Dope with a clear whip punish here. Seeing that down four, the second down four coming from a mile away and just sinking his teeth into it, making sure it does what it needs to do. Backing yeah. off, he does have a slight life lead. He really doesn't need to go in, but here comes. Oh no. Oh, oh no! Punish. Nothing, not even a down two, not even an anti-air. I mean, you definitely can't punish when she lands, but you gotta do something super risky. Yeah, that was, that was big bravery. Very familiar in this matchup. Yeah, Fish Like Steve just knows how this matchup plays. And he's been using that to his favor so, so much. Knowing that the grab was going, that was a hard read attempt from H-Dope. And it did not pay to his avail with Fish Like Steve taking another game here. And that, that's a lot of damage to eat. My god, Arthur just hit so hard in this game. Oh yeah, just an insane amount of damage coming from Asha, especially with that Serena cameo. You know, being able to loop double ranks twice if need be, but it's it's just the access um, to amplifying that uppercut and and really just taking the, the the combo to the sky and then doing more and more damage wherever they can. Now I'm I'm interested generally going into this, what H Dub is going to do to kind of work around Steve because he uh, like I said, H Dub is showing a lot of confidence in his play here. But there are like pivotal little moments, kind of like what we saw with K Top, where it, the, the rounds are just slipping through his fingertips. And that can be largely due to just like fish like Steve out neutraling him and his better decision making. But also, like, again, it always is going to come back to damage when there is a massive life deficit and a character just hits this hard. It's, it's more, more is on the line, more pressure is staring is staring at you, if you will, from, from, you know, scenario to scenario. Hold on a second. Hold on. I heard that overhead was bad. <laughs> Hold on a second. Oh. I mean, even a broken clock is right twice a day, okay? Uh, you know, there you just, go. Just there same. you go. Okay. <laughs> Gonna go right. for the dab one. Gonna get plus frames. Yeah, very poke heavy game. Both players not choosing to overextend too much, but oh, saying that. I thought that was gonna be easy with punish. I thought it was gonna be easy. Definitely quite an awkward one. Gonna knock out the Serena as well. Gonna apply a healthy amount of damage as well. 40 damage. So good. Gonna apply the buff at full screen. Things looking pretty good for H-Dope right now. I can't lie. Goes for the spin. The big kick. Gonna close out the game himself. H-Dope bringing things back. Definitely uh, applying a bit, quite a few changes from their last fight. Yeah, definitely um, adjustments as you see here. More passive play, more I don't really need to go in. You need to kind of come to me. I've got more full screen things. Trying to go right through some projectiles, amplifying, you know, Tanya's projectile will just through anything as it goes, as it travels across the screen. Ooh, trying to swing for her head, swing for the top of a bun. Yeah, one thing we do have to point out is that both of these characters have very incredible range and oh, the raw spin gonna get, it's gonna be big damage and have really good corner carry at the moment. And here, this is where h Loop can stagger a fair bit, but Fish Like Steve working his way out, hitting, oh, that's a big unfortunate drop off the overhead. Beautiful what? anti, yeah. What happened there? Was it just a mistimed Serena call out? And that is so unfortunate that the last rang didn't hit on the way back. And Fish like Steve almost like overextending and putting himself in real danger there. I believe it was a bit of that and the screen positioning. I think that is what really, really caught Fish like Steve. Put him in a very precarious position, but this is still absolutely win territory right now. And yeah, HO gets caught by the pullback off the blades. It's only 12 seconds left on the clock. Yeah, you could run it out. Yeah, this is where we're going to feel the life deficit definitely come into play here. Three seconds left and on his way out. And oh, the maximum range into the spin kicks. H2 keeping himself in the fight and putting a round on the board. I almost feel like the fact that the clock was like running out made fish like Steve like panic a little bit. Like I didn't see him doing much there at the end and H Dope just kind of took the lead in that so to so to speak and just kind of said like, oh you're gonna chill because you have a tiny life lead. You have a life lead that's less than eleven percent. Okay, here's a throw. No problem. <laughs> just went for a throw. It was it was a great call out and great judgment of 
the scenario, judgment of the situation, and and that's what you've got to look at. Like fighting games are not like a solo play game. You've got to play to the player. You've got to pick up on the tendencies, and you've got to read the moment, read the, the the vibe, the feeling that's coming off. And the whole situation is he's gonna stay here and block because he thinks he can win that way. Yep, one million percent. And yeah, I think that just might also be like a. a european eu style thing but we are extremely patient with backing off once we're under 10 percent and like the clock's under 30 seconds like it's gonna walk back a little bit slow things down we're gonna chill we're gonna chill out just a little bit knocking serena out serena didn't even come out to play instead here comes goro to pop him up and just keep that going yeah, beautiful catch right there out the start of the gate. And the H-Shop looking a little bit more comfortable at the moment. Just like Steve has to definitely work for his damage and his wins right now. Oh yeah, working hard he is. Ooh, flawless blocking and just kind of just, just staying away, trying to minimize the, as much chip as possible. Because Tanya is just constantly putting those normals all over you. What a whiff punish. What a whiff punish coming at a fish like Steve, whipping in front of him and then dropping the Serena down on top, trying to just drain away any bit of meter he possibly can because this is a pretty passive game. Very oh. passive and and saying that, h do looking capitalize as much damage as possible right now. Gonna break the arms. And this will put Fish Like Steve in a definitely quite a life deficit. But man, when it's against Astray, you always have to be quite careful with the options. Always has the low, always has the overhead. But a lot of confidence being shown in h Dope's play. Putting another round on the board for himself. These adjustments, man, they are paying off in a really big way. I'm almost seeing like like fish like Steve doesn't really know how to deal with with that armor. Like Tanya just gets in, puts herself slightly negative, and says, "Oh, I'm gonna armor out because either way, Goro's got my back." And if it's successful, a lot of that Goro time gets made up. I'm going right for that breaker as soon as you were opened up. Fish like Steve trying to get his footing, trying to get his his hands behind the wheel of this situation. Easy down to no problem. Get some easy damage. It's just walking away so patiently, so cool, just chilling, walking back and saying, You're gonna whip right in front of me. Here's an easy whip punish because I'm Ashra. Yeah, and I will say that H Dub has been playing a lot of this very, very well. Now, for those on there, he has purposely been going for like that buff state in every scenario and situation. So he can kind of challenge Ashra's range. It's why Fish like Steve has been looking a little bit uncomfortable and he's been using it. That's why he's been going for the singular buff, for the double buff, and he's just been challenging a lot of Steve's options. This won't kill, but puts him in a very precarious position, very chip heavy situation, and just gonna press into it and close things out. Two to one to H2. Just easily just hanging out. And you know, you, we saw fish like Steve getting some things going. Um playing a little bit more patient and just just kind of waiting but h dope's aggression i think has just been like one step ahead of everything that that fish like steve is anticipating and uh it's it, it's really hard to to kind of tone down that momentum tone down that confidence when you're just seeing tanya just, just putting on a clinic and really turning this set around very very much so and he, he does look genuinely very very comfortable the counter adaptation is really shining through but with that said it's ultimately going to come down to fish like steve's own counter adaptation as well as just like he needs to start being aware of what h dub is just starting to throw out in the neutral because in every instance of when he gets a hit in he's just going to go for that buff man yeah, just going for that buff there's really no reason why not to Mm -hmm. It's deceptively quick as well to get it going. Super quick, amplifying that, that, that low drill to just make sure it does so much damage. Mm -hmm. Nearly 40% here thanks to Goro. And just knocking Serena again. It's the call out from h -Dub. Every time he knows that Serena is coming, here comes a big button that's going to hit both of you. No way you're just throwing that out willy-nilly. And the thing is, it's also super duper smart on his half because, of course, it shuts off Serena for a little bit. And H-Dope on match point, really bringing things back. His counter adaptation decision making are really paying off here. And right now, Steve has to pull something out of his hat to bring things back. 
You know, like the H-Trope is locking down Serena so well, I almost wonder if he's just like only staring at the icon to like see, hey, it's coming out. I have a few frames to just like press a button or if it's just pure, just read and anticipation. Like, you know, it's very, very, very hard to tell here. Oh, that was not, that was not, that did not happen fast enough to punish that recovery. Big neutral duck. And here's the thing. Just like Steve, he has to spend the bar on the meter and do as much damage as possible right now because he just needs to put himself back on the board, even if things out. But in saying that, him backing off just gives h Dope the time he needs to get those buffs in. But a big down two can't quite capitalize off it. He's going to suffer. It's just isn't going to be a huge, huge big combo, but ooh, enough to put Steve in a very precarious position. Oh, Tries goes for the flash, flash armor. Tries to flash parry through that, but that's not going to be enough. Yeah, that's plus frames. Going to challenge a fish like Steve. Last breath. Overhead. Into oh, 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 open fatal blow. Forces H to, to break right now. And there it is. That was it. There, that just was it. It was insane. Oh, man. Went for the fatal blow, but thankfully for H Dope, had the three bars to go right into the breaker and just say, hey, You've got no bar. You've got no life. You're not going to flawless block this. This is a tough thing to flawless block, just like on the fly, too, especially because he didn't like press a button into it. He just like he just kind of stopped and we're like, oh, chandelier. Let's go. Yes, chandelier. <laughs> yeah, but let's incredible go. play from H. Stroke with his adaptation. Big shout outs to Fish Like Steve for playing really, really well throughout the tournament. And we did yes. start to see these small <laughs> little micro adaptations at the end because like at the very start of this, H. Stroke was making quite a few mistakes looking for those really big hard reads to challenge and just kind of catch uh, Steve off guard. But it really did feel like that one single game is all H. Stroke kind of needed to bring things back just just kind of like again it's it's the adjustment it's you know feeling out what the opponent is is falling for feeling out what's working what's not working and it, it i i feel like the the main takeaway from from this entire set was that fish like steve didn't didn't really have a way to deal with chandelier into goro like you know there, there's a few approaches to it you can you know try to make it whiff you can try to jump back um you could even use a cameo to try to counteract the goro and I, I know that's pretty difficult usually it's another goro to try to stop the second the first goro uh either way we're looking at the bracket here we got winners finals coming up we're down to the top four only four players remaining that's omi and takanada on the winners finals and we have in the loser semifinals down to the lower bracket on their last tournament life in the double elimination tournament we have h dope versus magic t Yes, this is going to be a very, very exciting match between these two. And man, it is it is really cool to actually see one Omi back and also a Sub Zero in uh, that high up in yeah. the uh, top eight situation we have right now. Look, it's it's really cool. And again, we 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 talked about it before. We love seeing the character diversity. But if you want to see more, and trust me, like seeing Sub Zero with Chameleon just counter like like just just complimenting sub-zero is is such a treat to watch you guys don't want to miss it when we come back after a quick break we're going to go right into that winner's finals so don't go anywhere we'll be right back welcome ladies and gentlemen to final combat that's what kind of money is looking there it is oh he waited for it it grand champion for more combat one here no, not again. No, no, no. He tried to get oh, and why Jeff and I tried to get away. With the pop off BT, I am so sorry. What? Will I have been that into the orb? That was disgusting. It's so big. Combo in the other combo. Come again and shot it with Ray. It's your first. Yeah, 
meus amigos, hoje é dia de Pro Competition no Brasil, olha que legal. E eu vou mostrar pra vocês como que funciona a estrutura aqui, ó. Eu tô gravando um pouco antes do momento de começar o evento, os Pro Players já estão chegando, olha só, o Zeus aqui na fila, beleza Zeus? Beleza. Tá preparado? Como é que foi o treinamento? Tô, foi, foi pesado, preparado. É, hoje o negócio vai ser difícil, eu vou mostrar pra vocês. Valeu Zeus, já a gente se vê, olha só, tem aqui a parte do credenciamento, eu peguei essa pulseira que eu não sei porque, o que quer dizer essa pulseira da minha cor? É da equipe. Ah, da equipe. Que bom, ainda bem que se fosse de pro player, tava lascado, não ia dar certo não. E aqui já tem os pro players fazendo cadastramento. E aí, como é que você tá? E aí? Beleza, eu sou rando, eu não sou pro player não. Mas vai jogar hoje e, ah, e pelo que você viu aqui vai ser fácil, né? Com a galera que você viu aqui. Ah, né? Minha segunda partida é só contra um dos chilenos aí, né? Ah, mano. Tá certo, olha só, os irmãos chilenos aqui, ah, mais uma vez. Olá. Bem-vindos, olá. Olá. Muito, muito bem. Tudo bem, tudo bem. Preparado? Prepa- eu não, eu não estou preparado. Vocês têm que estar preparados. <risos> Mas olha, eles estão fazendo aqui o cadastramento. Ó, tem um monte de PlayStation 5 aqui para o pessoal jogar, mas logo aqui na entrada, o primeiro que já tem, já tem um monte de gente jogando. Ó. Vamos ver. Tekken Master BR, você? Eu mesmo. Vim lá das Arábias e agora em terras paulistas. E nos corredores a gente encontra muitos nomes famosos, como por exemplo, ah, Rubuiu, que vai entrar ao vivo daqui a pouco, beleza? Isso aí. Com certeza, papai. Tá animado hoje? Demais, cara. Pô, momento histórico pro Brasil, né? Pro Competition, um dos maiores campeonatos né, do, do circuito. Vai ter uma etapa brasileira. Muita gente boa, vai ter os gêmeos, né? Que são considerados aí, com certeza, os favoritos. Mas, ó, os brasileiros vão fazer bonito, hein, cara? Que Lestinó, que tá com o Kung Lao, que, ó... Tá, tá registrado, não tá, Olha ali, só, Ariel tá por aqui. Demais, Ariel, mano. que legal ver os caras do mundo inteiro pra aqui, né? Pô, cara, é uma pena que o Sonic Fox não pôde ver, porque ele já tinha é, inscrito pro, pro torneio, né? Mas a gente tem, como o Buiu falou, os gêmeos, tem outros gringos aqui também, argentinos, muito fortes. Inclusive, se eu não me engano, a primeira partida vai ser do, do, do Scorpion Proxy, é um dos chilenos. Mas é como o Buiu falou também, os brasileiros estão muito fortes, o Killer, o Page, o Gui e todos os outros que estão chegando. Tem um aqui que no, no offline, no online, ele faz muito bonito, que é o Mano Phelps. Fica de olho nesse menino aí, rapaz. E agora eu convido vocês a conhecer Conhecer aqui a parte da stream, vem cá. Esse aqui é o lugar onde os casters brasileiros vão ficar. Então tem aqui o Stream Master. Ali atrás vocês estão vendo a dupla brasileira de comentaristas. O troféuzão tá lá dentro, tá incrível. E é o seguinte, ele pisca. Só ah, não, o troféu isso, que pisca. Spoiler. Não é possível, a gente vai ver isso. Hoje não, a gente vai ver amanhã. Que pisca, bebê. Esse lugar, vou até falar mais baixo, porque é aqui onde a mágica acontece. Essas são as duas, dois locais de transmissão onde as partidas que vão para a live acontecem. Então aqui é o lugar de tensão. Você consegue perceber que aqui o clima tá tenso? E tem os locais de entrevista, então eu também vou fazer entrevistas aqui, ó. Vocês vão ver eu conversando com os pro players e os convidados aqui. Então hoje é um dia muito especial, espero que vocês estejam gostando, pra gente tá sendo muito legal ter todo mundo aqui no Brasil na Pro Competition de Mortal Kombat 1. This is no time to smile. Hell yeah it is. Fight a fire god is coming off my bucket list. monster chick I've met. You think me a monster? Eagle. I bet shits take more effort than beating you, Will. I will so enjoy killing you. Booyah! 
finish him. Go time. Activate Sonic Boom! Peace unlocked. Fatality. Peacemaker wins. Flawless victory. A Pro Competition 2024 reuniu jogadores de todas as partes do mundo no Brasil nos dias 2 e 3 de março de 2024. E foi uma oportunidade incrível dos Pro Players brasileiros conhecerem os de fora e também Reunir todos esses amantes de Mortal Kombat 1 aqui no Brasil, na Login House, na Vila Madalena, em São Paulo. O evento foi dividido em dois dias. Primeiro dia, no sábado, as eliminatórias para ver quem seriam os 24 melhores colocados que seriam classificados para domingo, o segundo dia. Com, obviamente, 24 pessoas disputando o troféu de primeiro lugar na Pro Competition. Muitos brasileiros se classificaram para o Top 24 e 50% da Winners estava com o Brasil. Eu já participei de campeonatos dos Estados Unidos e tal. Acho que o campeonato de maior nível que eu joguei do Mortal Kombat 1 é esse aqui. Só tem gente forte, não tem luta fácil. Não, que esse nível tá, tá alto até demais aqui. Se você olhar ali a tabela ali do top 24 ali, que todos os jogos, os confrontos vão ser super... É emocionante, né? Só tem jogador de, de alto nível aqui. Olha só, o Murilo BDS enfrentou o campeão da EVO, Scorpion Prox. E o Murilo trouxe o General Shaw e Darius para enfrentar o Baraka do Scorpion Prox. Quase venceu, mas o Scorpion Prox ficou com a melhor com 3x2. O Killer Schnock com seu Kung Lao enfrentou o americano King Gambler com um Johnny Cage muito bem treinado e não conseguiu passar por ele. E também pela Winners, o Conqueror enfrentou o Nicholas, chileno, com seu Raiden. E deu muito trabalho para ele, mas Nicholas seguiu pela Winners. E sim, tivemos Brasil vencendo na Winners com o Brian, com seu Sub-Zero, que venceu o espanhol Javier com seu Scorpion. E tivemos várias outras partidas insanas, como a do Conqueror contra o argentino Chocolate. Tudo você pode conferir no Warner Play, a live tá lá. E passando por todo mundo, o chileno Scorpion Prox consegue chegar na grande final pela Winners. E o brasileiro mais bem pontuado foi o Brian, que foi pela Losers, depois de perder para o chileno Nicolas. Venceu na Losers o veterano Killer Shinnok por 3x1. E ao enfrentar novamente o Javier pela Losers, ele perdeu de 3 a 0 E o Javier disputou a final da Losers com o Nicolas. Javier venceu e foi para a grande final. E tivemos Scorpion Prox do Chile contra Javier da Espanha. E o Scorpion Prox venceu por 3x1 utilizando seu Baraka contra o Scorpion do Javier. E recebeu o grande troféu da Pro Competition 2024 do Brasil das mãos de Raiden e levantou a taça. Muchas felicitaciones! Muchas gracias! Sim, sí, quero saber... Como te sientes al ganhar a Pro Competition? Feliz e aliviado porque esto me sirve mucho para la Final Combat, para clasificar porque va a dar muchos puntos este torneo. E você pode continuar acompanhando todos os principais torneios de Mortal Kombat 1 aqui no Warner Play. A gente transmite tanto para YouTube, TikTok e Twitch também os principais torneios. Vem com a gente! going on ladies and gentlemen fans and combatants we're here we're back eu east this is the top four i'm darth arma joined by history behind the warrior and uh we've got a great top four for you in an amazing region but before we get to that we're gonna check out some merch warrior tell me about this merch yes we do have a lot of very wonderful merch able to pick up at the wbshop.com i highly highly recommend taking a look at these and definitely getting your hands on some of them because some of these these designs are just wonderful and as as someone who has traveled overseas and i shamelessly have i think three mk1 hoodies they are wonderful and i i 
really do recommend you check it out yourself at wbshop.com that's right that's right the uh the, the incredible uh you know the the detail and it's just awesome representing you know to the world how much you love mortal Kombat and just amazing to 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 see those interactions with with people because it is widely loved so spread some love spread some love for mortal Kombat and uh pick up some merch today wbshop.com and uh again if you guys are out in the area or are willing to travel out to combo breaker definitely worth doing nothing nothing beats the energy of being at a live event and combo breaker is no exception incredibly ran super on time just just perfect like throughout all the years like decades of combo breakers out there will tell you that this is an event you don't want to miss if you love fighting games not just for mortal Kombat, but for everything mortal Kombat pro competition this is going to be the final offline stop before the finale so it's a it's going to be incredible a lot of high level players are going to be there to solidify their spot to make sure they get enough points and of course there's going to be a big prize pool for the players that do qualify there for the end so so much up for grabs if you're a competitor if you're a fan doesn't matter either way you want to be there if you love fighting games if you just love being there and again i can't i can't re, re i can't stop emphasizing on what the energy is like the giant stage the massive crowd people just screaming for their their, their favorite players the pop-offs the production everything amazing at combo breaker be a part of it and make sure you're there Mm -hmm. And with that being said, let's turn our eyes towards the present as we finally dawn into the finale of just this wonderful exhibition of the European Eastern scene. That said, we do on our winner's side have Omi and Takenada. Omi, of course, a face that hasn't been seen in a competitive scene for quite a while, but has come back with a ver burning vengeance. With now that Sub-Zero is in a very good place, especially paired up with that of Chameleon. But on the other side, we do have have Takenada, a very, very so, yeah. uh, an infamous name that has really paved his way from qualifier to qualifier to qualifier. There is a reason why he's sponsored by Panther, and he's he's here today to show why he is. But it's up against Omi, who has been a very pleasant surprise, especially with this return to form. Yeah, it's really cool to see, you know, what what Chameleon can add to Sub Zero's toolkit. Like it makes slide so much better. The fact that you can kind of, you know, have a pseudo like way to get out of a block slide or the combo from a hit slide in Katana's lift. Um, you know, you have a little bit of a, the, the, the easy glade combos if, uh, if, if Jade costume is on. So you always got to be watching out for it. You always got to see what's available and, you know, you could kind of tell onto the tendencies of what Sub Zero is trying to do. EX the armor right through it just to get a little get some, get some damage on the board here yes now one thing I do want to point out right early on out the gate something that Omi has been doing and Takanaba he definitely scoped this out is the down one slide He's been cancelling it out into the massive uh, big jump that Chameleon has in order to kind of get that cross up into the dive break now, Kanada scoped that out and instantly shut that down right away. And that's important information for Omi throughout the rest of the match. He's like, how many times can I do it? How many times is Kanada going to respect it? And can I get away with it? Yeah, oh, speaking of respecting things, Takanada ready to block that dive kick, ready to punish. Oh, that was bait. And that was very smart of Omi not to really go for it. I mean, he could have done something like a stand to slide to get under the, the Kano knives, but maybe just not ready for it. If Baraka's love doing that, whether they're rocking Kano or they're rocking Striker, they're gonna try to whiff an easy button right in front of you and present a fake situation. 100%. And, you know, we're definitely gonna see that a lot from this level of play right now. And there is the that one into the roll. Yeah, just going right into it, making sure that you get some more damage here. Oh, the Kano Knife, the second one, just making that perfect contact. Whoa, hold on. Somebody got a, 
Somebody got hit behind Sub-Zero. Chameleon gonna be down for the count just for a little bit. So this is Takanada's chance to really get in there, especially after using that last bar. That could have been a much bigger punish, but instead opts to go for the down one just instinctively. And Takanada backing off. Doesn't really have a life lead, but still just backing off, trying to just tick away little by little, making Sub-Zero go for these risks. And Omi getting that perfect back throw afterwards. Takanada playing too passively, I think. Way too passively, and that's gonna be an easy combo. Easy freeze. And we are in the corner, and that is all tied up. Yep, things looking very, very good for Omi right now. But that being said, we are tied up one apiece. The patience of Takanada is definitely coming to bite him here. Like, he can only space out Omi for so long before it just it starts to bite him, ironically. And uh oh, full combo punish. Hat forces out the breaker from Omi right now, but oh, the anti unfortunately can't get the freeze due to the air catch. Throw out the glaive. A lot of respect being shown from Takanada right now. Omi backing up, spacing things out. Knows that he doesn't have to overextend too, too much. Has a lot of options with Ice Clone and just what the utility that he's given by Chameleon. At the end, just Ice Clone once again, just backing off, opening up some space. Throwing out the Ice Clone itself as a projectile to push him back. <laughs> Overhead. He's in there, but those Kano knives do scale a lot. You know, you don't really get too much damage to, to a lot of, or you don't get too much access to a lot of damage. The down one stopping the ice stone from coming out entirely. Hold on, can he turn this around? He literally needs one hit. Oh gosh, is it fast enough? It yes! is just enough. Wait, is it this? I don't think this is going to kill. It's going to put in bleed state, right? Yeah, yeah, it does 320 raw, I believe. Yep, this is going to be chip territory, which is still very scary against Baraka. And oh, the right call being made right there. That was so smart from Takanada. Goes in for the slide. Is covered by Kano, just in case. And Omi pressed the button, and that's exactly what Takanada had predicted. Yeah, I think the only option there at the end for Omi was to flawless block something um, and, and just hope that Takanada overextended there. But... That was such a shift in momentum. It just felt like Omi was was in control the whole time. He had him in the corner, and then as soon as he found that one opening, that one little bit of breathing room, Takanada took that inch and stretched it out to a mile, a kilometer, I should say, since we're doing EU. But yeah. <laughs> what a what a change! I mean, you've got to you've got to really tap in to make a momentum shift like that. Like that was that was all Omi. It goes to show just like the clutch factor that like Takanada has to make these really big ballsy reads. Because I mean, just a raw fatal blow, that's that's just a lot of damage anyway in general. And Omi clearly not very happy with how that last round went, but just applying maximum amounts of damage, ending in a dive kick, going into the ice clone to apply that pressure, backing up a little bit like what we saw in the first game. Yeah, just kind of like taking their time and whoa, amplifying the Ice Clone. That's such a, it, 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 you don't really see a lot of utility of that move, but to get out of, you know, being forced to block things like Kano Ball, it is good. Whoa, the knives going the wrong way. Yeah, very awkward scenario right there. Beautiful call out by Omi. Just throwing out the Ice Clone, getting a lot of the, car uh, the carry to the end of the screen. But oh, big armor. Couldn't quite catch him out the triple Ice Clone, however. Big jump in, goes for the back free one. Just a lot of down ones and just stand ones into that of the ice clone at the moment, but can't capitalize off the big jump in. This is 100% still in Takanada's play, but a little awkward overhead catch. Yeah, very, I don't think, I don't think he was Ooh. anticipating it either. Oh no, Molina gets stopped in her track. I don't think we're going for the, the fatal blow. We're going for the combo afterwards. There's only 10 seconds left on the clock, but here comes a dive kick as Baraka just crumples on the floor, just knowing how close it was to being his. All he needed was just one more hit. What a jump kick in the Ice Clone to get out of there safely. Yeah, very clutch, but oh, there's a triple Ice Clone colliding. Something you actually rarely see. Always been fishing for that all day. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's to kind of counteract armoring through just a regular Ice Clone. So it's kind of like bait. And mm -hmm. Omi was using there. So you amplify the ice clone. So there's multiple ice clones. And also you're you're recovering a little bit farther away. So you don't really get punished. So a little added mind game. I love seeing. Oh, I thought he was going to get under the second knife. 
caught by the stray second hit right there. Beautiful blocks and great decision making over his part. And really ballsy one. Goes for the slide in. Gonna get the catch and forces the breaker right out of Takanada. Oh, yes, there it is. Very well scoped from Takanada. Omi's been doing that a little bit too, too much. And, you know, while Takanada wasn't able to successfully catch him on the triple ice, Omi's like, that's cool. I'm going to catch you on this fatal blow right now. But it has a considerable amount of work in. You, you only get one fatal blow. So, you know, because it was potentially a last round. Oh, no. He found the hit. Omi putting it, getting put up against the ropes. Down to the final round here in game number two. The 30% combo was just enough to seal the deal. He's waiting for the dive kick. Yeah, we did see an up block right there. That means that, again, it's just the next added layer. Takanada knows what Omi's going for. It's I know that you know what you're going to do now. Or oh, overhead cancels the back too. A lot of just patience being shown by Takanada. Gets hit by the stray hit again. Goes for the low. Big chunky down too right there. Yeah, goes for the down two because he doesn't want to play that guessing game anymore. He doesn't want to play like, is he going to dive kick? Is he not? You know what? Down two, easy. Good block of the overhead. Oh, but the throw, I feel like that put him in a very bad state. It actually like put him super negative in the corner. Oh, gosh, he gets the neutral jump punch. And Takanata immediately going for the breaker, wants to get a little bit more aggressive and just patiently waiting, waiting for Sub-Zero to do something, waiting for Sub-Zero to present something that's punishable. Yeah, being covered by Kano is very smart, but this is this feels like a very slow game at the moment. Oh, big jump freak. Whoa, what? that's cool. What? Oh, wait, he's beating Takanada. He's being very well aware that Omi's holding on to that breaker. Big down two. Keep an eye out for things. Couldn't get the rotation. Slides out. Neutral duck into the down two. Clipping the jaw. Taking the head off. Takanada puts another point on the table for himself with some really big ballsy reads and the understanding of this matchup isn't something we've seen omi be familiar with earlier on yeah it was it was a little i guess it must have been a little bit telling there at the end to try to bypass any kind of like breaker situation try to bypass you know he he was super plus after because you don't unless you have a cameo that that helps you after armored slide you don't get a combo out of it you just get super plus frames on that on, on your opponent's wake up like you're all over them so you're free to move in or out depending on the situation and just like him shuffling around on top of him it, it just made it a little too easy for takanata to lose so i would have i would like omi to kind of mix it up just a little bit definitely i i feel like he's been playing at a specific way in a specific tempo and it has been working for him and i think that might be due to the somewhat uh, prolonged underrepresentation of sub-zero and it's just it's paid off in a really big way but takanada very familiar with this matchup and very familiar with knowing how to deal with only style of play here yeah <laughs> feeling it so easily here Ending with the overhead and Takanada not getting hit by it. Again, part of the matchup. Understanding where the tricky parts of the string are. Understanding, whoa, understanding you just kind of poke back and forth. Uh, now, Sub-Zero's down one. It's got some of the best range out of all the down ones in this game. It might not be the fastest, but it is very, very pestering when you're in that, like, poking war and you're just like, I want to do something about it, but I really can't. Oh, the overhead makes a connection. Whoa. Finally, off the time, off the time, and kind of going for that, he lands it. It's going to be big damage. 37 is a lot, and Omi just looking to just finish this round as soon as possible. Putting on a bit of a com uh, combo exhibition right now for the Twitter. Oh, yeah. Definitely seems like I'm watching a combo YouTube video. Just so, so swaggy, so beautiful. And there's the throw, the toward escape. Perfectly called out by Takanada. Good block of the overhead, jumping over. I thought he was just going to get out of the corner for the round, but maybe Takanada can come in and clean this up three out easily. Only has to fight back. He tries to armor through. And there it is again. Oh, wait, that actually might be it. He goes into Fatal Blow. And, oh, no, he's going for the optimal. He's going for the... Oh, God, this is going to do a lot, but... Oh, man, it was all Omi a second ago. Now it's all Takanada gonna scale i don't think it's gonna kill but that bleed out damage is what's important is he gonna throw out the kano oh that's such a ballsy read and decision making right there throwing up the kano knives to guarantee the armor break or catch him out the sky and just go into the spin 
excellent excellent play right there from Tucker Nada to catch out Omi. My god, I can see your face with glee, man. That was a hell of a winner's finals. That was insane. I mean, what a comeback there at the end. And it was just, it, it's one of those things where it's like, you, you have to have that special skill to like, to finish them off to just to get that last little bit because a really good player like Takanada is going to take that little centimeter and you know create a, a, so much more for them and it's it's hard because you know you you, you don't want to overextend and it's just Baraka is just momentum after momentum after momentum the overheads the lows like calling out the armor and just like shredding through it but I mean, they were all such, such close games, especially game number one and game number three. So, I mean, I know Omi just kind of like rushed out of there. I know not feeling good about it at all, but that was a, uh, this was, this was a good call out. Forgetting that Baraka's fatal blow is super fast and super long range happens to the best of us, happens to everybody, but you can't let it, you can't let it, uh, and look at that, man. Like even game number two down to the wire, it came out to that throw, possibly hitting that throw whiffing. And it was, it was so just, just important. enough. Like it, the, the clutch factor of Takanada really kicked in van, you know, whilst the score says Frio, it definitely didn't feel like it. That fight was a war and we could very well see a run back with Omi now in losers finals, but Things aren't over just yet. We'll be hopping over to lose the semi-finals where we will be seeing H-Dope battle it out against Magic T. Yeah, and I believe we've, uh, you know, we, we've seen this time and time again throughout this region, two very strong players representing this part of the world. Uh, so they're familiar with each other, like all of them they know. So we just saw Magic T getting the victory over H-Dope's twin brother, K-Top, uh, in Losers Round 2. So we're going to be seeing a little bit of... Um, could be some helpful advice from his brother the way that magic t was playing and not only that but also being invested in your brother's match and seeing like things that they might not be seeing from an outside perspective so now we can take it to the test is this twin brother h dope strong enough to stop the momentum of magic t I believe it's very, very possible here. Because honestly, the micromanaging that HDO has in his style of play is what really makes him such a formidable and very consistent opponent. But that being said, Magic T's set play potential is absolutely insane because he's going to go into the air ball, into the Lao setup, and you got to mix up your options, man. That was so weird. He got, he blocked the hard part, but got hit by the no mix up part. And Magic T wasn't ready to like commit to that. Like I wouldn't be ready to commit to just one button either. Goro popping him up. You're closer and closer to getting back this life lead. And here it is H to leading with it. But Magic T just one hit away into going into that fatal blow. Super negative with that Kung Lao hat afterwards. So smart of H to to just be ready to just swing and take their turn. Oh no. Oh, that's something we've been seeing a lot from Magic T today. People not appropriately punishing ball roll, and I think they're just not ready for it. You see, it's just it's just being thrown out here. Yeah, it's 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 like uh, it's like you know, luck is not a superpower, but right now Magic T is is getting away with a, a quite a few ball rolls that just kind of went into his opponent's court and just got easily fumbled does get the breaker to, you know, get a little aggressive here in the corner, but h Dope fighting out with Tanya again. Anytime Tanya starts, Tanya starts that corner or starts any kind of combo, she can kind of dictate, are we going away from the corner? Are you going back into the corner? A lot of side switch options coming from her. Ooh, nice grab on seeing the up block potential that was up there. Nice, it's going to go into the Goro again. Now, mind you, this has been a very, very slow cooldown for Goro. h has been slowing down a lot of his options potential because Goro's been so out of play for this nearly entire round here. Like, he can't get much off that. And as good as the armored option is, like, he can't do much. But right now, the life lead. Oh, very interesting interaction. But right into the pirouette spin. And h Dope puts a point on the board for himself. That's another thing that, that comes into play in this matchup, but I feel like we're seeing a little bit more than we did uh, earlier on when K-Top was playing Magic T. Tanya having that armor that lifts her up off the ground. So you're kind of negating that Kung Lao low hat. You know, normally after Melina's done with her combo, she sets down the low hat and then she goes for her 
her high overhead string and that's kind of you know the the the, the mind game that's kind of the you know is she going to commit to that or is she going to you know try to bait out that armor now normally against most other characters she doesn't even need to bait out armor because that's not an option so i'm seeing magic t being a little bit uncomfortable with the fact that hey i might have to specifically bait this out and even if she does bait it out goro keep it her nice and safe so what are you really gonna do it's very very much so but man such a big ballsy read from hsm he's been doing that quite consistently at the start of a lot of his games here just throwing out the long string going right into the strong combo at the very start and just getting a significant life lead to just open up the buff as well for the rest of the game yeah, life lead you very very important it really just changes the pace of what you have to and what you don't have to do and right now, Magic Team needs to turn it up. He has to turn it up. He has to get something going. And now you have to know, Goro's not in the picture for quite some time. So this is your opportunity. This is when baiting out an armor move is actually beneficial for you. This is when you can make it hurt. Yeah, well, that said, no fear from H. <gasps> looking. Oh, we're and talking about what a flawless block. Fighting. What a flawless block. And now, you know, what are you going to do? You're going to bait out an armor move? Yes out of there what Punish. wait that actually oh God, no did not have been it. all right yep knew that the up block was coming gonna get the rear end of this and that did so much was that 20. it was close to 20 but again because of that that 950 howl thanks to goro that was the difference maker that throw was just enough because of that up block Oh man, such a devastating move. As beneficial as up block can be, there is a risk and reward factor to it. And you gotta keep in mind, you can only do it so many times before your opponent picks up on it. But with that said, h does once again have the life lead, but you gotta be very careful. As we've seen, Magic T can bring things back. Yeah, can easily bring it back here. Nice little conversion. Another nice conversion from uh, from uh, Goro popping in and just raising the roof. Wake up buttons after the delay wake up. Such a great option when your opponent is not ready for it because of how great the risk is. This is the snowball effect. This is Molina. He's not going to have time to build that bar. Oh, no. Did no, have the Goro in time, and that is going to be it. Magic team. No, it's not. Up. Oh, no. <laughs> All right, just in time with Goro coming back, goes for the pirouette. Has Goro in the plus frames? Dude, that was that was so silly. That was so <laughs> down to the wire. But again, moral victory for Magic T. Like, okay, I didn't get I didn't get the round, but I did make her come off all three bars. So now going into this round, limited resources. Those bars mean armor wake ups. Those three bars mean a breaker and a stop of a combo entirely. So Magic T in a favorable position right here. Backing off, slight life lead towards Magic T, so knows I don't really have to go in, so I can be patient, I can run out the clock, I can just kind of get a little pesky with these Kung Lao low hats. Good fall is blocked, minimizing that chip damage, but here comes the break dance, here comes the Goro for the pop up. Yeah, hit shot knowing that there was a bit of added gravity to that, choosing Ox to go for the buff instead. He blocked that? Did oh, he just no. block Did he just block that? He just blocked that. Oh my, God. my goodness me, but. H also getting very, very close. There he is in Fatal Blow right now. This is a very scary situation. Oh, it's going uh -oh. to do a lot of damage as well. It's not going to kill. It's going to put him in a very, very strong position. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This is, a, and again, you're talking about Tanya. You're talking about loads of chip damage. You're talking about easy access to pretty much safe armor. So what are you going to do down in this last little part? He tries to ball, air ball in. I, I respect that. Still, h Strip's turn. Gonna press. A lot of respect. Slowing down the game plan a little bit. Looks for the raw ball roll, but... Ooh, these raw ball rolls, they are catching out Magic T. And the, the, I have to say, he has not been very successful in landing ball ro uh, raw ball roll as much as he thinks he is. He's doing it a lot. And I know it's a very big, ballsy read, because you're like, if I throw out every hand there... It'll catch my opponent, but it's, when you're yeah. paired with Lau and you don't have the hat out, it's just a very dangerous situation. I see when the hat is out is so obvious, Done. and you're like, of course mm. they know I'm in a ball roll. But if I don't have the hat out, they don't know I'm in a ball roll. But it just has not, like you said, it has not been put in the right situations. The and I see a lot, you know, a lot of rounds being thrown away from those 
I'm gonna say careless ball rolls. Those those you know throw caution to the wind ball rolls. So I want to see a little bit more reservation from Magic T. I want to see a little bit more patience from Magic T, and I want to see this set go the distance. It, we could very well see that, but right now a lot of really big careless risks being pulled up by Magic T, and it looks like he's being a tad bit flustered by just how well H Dope is playing today. Over the other side, whipping for days as Tanya comes in with a nice combo. Forward throw to solidify this corner positioning here. H Dope just being purely aggressive here, not trying to let Magic T get anything started, but Magic T finds the ball roll, the raw ball roll, as you can see there. It does connect. Do you agree with using this fatal blow? I'm not entirely too sure, but we're at this point, two games down, you want to maximize your damage as much as possible and capitalize on anything. So I believe this very well could be a bit of a do or die situation, but H Dope scoping things out, knowing full well the armored reversal goes over the Lao Hat, something we literally, literally just thought touched on. You were just, I mean, but again, that was like in neutral. You were talking about the ball roll being accompanied by the low hat, but it's not enough. Look at this matchup. And again, both the twins play this character, but H Dope is the one that's a little bit more committed to Tanya. So I, I think he, you know, the, the luxury of seeing his brother playing against Magic T with this character really helps solidify the game plan before we even went into the first game. Magic T needs to turn it up. He tried to go for the throw and it just gets easily dug. H Dope is playing on another level right now. H Dope's literal third eye is opened up right now and he's just making, look at that. So much damage, just getting things in, just making these small little micro decisions that are really paying off in a huge, huge, massive way happening in man he is ascending h dope just just being this 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 all-knowing being here just transforming before our eyes oh boy Goro gonna keep it safe hell yes the challenge gets clipped by the overhead finishes the end of the low string just staggering slowly but surely from h being poked out but fatal blow is in play and if we've seen anything from h dope it's these small little clutch moments oh doesn't quite get the hit confirmed he needs to close things out so much patience, such good blocking as well. Yeah, and just 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 waiting it out, you know, not really overextending, not really putting themselves in danger. And I am seeing a, a different tone here from Magic T. Oh, waiting it out. Ooh, Ooh, breaks and the wasted. armor as well. Yeah, a little bit of the waste of the armor. Maybe thought they could absorb one little hit and just just didn't have enough. Yeah, but this is, I can imagine this is really good for Magic T's morale right now because he needs to stop some of H Dope's momentum. If he can get this game in, it can definitely swing in his favor, but there's just a lot of counter adaptation that needs to be put in place here. Yeah, you can see like Magic T is not even going for like the Kung Lao setup anymore because of how dangerous it is against, you know, Tanya's wake up. The wake up is just so good to counteract it like entirely. There's so many, so many options throughout the game. And sometimes it's uh, a specific character. Mm -hmm. And something I do want to know, and I don't know if you've seen this, it's been very smart from the H though. Whenever he sees Magic T flawless block one of his hits, he will instantly go for the armor right afterwards, capitalize. This won't kill, but this is gonna hurt as we combo into Fatal Blow right now. This game could not be any more closer, I swear to <laughs> It's down to the wire. It's down to the wire here. And it's just so exciting to see which player is going to get aggressive, which player is going to back off. Now, Magic T has a pretty good life lead, but not much. He tries to jump out of there, and the wake-up armor, the wake-up armor gets down to punish. Brutality, blood everywhere. And that is H-Dope sealing the deal 3-0 over Magic T. Yep, H Dope played that very, very well, avenging his brother as well, mind you. <laughs> and it was, it was, it's very poetic in that sense, but very well played. Unfortunately for Magic T, he made some really, really big ballsy reads that didn't pay off as much as they did in game, which is unfortunate. I mean, you know, big shout outs to Magic T, who's an incredible streamer, and it's just, just always so entertaining to watch. But towards the end of this set, we did see Magic T making the right adjustments, calling out that wake up armor, jumping back, air ball rolling in, 
like getting all these 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 strange like punishes that I've never seen, but he's definitely lapped it up. And it's just, I think it just took a little bit of time for Magic T to kind of adjust. I really, really saw Magic T tapping in there in the last two games. And I would have loved to see like a much longer set, but I don't think that's going to be the last time these guys really face off. Um, but it's just aged up all over it, like all over the right calls and everything. Yeah, it's just playing so fundamentally solid today. A lot of confidence in his play is being shown. He was a little bit slow to get the ball rolling, but, you know, just that that big down two is just such a <laughs> massive call out. Just to end that set in itself. But that said, H-Dope will be moving on to losers finals now against Omi, which means that we'll be seeing a Sub-Zero Tanya match, which I gotta say, I don't think I've seen before. Yeah, I did, nothing really uh, comes out to mind uh, immediately. But like we said, Sub-Zero, character we don't see that often. And a character that's kind of get, been given a new light, a new a new life, if you will, in in, in the ability to use that cameo. The, the cameo. the cameo platter, if you will, where you get a little mm -hmm. bit of everything. And so much just kind of complement sub-zero's tool set you know using the melina air size to extend things like slide using katana's fan lift to also you know uh extend combos with slide or make slides have a little bit more of a mind game about being punished uh and of course the the jade glaive you know being able to safely go into the overhead as you go right into the jade glaive and you know it it, it really helps keep that safety net on because you as sub-zero you want to go for the overhead like it's it's access to damage and it's it's not the fastest thing in the world but you, you get something going and, and that's what you want to do uh as sub-zero get something going get them in the corner and then just try to lock them down with pressure and options the ice clone the ice push everything very very true and like you just said when it comes to chameleon she's just such an incredibly well-rounded cameo and you know omi's been really getting like just the most out of her right now all of this off a slide mind you which is insane yeah yeah very very good and that's going to be an easy option for hm not only do you do you anticipate the the ice clone but you can also see it you can react it and armor right through it and get some good damage so i don't think we're going to be seeing as much ice clone coming out of omi definitely definitely not it's just that forward advancing option is just so good at shutting it down and it's ultimately going to come down to omi to just call things out but back to just that was so clean has the corner to work with, just bullies his way out of it. And he's like, okay, I can't use the Ice Clone as much, so I'm gonna clip with the overhead instead. But h -Dope answering back with his own receipts at the moment. Oh, yeah, and again, like, what are you gonna do to that back two? That back two gets blocked and that j Blade comes out, like, you are locked in, buddy. You are there, you're gonna be having to hold this. The low does, does get blocked. Very yeah. good, very good presence of defense from h -Dope. Omi doing a lot right now, and something I've just always been pointed out when I've seen him play. Oh, the just the walk up back to into the overhead into the glade. So disgusting. It's gonna be so optimal. My goodness me. 36 damage. Armor out the corner. Has to do it. Has to do it. Gonna get the buff at the moment. Gonna go for low spin. Unfortunate miss in the Goro. Gonna stagger into the low. That's fully caught. I didn't know that you could combo off that with Chameleon. That was so sick. <laughs> Again, it's just so cool, like, what he can do. Like, she's got so many different, like, ways to, to kind of utilize her entire toolkit. And, you know, you look at a character like Sub-Zero, they have so much already just by themselves. The freeze, the ice clone, the slide, like, everything. The, the dive kick, the mind game of, you know, when you jump up, like, you know, because of the dive kick, like, I feel like Sub-Zero can punish projectiles at like slightly longer ranges than, than a character with just a normal jump in uh, but it all comes down to timing it all comes down to being as precise as possible very very true now it's quite interesting here because a very back and forth game but i want to see what adjustments that h dope can really do to fight against omi here because he's been playing so fundamentally solid throughout this entire tournament the only person that's really put a chip in his armor here has been talkinada 
yeah, I mean, made it all the way to winners finals, and yeah, just, just, just trying to trying to keep that going, trying to not like lose focus here, because that was close too. It was 3-0, but it was close. Mm -hmm. The points definitely do not reflect the match in itself. But yeah, so H Stroke is just being suffocated at the moment by Omi, and the way he's utilizing Ice Clone, the way he's just kind of spacing out his options. I think it's really shutting down a lot of what H-Dope is looking for. And a somewhat sporadic style of Omi, it, I think it's kind of just throwing H-Dope off because he's going for stand one into slide, which is something you don't really see half the time. Yeah, you really... Buff. Yeah, the buff super important here. Uh, you know, a little bit more access to, you know, different options for Tanya. Very, very true. Kind of walking around this particular area of the screen right now, and I don't believe it is too wise for H-Dope to float around this area, because this has kind of been Sub-Zero's ballpark once he gets the thing, things going. But H-Dope finding his way out the corner, slowly but surely, just staggering that button. Beautiful, flawless block. Great catch right there, but this is a breaker right out of Omi. Gonna go for the buff. Oh my goodness me, that was like tip range on that. Yeah, yeah, just like at that very max range. Whoa, he didn't expect it to, to, to hit him on the way back. So just just whiffing a throw because they were still in hit stun up against the wall. Oh, yeah. dearie me. This yeah, is going to be a lot of damage right into the fatal blow. Knows that H-Dope was on the cusp of actually getting a breaker. Very smart to seal things out here. And that's, uh, that's, ooh, this is very close. This is down to the wire. I think he's barely alive, though. Barely alive. Still in this year. Oh, oh. no. Can he clip? That was not a jump kick, but he gets the down four. The down four. So unfortunate. Tip range of Raise the Roof of Goro, and h -Dub just missed it. He made the right read, but just the right <laughs> the right choice was definitely made from Omi just back up open up the screen a little bit more but you know h Dope did have that really big read on the wake up go for the EX projectile absorb the ice clone whatever goes through goes through and it becomes a mid too it's so scary to like deal with it on the other side the other thing that was terrifying there that would open him up towards the end of that that final round uh, when Sub Zero, when Melina costume is on on uh, on the cameo, so that back three string is so good because you can, if you do back three four, you actually get a low low, and you can use Melina's size to extend that combo because it, it pops him up in the air, or you could use Melina's ball roll to go to complement and, and just kind of mix it up and go low overhead overhead. So it, it, it's not only are you like guessing out the gate from, is it going to be the, the overhead starter, the low starter, but even the follow up to the low starter, it could be low, low, or it could be low overhead. So again, this, 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 this cameo, I can't emphasize enough how much it complements this character. Omi off to a great lead here 2-0 oh, and h Trope trying to tap in, h Trope trying to make this comeback here as I'm up against the wall, up against the wall, but that's okay. We're just one slide away from switching it up. Oh, just so, the clutch factor of Omi just make these really just crazy point blank reads is insane. And what is this combo we're seeing right now? <laughs> it wasn't a lot of damage, but it did look good. Yeah, and h uh, is going to have the corner to work with, but he's got to be careful right now. And oh, couldn't get the flawless block in. h is able to break a little bit of that momentum, but Omi right now is in a very, very comfortable position still. Oh, yeah, yeah. Drift definitely oh. feeling himself. What? She put right into it. Her, her, <laughs> her nose touched the ice clone. Like, she barely touched it, and now you're frozen. Now you're susceptible to all this damage. Katana fan lift. It is going to scale, but that's okay. We get to keep the momentum going. You get to, and it's also like how long these combos take that you get Chameleon back and you loop it over and over again. Glaive getting fully uh, blocked. On top of that, the ice ball getting blocked. That's a little bit of chip damage you can avoid. Goes for the breaker. Ops use all three of those bars. Yeah, h up at the moment now, unfortunately, because he used the big jump in. Does lose the buff. Omi knew it was coming. Went for the breaker. Shuts it off at the moment. So h up has to put in so much work to do some damage in. And beautiful scope. This can go right into Fatal Blow. This won't kill, but it will even things out. 
No, no, it's not gonna kill, but that's okay. Still in this, still, uh, you know, just, just gotta keep, uh, gotta keep that confidence. Are we gonna see slide? Slide out of nowhere? That's what I'm betting. Slide out the gate, slide out the gate. Oh, oh. the ice clone. Yes, I believe that was also an attempt from Wake Up Slide from Omi right there to shut off H-Dope's options, but H-Dope's still definitely in this fight right now, and if we've seen anything from him in the loser side, it's that he's very, very good with his adaptability. Yeah, I, so I feel like if you go back and look at a lot of these these sets, these matches where H-Dope has won, it's, it's losing the first one, maybe even losing the second one, but really bringing it back to, to, to just pure dominance uh, once that, that, that download is complete, so to speak. So hopefully that's not the situation for Omi right here. Hopefully he's not being downloaded. Hopefully he can kind of adapt and, and, and change, change the trajectory of his fate. And tap in. <laughs> tap in. That's all you can do is tap in. It's very well possible. We've seen him pull things back before, but you know, like I said, Omi's he's been looking very strong today. But it can't be denied that HNOP's run has been very successful. Unfortunately, yep, very big drop, but oh, full combo punish off the overhead. Has the corner to work with, but there's the armor. Sword triple armor was coming, still goes right through it. Yeah, right through it and uh, look man this is uh this is you getting a little crazy here this is you pressing buttons where you shouldn't be pressing buttons and h dope trying to take this life lead back and this is bad wasting those three bars to stop the combo not a good feeling but omi charging in there with full confidence yes one thing that uh i noticed with h dope right out the gate here maximum aggression but Man, Omi coming back some receipts of himself, looking for pure optimal damage, but unfortunately doesn't quite have the Chameleon cameo to get it all. Works his way out the corner. Gonna get the plus frames and challenges with the down one. Omi, match point and loses finals. Fight. One more round here, as we said. We've seen this before though, like h Dope can turn up. Like this is this is not out of the realm of possibility. Yeah, looks like right now h Dope believes that maybe his over-aggressive nature did catch him, slowing things a bit down at the moment, kind of having that methodical play as we saw a little bit earlier. Just in every extension possible, any clip he can get, goes for the buff and just micromanaging his tools really, really well. Ooh, so much throwing coming out of h Dope, especially like with a the, with the mindset of like, hey, this can get ducked at any point and I can get full combo punished. You know what? I guess Sub Zero doesn't really hurt that bad. So I think, you know, you, you gotta kind of uh, assess the situation. Like, what am I really risking here? I'm not going up against this this heavy damaging character. So yeah, let's take a few more risks. Let's let's get a little nutty and let's do some some unsafe stuff. Yep, 100%. What? But oh, very awkward interaction right there. Not a lot of damage as we've seen from Omi, but oh, quick up down one to catch out the back too. Not only did he tech the throw, he did a backflip too. Like, as he said, get off of me. Like, so unnecessary. You gotta do it in style. How do you know he's edgy if he doesn't take the throw and backflip? Oh, that could have been a big punish there. He, like, he perfectly called out the chandelier, jumped away from it, made it whiff, but I think he just was second guessing himself, second guessing the approach. But that's okay. He's got him locked down here in the corner. Omi, that's oh, what I'm this talking is gonna about. Be a lot. He's got three bars to work with as well. This is going to be a lot of damage with the rotation that he has in Chameleon. This is going to be so much. 39 going to go into the triple ice clone. Things are not looking great for H-Dope as he's eliminated by Omi and loses finals. All Omi there at the end, just fully locking down and just, I, I, I feel like it just took a little bit of adjustments to try to counteract the armor from Tanya. We saw a lot of jumping back on those wake-ups, jumping back in those scenarios where it's it's coming at you. The scenario that, that, that Tanya chandelier swing is coming at you. It's got armor, so don't sit there and just and just block it. Don't sit there and try to challenge it. Make it whiff. And we saw so much success with that, and that really was the the winning factor, the winning situation for Omi throughout this set. That very, very much so is the is the truth of this matchup, you know. Just the overall incredible patience of Omi, I feel is what really helped him here. Just the small little micro decisions paid off in a really huge way. And Hedrop's been getting like so much like mileage 
out of using that armor today you know he's been doing so much and only just picked up on it started to challenge it and started to shut him down yeah it was complete shut down there at the end so omi makes the jump back from the losers finals going back to the grand finals now remember guys this is a double elimination tournament which means you have to lose twice to be out of the tournament entirely so takunata has both of their tournament lives fully intact while omi who got knocked down to the lower bracket the losers bracket uh, in the winner's finals. So in order for Omi to win this tournament, they have to win two consecutive sets, getting rid of both of Takanata's tournament lives, while Omi only has one tournament life left. So Takanata only needs to win one set to win the entire thing. This is Europe East regional qualifier number three. This is the top eight after a grueling weekend of tournament matches. And I, I can't believe it, man. I can't believe we have a Sub-Zero right here. Grand Finals. Ready to yep. go. I think it goes to show the beauty of the cameo system and the versatility that it really does have. Because keep in mind, we are essentially halfway through the combat pack right now. We have Janet Cage coming out at the end of this month, which will then be slowly but surely followed up. But I believe what's left is Farah. And I'm not sure who else is left. I think we might have another cameo. I mean, like you said, it's 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 scheduled. It's all out there. And it's just coming in and, like, adding pieces and pieces of the game, changing the meta, little patches here and there. But, you know, it's it's just fun to see how the game has evolved. It's fun to see, you know, what, what characters can suddenly be unlocked. Oh, boy, smart stuff here. And that's what I'm talking about. So he, the, 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 amplifying the ice clone you know is kind of a bait to you know what someone is supposed to do to deal with regular ice clone so once omi you know solidifies that mindset now he can kind of do regular ice clone and takanada is going to think oh just in case he amplifies it i'm just going to sit here and take it oh it's so many instances where like it could have been like a jump back kick to get some kind of trade or at least some kind of damage maybe jump back kick and go into slide would have been ideal in that situation but Omi is, is opting a lot with that jump back punch. So I, I, I'd like to see it turn into a kick instead. Yeah, so one thing I do want to note is that this has become a very, very button press happy game between the two. A lot of trades off the down ones, a lot of pressing, looking to just suffocate each other's pressure. And it honestly, in a lot of ways, the offense and the mindset that these two have are incredibly, incredibly similar. The only difference that we did see from before or earlier for that amount, beautiful flawless blocks, might I add. No oh, way, no oh, way, that's a win. That's a win. He, he has to do it. Shut down the breaker. That was so sick. How many times today have we seen like under 3% clutch factors just come into play? It's My a god. Lot, a lot of it. And a lot of it is comes down from like the, the clutch flawless blocks that I need to flawless block this or I am going to die. What a comeback here from Takanata. What a call out. Yeah, he's trying to bait something out there with the little air ice cone, dashing up and just getting a regular throw. At the highest level, a lot of players just most likely will take the throw just for the, the fact that, you know, you really don't get much for it. I think he could have got close to there for a real combo, but here comes a wake up armor of his own. Takanata swinging back to back, baby. You got it. So do I. Oh, he ran it back to slide. Got rid of the lift as well. This, this is it, this is so insane, the level of gameplay we're seeing right now. Takanada and Omi playing out of their mind. Oh, caught airborne, gonna have a little bit of extra gravity on this. I don't know if this, don't believe this will kill. No, just not enough. But oh, if there's anything we've seen from Takanada, very clutch. He's dying situations, but the dive kick catches him. How is he so good at flawless blocking? Like when he needs to do it, it's 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 incredible. It's like this crazy passive ability from Takanata. Like when you need to live, you will flawless block every time. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh boy! Beautiful catch. Can't quite get the full punish off that, unfortunately. But still very important. Omi utilizing a lot of armor at the moment just to kind of work around Takanata's offense. You know, I feel like a character like Sub-Zero is always doing stuff, whether you're like putting hands on him and going in Ice Clone, throwing out projectiles. So like he's he's always building meter and like the meter doesn't give him access to too much damage. So I feel like he's just constantly wants to use it, wants to use it, wants to use it. 
What a whiff punish. What a whiff punish. He baited the down four, came in perfectly with that mid that every single Sub-Zero set is too bad and too slow. But we're seeing Omi really utilizing it and really taking Sub-Zero to all new heights here. Yes, playing very, very well. And this is very good for Omi because he has been riding kind of a wave of momentum after his uh, loser's final round. He's been playing very solid, very fundamentally strong. His neutral did catch Takanada off guard quite a fair few times, but at Takanada, there's a reason why he sent Omi to lose his side. He does have a little bit of that edge, is quite familiar with his playstyle, so he may need this one match to just kind of counter adapt and work around his game plan. Yeah, that could be, could be. I mean, it was it was definitely not like a wash in any aspect. And again, it's when you're in that that winner side of grand finals, knowing that, hey, man, I gotta lose two sets to lose this, you might get a little too comfortable, you might get a little too complacent and you might fall asleep just a little bit at the wheel, but not saying that that's what I'm seeing from Takanada. I just think, you know, we could be seeing a little bit of shades of that because Takanada is going into this really confident, but so is Omi, fresh off the win in Losers Finals, getting frozen up thanks to that Ice Clone. Thought he could dash through, absolutely not. And Sub-Zero Slide's got such great corner carry. The Glaive gonna keep it relatively safe as that overhead opens him up, but he drops the third one! Oh, that was a very expensive break he had to throw out off that whiff, but he does have a little bit of time to make up for it. This is going to be a really sick combo. Has a corner to work with, but as we saw in the previous game, Omi can definitely still win this. Oh, that's a sealed deal. Yeah, just walk away a little bit. Throw out those ice clones, man. Don't get too close to Baraka. Yeah, I think that that, that that break, oh, he just dashed in, recognized it, and just challenged perfectly. Stand 2-1 into a nice combo. Going to be building some bar 2, looping through, utilizing that bar. Oh, but didn't see the wake up coming. Takanada coming out strong, coming out swinging here. And you got to watch your toes. You got to block those lows. And now we go from corner to corner, coast to coast, if you will. Yes, absolutely insane what this character is capable of. Chooses to finish a double low this time, change up the pace a little bit. Omi looking very, very strong at the moment. Oh, Chameleon currently locked out of things. Oh, goes for the big spin. And one trade. Checking. But Takanata one step ahead, backing off. Oh, he thought it was a throw. He thought it was a throw, and it wasn't. Big boot right over their face going launching up for a combo and Omi believes in this round believes he just needs the one hit and he's oh, not shit. gonna get it what goes for the big neutral jump I believe that might have been an attempt or a call out like because Omi has been going for a lot of big neutral jumps and like these clutch moments I believe that was just like a really clutch moment that you just misread it that could have been easily misread. Ooh, now we're in an even playing field. Both players have very little meter, very little bar, and we're pretty much down to the wire here. Super close. Does get the counter hit on that down one. Not quite a punish, but that's okay. Looks like Takanata was double dipping anyway. Yeah, good. A lot of micro decisions currently being made from Takanata that are paying off. Definitely better decision making being made, but man. Omi does have to be a little bit careful. I think he might be becoming a little bit too, too over-reliant on the Ice Clone at the moment. You're seeing it be thrown out a lot. Yeah, but, but I think because Takanada is too scared to do anything about it. Duck Thunder gets the normals. Here we go. Launching up for a big combo. And we're right there in the corner. And we get a nice little Ice Clone combo thanks to it. Over the other side. What? What was that? Oh, what was oh, that sequence? Oh, oh. He totally missed. Oh, a lot of whiffs going on from both of these players at the moment. Pressing the down one, gonna get the forward push. Such a long down rage down one. Gonna get the forward throw, this isn't gonna kill. Close to it though. Yeah, There's only 15 seconds left, but that's not gonna be enough time. Takanato was forced to hold forward, forced to keep being the aggressor and Omi just eating that up. An easy slide here. Yes, and as well pointed out, we may be on a, a bit of a cusp of a reset right now. Yeah, so I think the score doesn't reflect correctly. It's Omi up 2-0. Mm-hmm. Omi is the one currently leading the charge at the moment in uh, lose. Well, technically on loser's side, but and he's playing this very, very well. It looks like 
that loss he took earlier on is really paying off in a huge way because it's really benefiting him in the long run. Yeah, it's like, it, it, again, like I've, I've heard this from long time fighting game veterans that, you know, sometimes you just need that 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 little that reality check getting knocked into losers and beating someone in there to come back feeling better like really quote unquote feeling yourself feeling confident feeling like yes i can do this i have to remind myself why i can do this maybe omi just kind of psyched himself out a little bit too much in the winners finals like wow i can't believe i'm here and just 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 kind of ran out of gas before he got to that finish line yeah, it does happen quite often. You know, nerves is always a factor, and it has been a while since Omi has played in such a big stage like this and put himself in said situation. But even so, after having those few warm-up games on loser's side, he's now ready to take the fight to Takanada. It's just a lot of stray strings at the moment. Omi lands low, looks to get the projectile immunity right now. All big overhead. Gets clipped. This is gonna be. Oh no! Didn't spend the meter for it. That one lock button presses. Gonna go into the projectile. Knocks out Chameleon. Box the overhead. Good stuff there. Watching his toes. Not getting opened up by the lows. The back and forth. The down poking. Not really getting a punish, but instead just a little bit of a scramble situation. Now that's not gonna lead into anything. It's just more of the momentum on his side. Kano and I's forcing to block those. Forcing yourself to be at super negative against Baraka. Here comes the slide out of nowhere. Is this yep. going to be enough? It should just be enough. And Omi currently on the cusp of resetting this bracket right now. Uh-oh. Caught by Raw Glaive. Got to get clipped by the double. Big back 2-2. Two -two. Full combo punish. Forced into the corner. Oh, whiffs the very end of that. Very unfortunate. It's going to be put into the corner himself. That doesn't feel good, especially because like you're amplifying to get like just a little bit more damage and to just waste the bar and get absolutely nothing for it. In fact, get punished for it does not feel good. The momentum is leaving Omi's court. It's going all the way to Takanata. The lows, yep. the lows, the lows. And that's the thing. Omi's getting clipped by a lot of this because he just got thrown like three times back to back to back. And he just he just started neutral ducking. And then Takanada was like, yeah, I know I've conditioned you. Back free launch, back free launch, and it's paying off in a really big way. And as you mentioned, the momentum is definitely shifting right now. Big, big time here. And it all, it all started there because he dropped one combo in the corner. You can't get too crazy. You can't get too crazy. Oh, yeah, I think yeah. Omi is making these little small micro errors and it, they are just paying off in a really big way for Takanada. Just looking for that really big optimal damage right now. Going to get the splat into the ground. Oh, it's going to dash up to him. I think Omi was kind of looking for a throw right there, looking for a micro duck. Could have been. I think Takanada was baiting out the wake up Molina ball. I think he was like looking to see like what costume is on. This is a very real possibility because it is a good wake up. Yes, yeah, a very strong wake up that you don't expect, but I believe this actually might be enough here. Yep, gonna spend the extra bit of bar just to get those last few bits of damage in. Is that a is that a little dis is that a little display of disrespect? Quite a I, I, statement from somebody who almost got 3 0'd. That is true. It could be, <laughs> but you know, considering that it was just like I want to end this round. <laughs> I know the more this goes on, the more painful it becomes for me because Omi is adapting to what I do. He so is, he is, but I but I'm seeing counter adaptation here from Takanada. Also the him swinging right away after he blocks slide i feel like in most situations people kind of wait to recognize what happened what did you block and you have a lot of time to punish a block slide but if that katana fan lift is in play you, that that window becomes a lot smaller and we're seeing takanada tap into that swinging right away before uh you know it even becomes a factor and just getting a regular punish so i i think i think omi needs to chill out with the slides just a little bit no pun intended just needs to just just hang back a little bit just be a little bit more passive and just, and just wait give me give me an overhead give me a, give me a give me a back two a little bit more oh he tried it he tried it he tried it again one more time. No. Oh, headbutt. Oh, gonna cap. Oh, that was a very awkward interaction right there, but full combo punish. Great bait from Omi. He really needs this right now. Kind of shut down Takanada's momentum. Gonna have the plus frames off the Molina roll. 
Oh, grab it. Gonna get the back throw. Are we gonna see another throw? Or are we gonna oh. see a back three? <laughs> oh, he was looking for it. He was looking for it. Oh, he was. He absolutely was. Oh, the katana. And that's so cool when she's like just close enough to you that you kind of get that that hit before the projectile. Mm -hmm. And that really ha helped out Omi there. Very well placed. What an incredible set here. Double glaze. He's, he's looking for overhead. He's not reacting to overhead. He's looking for overhead. And I think Omi has tapped in. He's understood, understanding what's going on right now against Takanata. We're going to see opening up with the lows. No, not even going into a block situation. Instead, swinging for the fences, pressing buttons wherever he can. Yeah, Omi backing off and using the Ice Clone as much. Currently utilizing Chameleon a tad bit more. And I think Takanada ended up picking up on that. Went for the wake up buttons option. Shuts down the thrown out Ice Clone. Beautiful flawless block from Omi. Yeah, you got to minimize that chip damage. And that's really the only thing you can do. And it's just kind of like morally just eating away at Takanada, knowing like even the stuff, even the tiny bit of chip damage I'm trying to get, I can't get. That's going to hurt so bad. He amplified it and he's going right in a fatal blow. Has to do it right now. Only in the cusp of reset point will be in fatal blow territory to maybe do so, but has to guess what's coming after this. Be very careful. Oh, I'm going to crush the armor off that. What just happened there? I didn't see it. It just went under. Kano went to the wrong side. Baraka was swinging to the right. What a scramble. But Takanata taking that thanks to that little bit of bleed damage after that fatal oh. blow. What a block. What a block. What a block. What a block. These overheads are not working on Takanata. Please tap in and go for the lows. Please tap in and go for the throws. Yes, definitely Takanata keeping an eye out for it. Challenging a lot of buttons that he is pressing right now. A lot of patience being shown. Can't quite get a full combo of that, unfortunately. But goes for the low, into the glaive, into the back to two, into the launch. Now going to have the corner to work with. And this is where he has been thriving. But if, <laughs> if Takanata is anyone to go by, he's very confident in his play. Oh, that dive kick was so low, it was safe. That dive kick was so low, it was safe. And here it comes. You thought double low was coming? No, here comes Molina for a big surprise. A little drop there at the end. Don't tell me this is going to cost him the game. Don't tell me this is going to cost him the set. Omi, you need to tap in. You need to just relax. It's okay. Yeah, right now. Oh, went for a very big read. Wasn't pressed due to it. Goes back 3-1. Oh, presses buttons. Not straight hits, but the button pressing the overhead. Forces out the breaker. Omi does have Fatal Blow in play. This is very scary right now. Takanada going to use the Kano, but... Oh, goes right under it with the slide. And we have a reset. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. We have a reset. We have an incredible set. Just in general, these guys are going back and forth. And that was so smart. Omi just kind of waiting and seeing. And Takanada has been doing so much of that, throwing out that Kano ball, ready to go and, and, and forcing you in a situation like at full screen or mostly full screen. You got to block this Kano ball and this projectile and Omi just sniffing it out, armoring right through the Kano ball and getting underneath that high Baraka, I, uh, that, that, that blade spark. I can't believe it. Or I guess it was blade spark and now it's an actual blade in this game. So, yes, what is there, that? <laughs> what there is, is that, a man? lot happening here. I feel like that last interaction where you pointed it out and saw that entire sequence was insane. Oh, yeah. He went for wake up slide with the armor. He went for Baraka instant air spin, crushed the armor because the slide went under the knives. And then at the same time, when he woke up, Chameleon was out just ready to play. Like there is so much happening right now. And so good. <laughs> it's going to be mad as we go so into good. this reset. Takanada against Omi one more time. Yeah. One more time. One more time. They two sets so far, and they've all been great. Even the first set, it was 3-0 in Takanada's favor, but it came down to the wire. But like Omi didn't even have time to really lab anything or really adjust. I guess there was one set in between his loss and his next match, but you know, that, that that could be a possibility. It could be him, like, looking back and saying, you know, how do I deal with that? What are my options when that Kano ball is coming out? And that's been really a huge determinant in this, this second set. But right now, final set. Both players have lost their first tournament life. Double elimination, and here it is. All on the line, and he blocks the Molina ball. Oh, easy punish here for Takanata, and he's making a statement. Sending out the offense just fully fully coming out hold on can he make this happen oh that is very sneaky back to into slide into the big massive jump right now omi does have a little bit of control of the momentum 
Ganado playing a little bit slower, definitely working to his favor, throwing out some stray strings, not wanting to overextend, but gotta be a little bit careful at the moment. Omi, one touch into Fatal Blow, and this will close out the game if he hits it. Anything, it could be the low, it could be... Oi, that is that is come to bite him. He's done that a fair few times. The slide has been a massive way for Omi to just cash out on damage, but he's got to be a little bit careful. You can imagine Takanada now must be scoping a lot of things out. you got to chill out on the slides, man. The slides are really... Like, Takanada has proven time and time again he can deal with the slide katana mind game. Like, and it's even if it's just, hey, I'm going to down two and get that guaranteed damage, he's okay with it. Totally okay with it. Also, something I do want to point out right there. Takanada, knowing full well that Omi has been challenging Kano knives with the actual slide, choose to just throw him out and just jump right over. Just let Omi waste that meter, not have it to break at all. And what a beautiful catch. Just enough to close out this round. And that was a far more decisive game than we've actually seen in the, the losers, well, I said grand finals before the reset. Yeah, I mean, I would say even going back to the winner's finals, like we didn't see quite dominance like that. And I, I think it's, it's like you said, I, I think Takanata kind of knowing the armor tendencies and, and just because you have the option to armor, just because you can armor through something doesn't mean you should always do it. I think meter in this game is so, so precious, mainly because of the fact that Breaker requires all three bars, full bar, full meter, in order for you to stop a combo. So that in itself is huge. And if you armor through something and get, what, 9, 10, 11%, is that really worth it? Is that really worth your resources, especially if it gets baited out and you get nothing? And I, I feel like Takanata is playing to that. Takanata is forcing Omi to come off those resources. Beautiful dive kick here. We're going to get a full combo here thanks to a bar again very very precious resource very very true and you know even just touching on it is why we haven't been oh gets himself out the court that was what sick. that <laughs> that is like a corner only thing on that cross up but, oh talking of the cross ups gets that big overhead right now and get the splat into the ground a lot of fun and weaving from takanada Good block here from Omi. Saw the overhead coming and just stood up for it just in time. Reacting perfectly. Trying to bait out an armor move from Takanada, but Takanada knowing not worth it. That was a clean punish, but he didn't commit. Ooh, most unfortunate, but even so, just going to go for the throw game. And that's something I do want to actually point out that Takanada has been doing ever since the last game. He has con uh, conditioned Omi. Um oh my days, that was so sick. No, he has conditioned Omi quite a fair bit from grabbing him so much and being aware that he would neutral duck and just been hitting him with the back three. Wallace blocked that and negated all that chip that Takanata was solely relying on for this win condition. A little bit of stagger pressure here. It doesn't complete the whole string. Instead, going for a throw. So there's only 12 seconds left on the clock, and it doesn't matter. Takanata spinning in and just messing with the trajectory of his jump and saying and, and, and just saying, like, oh, you think I'm gonna land? Just kidding. Here comes the aggression. Here comes the offense. My man is just rocking team spin in every sense of the word, and it is working. <laughs> Absolutely is working. Well, that was a whiff right in front of him, but he wasn't close enough to really capitalize on it. Now, Sub-Zero's stand two is pretty far reaching. It's a high, it leads into a combo. And speaking of leading into combos, here comes a regular good old fashioned freeze. Yeah, Takanada being aware, just spending the bar, doesn't want to have to deal with it or overextend. Can get um, really good meterless damage even without it, but gotta be careful on these big decisions right now. Yeah, doesn't have the meter spend for the spin keep himself safe but oh back free again forces omi to break it's kano ball to just kind of keep that pressure going keeping the control in takanada's side of the stage just saying you gotta come to me you gotta go through all these these, these obstacles <gasps> Ooh, i thought that was just in time but it wasn't yeah all oh, catches him to standing too goes for the throw very awkward situation at the moment so almost 20 seconds left on the clock right now and this is this is just anyone's game. So much patience is being shown, but oh, Takanada knows on life deficit. Whoa, that could have been fatal blow. Fatal blow. That could have been fatal blow. I was thinking Wait. the exact same thing. There's only eight seconds left on the clock. You need to go in. Omi, you need to go in. You can't let him get away. Yep, goes for the Kano ball. Goes for the wake up slide and a big down two from Takanada. 
2-0 up after this reset, looking to double eliminate who sent him to lose his side. So, so tough, man. Right there at the end, he was... I guess it was just a little too predictable that, yeah, he was going to go for it. But again, what was he going to do? Kano was right on his back. Like, so many instances where he's like, I want to press. I want to press with the threat of Kano ball. Like, I can't. I don't have enough life to really give up here. He had some clutch, flawless block moments here and there. But it's just it's just Takanata squeaking by through there, getting the better of that whole scramble situation. And right now, Omi is in a tough position here. He is forced to have to make three straight game wins in order to win this tournament. And that's I a tall order, man. That's a tall is. order. It is. But I think it's definitely very possible with how he has been playing. The real big thing right now is just that Takanata has just switched up the momentum. It can't be denied. He switched it up. It is in his favor, and he's making all the right reads, all the right decisions, and just out nucleing Takanada and catching on every little thing. He's conditioning Omi in just the right way that that back three man hits like a tank. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And right now, he's, 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 he's sniffing. He's picking up on the fact that Omi is chilling out. These throws are getting so much damage for him. Here comes the Kano jump in. Yep. So the Kano, Kano assist to complement the jump in. Omi, Omi going back to, to, to using that armor almost like, you know, not sparingly. Just like going ham with the armor. Like, I need the momentum. I need to be on offense here. And well, last time, it, it kind of killed him. That is true, but he did have a fair few options. Of course, jump out when he does have the chameleon option on deck. But, man, he's got a lot of work to put in right now. But... Takanada in quite a significant life deficit. But this feels like where Takanada kind of thrives at certain points. Even so, Omi will take this round, breaking that momentum, which could be pivotal in this match. Yeah, Omi feeling himself real, real good here. Even like those little flawless blocks from full screen, not necessary, but you know, just kind of keeping his mind sharp, keeping his mind ready to go once he does close that gap, once he does get right in there. No bait, Goes for no. triple ice clone again. Yeah, he doesn't take the bait. He, lo he just loves spending the meter on that. If that was a dive kick, that would have got into a little combo. Yeah, a lot of space, a lot of slow methodical play at the moment. Takanada playing very passive this and the last game, but oh, there he is, overextends. We get a full combo punish for the back 3 1 to the 2 1 spin at the moment. Ah, oh, yes. See, that's the thing. Omi getting a little bit too careless with his armor. Probably baited out the idea that Kano Knives is going to be on screen. And Omi was like, I'm just going to go for the Meaty 4. Going to crush your armor. And, yep, can't get a full combo off this. Definitely not getting a full combo off that at all. Just, just getting shredded was his armor, right? And that's what's so good about Baraka. So many armor shredding ability so many armor shredding situations kano took the ice ball in that situation and that's definitely favorable for takanada but he does find himself getting thrown this could be the final round if it goes takanada's way omi needs to tap in omi needs to come out swinging yes keep in mind that fatal blow is still currently available on both sides but takanada really just running down the clock slowing down the game plan not choosing to overextend at the moment and omi in the most certainly the favorable position, Takanada needs to force his way in. Something that, you know, Baraka definitely doesn't have a problem with, but when Kano was temporarily out of play, it is a issue. So it's another many, board throw. So many throws here. And just kind of just meeting him here with, with those mid ice pushes. Like you almost forget. There's very few projectile like things that hit his mids, but that is one of them. Oh, try oh, to go for it. Oh. Try to go for it. He put himself in negative and said, I'm going to armor through this. And Takanata said, no, no, no. I'm waiting for it. I'm waiting for that yeah. slide. I'm A few seconds left on the clock. Omi needs to block out of his mind right now. Eight seconds left. We have seen Takanata steal, but it's five seconds. A few more left. Oh, gets the forward throw. Can't quite get it. Yep, just going to block it slowly. And Omi's going to break the momentum. Put a point for himself on the board. Not out of the fight just yet. You labeled it so perfectly there. Omi has to block for his life. Holding out that block button. Saying, I'm going to take these throws because they do take up some time. They don't do too much damage. But he was just, he was just so 
ready, so complacent with just sitting there and holding on the block, and that, that just barely got him the win there. My heart is jumping out of my chest. It was so close, so down to the wire. And I think Omi can make this happen, man. I think he can do it. He needs two more games and he can do this. Truth be told, I think Takanada made a very big decision there that I don't entirely agree with. And that wasn't cashing out on the, fa uh, on the fatal blow when he landed. Because when you do it, it actually stops the clock. Yes. That would have given him a few more seconds at the very least, and at least put him in a position where he's typically been in favor of actually winning those setups after landing the fatal blow. See that? Talking about that, that's the same scenario we typically see from him, but what is happening? Oh, the Kano Ball didn't become active right in front of Sub-Zero, so Omi was ready to, to just continue the combo and, 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 and successfully combo after an air freeze. Yeah, Omi snapping that momentum, swinging it back to his favor, Takanada. Fighting back has to kind of break. I, I guess this is just going to be a very momentum-heavy game between either of them. But, oh, he did it again! Patience. He did it again! He did it again, and Kano knives be damned. Those are not going to come into play here. Just patiently waiting for that second knife to hit. Doesn't have a lot of blocks then on its own. And Omi, I feel like I'm seeing a whole new player, not really relying a lot on the slides and just kind of sitting back and waiting, using a lot of that clone push to just chip away slowly and slowly. And you don't jump in on Sub-Zero. I'm telling you, there's one character you don't jump in on in this game. It is Sub-Zero. That clone is going to eat you alive over and over and over again. I will say that a lot of impatience is definitely being shown from Takanada. I imagine a little bit of frustration in play is being shown from the previous match where he was slowing things down right to the clock. So now he's trying to dial up the momentum, maybe switch how the pace of the game was previously. But, ooh, can't quite get the full mileage off that back one. But, ooh, going to get the 2-1 into the spin. This is what he needs to just shut down Omi. But, got to keep him in the corner, man. It's where you play at your best. Yeah, he's keeping him. He, he's he kind of like pushed him out of there, and now giving Omi all this this access to real estate. What a whiff punish! What a whiff punish by Takanata, forcing that breaker to come out. I don't know if I agree with that. Here comes Kano Ball to save the day. That was a very punishable state for Baraka in that situation, and just because of that Kano Ball, just because of that clutch summon, it is not happening. That ambush, I should say. Oh boy. He isn't quite able to get much off that, but big neutral jump Goes for the two beautiful blocks right there. And Omi, he, he put it all on that. Tucking Nada, tournament point. Did you see that backdash? I thought that was going to be with Punish City, and he just didn't commit to it. He didn't think he was going to press a button, and that was close, man. If throw was a little bit slower, that would have been a clean, easy hit instead of a throw. Omi has the life lead here. Just barely, though. Oh, my gosh. With Punish. With Punish. And then how? How, are you, how can you with Punish sub-zero down one? It is so far. Yes, there's the magic range of Baraka, man. Such a strong character, but man, these neutral jumps are... He's getting so much mileage out of them. 20... Was that 26 damage I see on deck? And the momentum has switched once again. Omi currently in the driver's seat, spending as much meter as possible to close things out. Going for the Ice Clone setup, spends all three bars of meter. Is going to live and die by this. If he does get clips right now, that will be the end of his story. He spent it all, all of it. Like, he's, this guy's a baller. Just going right for it. And I don't care about meter. I don't need it at all. <gasps> he knew it. He knew it. He, such a big brain read. Takanada has been conditioning him, throwing out the Kano, knowing that the armored slide was coming in, had the armor break properties, went for the overhead, cancels into the fatal blow. And Takanada is going to close out this wonderful, wonderful reset match between these two set man what not not only just what a set what multiple sets we're talking about these two players these two warriors really just going down to the wire every single set winners finals grand finals reset and then the final grand final set of the night and this is going to be takanada's tournament takanada taking the win the big w over omi but but what a shout out to omi and it's it's so crazy like you could almost see that like it was changing so much towards the end. Like if you go back and look at that winner's final set, which was 3-0 in Takanata's favor, and then analyze that last set, you got to kind of wonder how much of an advantage it is to win the first set. Like they played three sets. 
And mm. the, the fact that he won that, that, that first set forced Omi to play an entire other set against somebody else while Takanata can kind of just sit on his throne in grand finals, sit on the winner's side and just kind of, just kind of wait it out and say, you know, I can rest. I can come into this a little bit more reserved, but Omi was just ready to play, ready to charge in there. And my heart, honestly, just goes out to Omi. That was such a good showing. But Takanata taking the win here. As we can see, we break down this top eight after a grueling weekend of tournament sets here. Of course, this is Europe East Regional Qualifier. Number three, Omi convincing 3-0 over Magic T. Omi going down 3-0 to Takanata, but not letting it phase him at all as he does come back through the grand finals, gets the reset. But in the end, Takanata solidifying that win with another O oh, three over Omi, but big shout outs to everybody who participated in this weekend's tournament. Big shout outs to everyone who made the top eight. You were all incredibly talented players, and I just love seeing all the talent and all the love for Mortal Kombat across the globe. So, so awesome. What a great treat and what an honor to be able to commentate this top eight. It's just, just so awesome. It has been a very, very <laughs> wonderful experience and massive, massive shout outs to the Eastern European scene. Yes. It's always oh, a pleasure yes. to come by and not just commentate for you guys, but watch you guys as a whole. You know, this uh, this side of the globe, we don't have that many big EU or European tournaments. But whenever there is like one or any time uh, like we have a stage, we always put on a fantastic one. So thank you for everyone that did participate. Thank you to all of you watching at home thank you to mr doff armor for, this is our first time actually speaking in the flesh and commentating together awesome. and of course big thank you for to the production team and everyone in the back who really does make this all possible we super super appreciate it and thank you all at home for tuning in we really love you please stick around as we do have some more mortal kombat goodness later today commentated by the condiment twins which will happen with the european west scene and there are a hell of a lot more games going on so yes i can't wait we'll be right back with all new commentators just like hbt said don't go anywhere this broadcast is coming right back Always in the chat, always rooting for his son, pulling for him to be one of the best in Mortal Kombat. That's, those are, that's what I like to hear, baby. I absolutely love that. That is so wholesome. And Gambler, when they were playing earlier, he was just absolutely on it with that flawless block with one, two, but he just has been struggling with it now. Which unfortunately is not great against Melina because that you have to neutralize that string otherwise he's running away with it goes into the brave brave air sigh and that was kind of one of those cheeky decisions right had the sigh landed it would have been rolled it would have been fatal blow in this first if he has got that <clears throat> unseeable overhead low it may just be sweet and a single overhead, but it is it is a mix-up. And then you have the low hat stuff as well. So 
It's all about just capitalizing and making the most of those individual hits that you do land. How much can you squeeze out of every single encounter? Those Lots hits have been time. hard to come by in this one. Yeah. That's what's made this one a tricky one, is that in that first match, you didn't, those first couple Ooh. matches, you haven't seen a lot of damage. Yeah, those clean hits when your opponent doesn't have a break, it's kind of rare on both sides. Ooh, try to get the armored reversal of Gamma. A little bit slow on the release of Goro there. There's some damage. Oh, could have 40 it's, plus, uh... but, but that instead of doing 40 plus, now you're doing 700, and he's dead. Whoa, that was that was an explosion of a health bar. Completely opposite of what we were just saying in the last one. I mean, it's, it's the best way to win a round like that, you know? don't give Johnny Cage a chance to play because that's kind of exactly what he's trying to do to you. All right, Goro. Another one of those beautiful safe jumps. Standing on the low side. I love that Hourglass isn't afraid to mix up the low side anywhere on the screen, just for the simple fact to keep it a mix up and to keep opponents guessing. You lose a bit of an advantage, it pushes, it hits you back a lot. So I don't know if you can pressure off it, but keeping people on their toes. You just can't let your opponent get comfortable. Like the second they get comfortable blocking something like that, if they get comfortable, they're looking at flawless blocks as well. You know, there are so many layers to that one-two string that if they have to worry about an option before the flawless block even exists, that's a big win for you because now already Gambler getting clipped here. Oh, that's working. Oh, maybe I got a... oh, no, startup. Startup. No time. Activation. Never mind. Hourglass even though it's a parry. Pain. It has to get to the activation of it first. I mean, look, you won't see me complaining about that. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if that parry activated on frame one? I, for one, I'm glad it doesn't. I was trying not to, to, to come across like I was complaining because I was trying to give it a little laugh to it. I was like, yes, I got cooked. Oh, dear. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, if that was active on frame one, that would just be like the, instantly the best parry, like without a shadow of a doubt. But how about that? Currently now, two to one, Hourglass of Rain, winning this next match would reset the bracket and start us all over again. Man. Yeah, we're in a different match now. If Hourglass of Rain can win this tournament, that is going to be one of the most impressive paths of an online MK1 tournament thus far, I think. Whoa. He did that Goro so early that it was completely out, completely out of the way. Our best. Wasn't ready to fully capitalize, though. I just got straight hits. That was a weird trade. A good trade for Gambler, though, because at least he doesn't take the whole thing. Gets out of the situation. Man, Hourglass of Rain is just playing so clean. All of these individual hits are just perfectly placed. Sticking out those down ones from range, though. You gotta watch out for that against Johnny Cage's 4 3. Oh my good god, the micro duck there, Aqua. Insane. Oh, had enough time to do it again. Oh, That's I'm unfortunate. Just going to do it again. Oh, this. What's he close with the corner for the stand four conversion in the fatal, which uh, maybe it didn't want. He's still gonna need one more mix up. Seems list and hourglass. That was a little bold. Gambler had some bar for some last breath. Not in the first round, and he didn't. It was that teleport that cost him winner's finals. Mm hmm. But significantly less risky because that was the first round, so he would have had to flawless block it. Mm. Now, this is oh, a reset right. point. Reset point, folks. Our glass of rain gets this round, and we will start again. Oh, oh, oh looks like we're oh boy. Uh, the beginning of the end of our first set. It looks like, oh my god, we are just doing it. That is the Molina special. Love it. And these micro ducks. Micro ducking against Johnny Cage is so often a death sentence, but our glass of rain has gotten so comfortable doing it. We are now down to a final set. And Gambler probably gonna have to take like, you know, a minute or so to just sort of like gather, collect thoughts, think about it. Cause Big when you're fighting Johnny Cage and you're successfully, constantly micro ducking Johnny Cage, who has a nine frame hit confirmable mid, he is like the worst character to do that against on paper. Like it's almost like foolish to go for it. But when it works that much, you are okay, in I'll King see. Gambler's that head. You're in the zone. Whatever step he's at, you're one step ahead all the time. So you have to de you have to stabilize now. Otherwise, Hourglass of Rain is just going to run away with this. 
Falcons drawing first blood with a Lao Hat that gives him the first bar meter. And one of the few throws that we've seen in this entire set. And I'm shocked that both of them aren't throwing more. I, I, know, I know Microduck exists, but... Hasn't been as prevalent as you would think in a matchup that's all around those quick staggers. A lot of jailing pressure to try to, you know, force people into respect. Not today. Now we're classic. Oh, we're going to flawless right now. Gambler not even going to spend the meter. I think it's just going to accept the fate that has happened so far. Post reset, getting flawless. Hourglass. Not the great I think he touched the start. hourglass. The way he's playing. Uh, okay. Tactical side switch, double roll. I know where he got the name from. I think that he killed Gears and he now controls the hourglass. Oh, Gambler tried to parry. Ate a sweep for his troubles. Getting just rather overwhelmed at the moment, it looks like. Which is sadly not the way you really want to start these sort of post reset series off. Oh, oh the break. You have to break. But no! Goes into the unbreakable air side. So by the time you break, there's even extra damage you don't want to take. And this is. Aqua, this is kind of that. the worst case scenario if you're King Gambler because it, the momentum just, it's all rain. He doesn't have a shred of it. And it's so only growing. Do? He just did that while holding on to all three bars of his meter and it looked like he had, a, he had all the time in the world to sit there and just react because he's just in that much of a zone and a space and he's feeling himself right now. Hourglass of rain. <sighs> Look out. I think he's looking absolutely fantastic. Like, you know, I've always known that our glass of rain is, is so insanely strong, but I don't often get... I think only 17 years old. Truth be told, I don't often get a lot of opportunities to watch him because uh, a lot of the American tournaments that he competes in uh, are always quite late at night, you know. Uh, full disclosure, it's uh, almost 5 a.m. here in the UK, so apologies if I sound quite tired. Uh, I promise I am invested in the matches. Uh, it's just that, uh, you know... A lot of these players I don't get to watch as regularly as maybe some players in other parts of the world. So being able to check him out here is just super, super impressive. Same. We've gotten to here on the NA side of things. We've got to see Hourglass play a lot in things like Champions of the Realms and Coliseum. And I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about Hourglass real quick. 17 years old. And one of my favorite things to see ever in this space right now, especially in online tournaments, is... I. Our glass of rain has a father who was in every Twitch chat rooting for his son in events like this. So shout outs to our glass of rain's father, who's always in the chat, always rooting for his son, pulling for him to be one of the best in Mortal Kombat. That, those are, I, that's what I like to hear, baby. I absolutely love that. That is so wholesome. Man, Gambler, when they were playing earlier, he was just absolutely on it with that flawless block of 1-2, but he just has been struggling with it now. Which unfortunately is not great against Molina, because that you have to neutralize that string, otherwise he's running away with it. Goes in for the brave, brave air side. And that was kind of one of those cheeky decisions, right? Had the side landed, it would have been rolled, it would have been fatal blow or something similar. <laughs> Gambler. <laughs> Just go get the stand one. <laughs> Mate, he's fighting, he's fighting back with the savage. Man. That's what you want. That's one way to stop it. Oh, he needs to restanding. But what a win-win situation. Oh, gosh, that 4 4 Lao Hat has been one of the most effective things that he's done so far in the top eight. Simple, effective, big damaging. Restanding, Gambler. Press as many buttons as he can right now on the offense. Can not, he's blitzkrieging right now <laughs> into Hourglass. Good situation here for King Gambler. Ooh, oh, shadow Kick Goro. Love to see that. Claws block. Ooh, didn't believe though. Didn't want to risk it. I do wonder if 1 2 into low hat. Perhaps that is. Uh, Perhaps that beats 2-1-2 for Johnny Cage. Because Gambler, he's gone for 2-1-2 after the 1-2 um, quite a few times. And most of the time it has worked, but he's never I've never seen an exchange with a low hat. So that might be one of the few things that stuffs it. Otherwise, Gambler surely would just go for it every time. But that's it. You tighten up those flawless blocks, you tighten up that offense. You're not getting clipped by some of those kind of last minute one twos that have been consistently catching Gambler. Careful, Cage. 
lest you get burned. That's what you want to see. Post bracket reset, you do not want your opponent to instantly go 2 0 up because that is just momentum. Most players physically can that, pull that. That's a, that's a hard hole to crawl out of. That's, you know, you're in the coffin and, and the guy's already nailed in like seven of the nine nails needed to secure your fate. So crawl out though. Gambler has tied us up in one piece. Avoided. All the loud mix-ups and straight raw damage. I simply wasn't able to in game one of this one where he just fell for with like every hit of hourglass right there. That whip punish is insane. Raw shadow kick. That's been a difference making. <laughs> but again, like more of those shades. Hourglass of rain is just finding the perfect time to constantly, constantly just stick out that one two and catch gambler either not blocking, pressing button, fatal blow. I like this. This Fatal Blow is really smart because it's going to do sufficient damage to give Gambler a second bar of meter or just shy of it. But most importantly, it's giving us time to get Goro back. And that is the ultimate goal. One more Goro with the health that's left here should be enough to win the round before our glass of rain can be Is there any kind of read there? No, just holding it out. And oh my god. <laughs> Even at the highest possible level of this game, that makes people look silly. And it just does and i love it once that thing starts revving everyone's like oh shit here we go oh man that is that is a that's, that's a hard one it's a hard one to take either way though <laughs> gambler you do have full goro now mate all three bars yeah you got some resources I don't think that Hourglass of Rain has gotten hit by many poke specials at all. Definitely done, a know your enemy situation. He's done such a good job, especially in the corner, of just waiting out both Goros. Gambler has been very loose with him in that corner pressure, giving up, you know, just a single string into the down one rising uh, Goro assist every single time. He's got three bars of meter. Uh, Hourglass probably going to check his unbreakable. Goes to the sweep. The second Ooh. hit there, but Gambler had just spent the bar, and so gone was his breaker and with it his hopes of winning that game. And now it is two wood Hourglass post-reset. This is going to be a tournament point. This could be the tournament of Hourglass's life all of a sudden. What is happening? Yeah, players always have those moments that ascend them to the next level. A lot of the time it does come down to one specific online result um <coughs> excuse me especially here in the I mortal kinda... combat community yeah yeah, so yeah many for sure our like best players of all time right now have come from a, a situation like this okay i'll say it that looks got me bugging has me wondering if we can see our glass of rain it'd be great to see them compete at like a combo breaker or something similar they would become quite the player to keep an eye on, I think, especially in a bracket like that. However, let's not get ahead of ourselves because this tournament is still underway and this is still a grand finals team gambler. He may be down, but as they say, not out. Oh, there's the confirm. Would have been a Goro assist, so good break there from Rain. And Gambler, you know, I'm, I'm going to have to be like, a bit personally biased here. You know, I've got to back my boy. I get seeing it. His grind, just seeing his grind and spending a lot of time with him in Brazil, like this guy just absolutely adores this game and he adores competing in it. You know, he loves going around the world, he loves playing all these events. I know how much your first place would mean to him. What's up, everyone? 
We are Ketchup and Mustard, and you are watching our latest installment here of the pro competition. This is EU West. We did just finish off EU East, so shouts to Darth Armour, History Behind the Warrior, and all the players that made it through, and all the different matchups that we were able to see. Looks like we're going to have a fresh batch of players and a fresh batch of matchups, but from a points perspective, this is, for me, Mustard, a rather interesting week. Why is that? It's crunch time. You know, we, we are in the second half of the pro competition now, officially. Combo breaker, not quite round the corner, but I'll tell you what it is, those regional finals. And this is the third cup for EU West. A lot of the repeat faces are here again. As you'd expect to see, it really is consistently the best of the best who are managing to make it to that crucial top eight position where they're playing for that cash money. And of course, the points to the global leaderboard. And that is what it's all about. This is the MK1 Pro competition. Got to get those points, get on the leaderboard, qualify for your regional finals, or maybe just qualify for final combat in Canada directly by getting points and that is what today is all about you know we're going to see a lot of repeat match um, a lot of repeat matchups a lot of repeat names overall right your video games yo versus Boki. this is like what the third or fourth time we've seen that in pro competition tournaments alone mk javier of course here hot from his success over in brazil of course now returning to the world of online against kana manny and then of course down to losers we have josh tq versus fabs and law corridor versus jackson so You've seen these players before, you know what to expect by now, but we are getting down to the absolute highest level of, of qualification for them points, getting into the regional finals as we loom ever closer to final combat in a few months' time. So, game number one, as you quite rightly pointed out, it's a bit of a runback. A runback of a runback, if you will, because these two, Video Games Joe and Boki, have consistently played in pro competition, both online and offline. The first time we saw them was UFA. That was in a top eight match that Boki was able to win in a very close game scenario. The next time they fought was online, where if memory serves me well, Video Game Show was able to win that in a just as close scenario. So we're Always kind goes of like, the distance. That much is guaranteed. We're currently completing the trilogy. You know what I mean? Like, there's always a chance they'll play again, and I have no doubt we'll see them play face-to-face uh, -face one more time. But for now, who's going to be the next player that's kind of up in games? And from a points perspective, Video Games Yo kind of needs this one. VGY is one of those players that he's actually done pretty damn well for himself in pro competition, but he hasn't, with the exception of a victory he obtained in one of these onlines, I believe it may even have been the first one. Yes, he won the first um, cup. Outside of that, his points have been a bit all over the place. Like, he has two offline top eights, but those placements were a little bit on the lower side compared to, like, you know, first place where you get the lion's share of the points and well, prize money. He, he might not have got, like, the absolute top <clears throat> end placing for the points, but, you know, top eight at East Coast Throwdown, top eight at UFA. Like, these are definitely impressive achievements to get as a competitive MK1 player currently. So even if he hasn't got as many points as you know he would have wanted right now, he's going in with a lot of confidence. Um, but, of course, Boki, one of the most... I, if we're talking confidence, I feel like Boki has more confidence in his play and decision making than a lot of players out there right now. And I would definitely, de definitely say that as an absolute fact. Uh, always running that Kung Lao. You know what you're going to see. The Lao, Goro getting extremely aggressive, looking for those gaps, looking for those armored launching situations. But Video Games Yo, he is remembering from the past sets they have played against each other. The Liu Kang Kung Lao. Liu Kang, such a good choice against that main Lao uh, for that six frame standing. One really kind of keeps that armor a bit more honest as you need Goro to cover it to keep it safe. And is also kind of just good at keeping Boki in check in the neutral. But as we start, we are seconds into the round and already looking towards the right corner, but not for long as Video Game Gear manages to fight out. A decent job of just creating that distance. And there are two different things that Lou's going to do in this matchup, and it just comes down to dealing with armor in two different ways. The first is that Kung Lao's armor is minus seven. Liu Kang, Liu Kang has a six frame stand in one. Outside of that, forward four can also armor break if you get a good read, but you definitely can't armor break it all the time. You know, if you're meeting him on wake up or something, that is where you can get the armor break. If he's counter poking you with it, maybe not so much. Well, it's but... also Boki is going to be aware that that six framer is an option, right? So you would think he is going to have to adjust at how he approaches it in general, but man, just to get some good aggression to probably seal out this round, to be honest. There's no Goro to extend. This is like, oh, wait, no, actually spending the extra He's going to have time for 
Goro, but not quite. If he had the Goro, oh. I think that probably would have been just enough. But even then, I mean, first round, no last breath. VG would have had, would have had to perfectly flawless block on anticipation. I wonder if that's why so. Boki went for the extra um, the extra meter spend there, just to kind of give that extra time for Goro to come back. Hey, man, an extra half second, you would have had Goro. It's just very long cooldown time. Only just actually got both Goros back. Speaking of, though, one thing that Boki lacks is meter. That being said, he has just built one, so the threat of armor exists again. VGY looking for that dash in one, two. Obviously, he can't confirm that second hit. Tries to bait out a safe little jump. Shout out to the MK3 Lao skin, by the way. I like <laughs> that a lot. I like it. Yeah, it's sick. No, so there, though, you, you do see that up block attempted from Boki, but no punish on it from VGY. But he did do the empty jump, so he was willing to be patient, but wasn't immediate there to punish the up blocks. I think VGY looking to play very reserved here, not in a rush to finish off a round. And that's, I think that's something that Liu Kang can do, especially with that Lao cameo behind him. The problem is, though, if Boki smells blood, he's going to pounce on it. As no Lao player out there does that Kung Lao just like the mid into overhead low, that back three, quite like Boki does. Like, he is just so willing to go for it, especially when he knows it's like, he's going to hit one, just go for it again, and again, and again. Got to point out the one time uh, VGY actually tried to armor it into yeah. up to there. Ooh, he was kind of looking for the bait. He was looking for the bait, just in case. Plus frames, the meaty back three, and Boki has just been on fire this whole match. And I mean, this is kind of best case scenario for Kung Lao. You're never really in a position that you have to deal with his I'm weaknesses. telling you, man, <laughs> that back three, but no one does it like Boki does, I'm telling you. He loves it. He likes it a lot. But I mean, why wouldn't he? In this kind of situation, like, yes, the opponent can armor, but even then you can armor break like we saw Boki do in the corner. But what is the weakness of Kung Lao when he's got no meter and he's got no Goro? The way Boki was kind of structuring that offense, he always had at least one of the two and was always in the driver's seat. So, I mean, if you're able to assert yourself in the match for the entire match, those weaknesses just don't really appear, nor do the instances that Liu Kang can exploit his strengths in the matchup. Well, it's important for Lau, right? I know resource management is a thing for everyone, but without Bar, he's not doing as much damage. Without Goro, obviously he's not armoring either. Without Goro, he's not launching off of the armor and giving himself like extra damage off of like overhead lows that otherwise do nothing, right? So when you have Upwards those long dive cooldown, kicks in to raise the roof as well for me. Yeah, exactly. Concerned. Like obviously resource resource management is a thing for everyone, but particularly for this Lao team, you know, you definitely have to be careful. But you know, Bogey's been playing it since day one. He's going to be aware of that, and he is now up one game. So working out so far you can see how comfortable vgy is throwing projectiles at that kind of max jump distance the moment armored range exists totally neutralizes that whole neutral like the way vgy wants to approach even at that range he can't throw a projectile the threat of an armor will catch him oh, and he knows um, you're looking for it maybe worried about a low poke or something drops the combo can't capitalize and there has to give up his turn that low hat not as plus as it once was in fact minus and that will be the first round here for boki Looking real bokey, if you know what I'm saying. I mean, this whole game has just been constantly... The way he's just structuring this offense, you never really know when the armor's going to come. You know he's going to do it, but he always does it just weird enough that you're never comfortable. For that moment you hesitate, he'll then do it. <laughs> or he won't, and then suddenly back oh, yeah. three, right? But that's what I was saying at the start of this set. You know, Boki <clears> is so <throat> confident in his play and has been... This, this is the way Boki has always played. You know, ever since we first started seeing him in the pro scene for MKX and beyond, you know, he, he has known... Back in the day. Exactly. Like, he, he is confident in what he's doing and he's a very successful player. So, you know, it's, it's definitely confidence with a good base in it. But VGY, this is a doable comeback. You know, we are looking at Lau. You know, he's there ready to go, spending the last meter there, having access to fatal blow could be huge this is like potentially a two touch scenario but it's gonna have to be two big touches Ooh, that throw escape it's always a feels bad moment when like you have that one opportunity to steal some momentum and they tech your throw it's like no 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 i'm still here interruption mm -hmm. that loud invincibility just to too. so not losing the health however when you get this low on life every single attempt of that mid overhead mid low right let's talk about that for a second because i, I know we see this this Lao kind of strategy a lot from Boki, right? That mid, that back three, then goes into the overhead, goes into the low. When you've got Goro ready, the low can combo into Goro. Normally, it's just a simple overhead low, right? Both of them are, um, you know, they're, they're not they're not great on block, but you know, he's not going to be taking any damage for it. 
uh, and on hit, they just normally knock down. But with Goro, you can turn the low into a full combo option. You would think normally, well, simple, eat the overhead and just never get hit by the low, because that's the one that does all the damage. Huh? However, yeah, this is quite the change. However, against someone like Boki, he is very, very willing to let you eat all the overheads. He will absolutely kill you with 10 of them right and is willing to do so but this character change from bgy is this the first time we've seen him play baraka in tournament i've never seen him play baraka at all let alone the fact that obviously we're still seeing the baraka and striker you know, some people definitely believe that this pairing is a bit dead clearly works you just have less of the striker i mean shout outs to takanada who we did see do wonderful things just now with the baraka kano i saw tekken master yesterday actually using baraka kano as well so a little bit of a cameo evolution here but this baraka I don't know. I mean, you're going to get some decent ranged options. You might, in theory, have a somewhat similar meta to Liu Kang. I mean, you know, they have range on their buttons. They've got fast buttons. They can both armor break. Maybe uh, Baraka just that standing forward does it a little bit easier than Liu Kang's forward four, right? Perhaps there's that. I mean, he definitely has the armor break potential. Um, obviously, this is going to be post-nerf striker, right? We are playing on the most recent patch. So those, those grenades do have a longer cooldown than before. But the cooldown is the only thing that changed. Oh, no! So we are going to be able to still see the same Baraka, just maybe in a slightly different way, but not going to matter as Boki. I mean, he is on a roll in this set already. 3-0 match point up, perhaps? Yeah, we could be seeing a three sweep here. And this is not the result that VGY is going to want. The waiter asked Boki, how many overheads do you want off your back three? His one word reply, yes. And he said oh. that he reply about 20 times already as VGY is having real difficulty dealing with it. But again, that resource management, full Goro, full meter. Boki is just, he's always got what he needs when he needs it. This and is rough, already the corner. Yeah, this is looking bad. This is looking bad for bad your boy for VGY. VGY. It's great for Boki. All right, the down one. Finally, some breathing space. The back three, we go straight into the EX down forward two. The breaker to deny momentum. However, we're looking at almost a fully stocked Goro. It doesn't even matter that we have no meter at this point because that's still offense. That's still block pressure. If we land a clean hit, that's still going to be enough to do, not enough to win the game, but a terrible situation. Ooh. Goro absorbed it. This time, just going for the back three by itself. Again, being hesitant is VGY. Not wanting to spend this final use of the striker, but slowly but surely that lead gets better for Boki. Just got to make Ooh. a choice now. Doesn't mean you're running out of time. Good block on the low. That would have been the end of the game. Good block again. Armor break on the back three. Surely you spend fatal blow now. Surely we spend it. Now, the question is, does this kill? If it was any other character, I'd be yes for sure. But Baraka's bit of the fatal blow does a bit less. To make up for the health. fact he applies that damage over time. I don't know. I, I think he lives. But he is definitely in chip territory. With striker oh. grenades as well. Can Watch he the get the chip? Oh, oh, he's coming! Oh, oh. He's coming! Oh, don't know about that. <laughs> that was definitely a bold move from Boki. But the patience from VGY, not to not, not to let anything go. Just waiting for it to connect. I almost wonder, if he, could he have called Goro on that, do you reckon? Maybe, actually. If, if Goro was available, I mean, it is an ambush, so you might have been able to be cheeky with it. Either way, the 2-1 hit confirmed. Whatever it was, it's given VGY just a little bit of momentum here. But again, you still have to be careful. The safe jump from the striker nade. Lovely, lovely throw tech, though, from Boki, who, again, two bars a meter, two Goro with 630 health left. That's not good for VGY. You don't want to get hit by anything here because it's not just the damage. It's the situation afterwards. Oh, no. No, oh, the mix up. Again, VGY having such a hard time against this relentless barrage of mids into mix ups. Get off me, says Baraka. Had enough of this. You have to watch out, though. Again, the threat is always there. The 2 1 2 as well. Getting caught. Striker messed up the combo, though. Getting hit by that down forward two was not part of the plan. Another good block on this overhead low. Three of them in a row he's blocked right now. However, you can only block right on a 50 50 for so long. The grenades. Uh oh. Oh, no. Waits for it. That flawless block. Oh, and there it is. And how fitting that the last hit of that set ended up being once again that Kung Lao mid, that back three. And that is exactly what I was talking about at the start of the set. That is the Boki style. And that's what he's been doing, you know, from day one in this game, MKX and beyond. My man has played a lot of Kung Lao and knows what he's doing. And that's going to be a huge win for Boki here, as we've talked about points, right? And players who have done well and managed to get points from various <coughs> events here and there. You know, VGY, Javier, Kanamani. Boki had a top eight at UFA as well. And if Boki can end up winning today, 
that's a huge amount of points to get quite late into the season. And that is going to be quite the result. And you know Boki's going to be happy with that. I always love seeing Boki do well. And uh, today we are seeing quite the start as Boki takes out 3-0 over video games. Yeah, we were saying before about how whenever they play against each other, it tends to be pretty down to the wire, right? A lot of game fives, a lot of final rounds, quite a few character changes from VGY over time, right? We've seen him run Shao, we've seen him run Liu Kang, various cameos here and there. And today, obviously trying to make it work with the Baraka as well, but not going to happen as Boki, sticking to his guns, knows what he's doing and takes the first dominant 3-0 of the stream. And we've got the replays coming up right now. I think we know what we're going to be seeing here. I mean, look at this, the first replay, immediate corner, back three, staggers the back three, trying not to die to the gap that can be interrupted, you know, because Liu Kang, he's got those options. And Boki, just comfortable, knows what he's doing, and here we are. The thing is, Boki actually had to work pretty hard to get into this top eight. He had a selection of um, sort of three, two matches. So I think his first one that I remember seeing was against Nuji, uh, who was very, very close to taking him out on winners. He then had to fight Fabs. Again, a three, two victory that he had to clutch out that final win. Like he fought people getting into this top eight that made him really sweat. So, you know, it's not like he kind of just made his way into top eight rather effortlessly and then just continues to clean house. He's been fighting tooth and nail. Um, and very much looking like he's continuing to do that with a 3-0 versus VGY, who is now knocked into the loser's bracket. And we'll be seeing him a little bit later on. Up next, however, another rematch of two people that have fought each other online a fair amount. MK Javier and Kanamani. Now, in this side of the world, there are a lot of people that often say that they think that Kanamani currently is the best player in Western Europe. Uh, it, it's just his success. Um, the fact that, you know, he's not messing around, right? He knows what top tier characters he wants to play that fit his style. His style often being extreme rushdown. And that's just what he likes to, you know, that's how he likes to play. That's what he thrives with. So can't say I'm surprised to see him originally play that Johnny Cage that he still uses. Uh, there is a Raiden Kano as well. Very aggressive, very in your face, very chip damage heavy. And then Javier on the other side. You kind of mentioned this earlier on, you know, fresh off a second place finish at the third offline major, the one that was in Brazil, defeating Nicholas, one of the Chilean twins, didn't manage to defeat Scorpion Prox, who ultimately went on to win the entire thing, but played incredibly well to get that second place result. Now, oh, old MK3 Scorpion, of all three of, of all the ninjas that have these skins, like for me, it's the scorpion one i think i like the most there's just something so right about it well especially standing next to chameleon which really isn't a surprise uh, especially now we're, again we are playing on the most up-to-date patch where striker did get that kind of grenade um cooldown nerf it just, it just takes longer to bring those grenades back now however chameleon was already looking like maybe a stronger option for scorpion in certain matchups and one of them that javier was using even in brazil was against johnny cage now kanaman you said before right really likes those really aggressive aggressive in your face characters who just get up close and stay there uh johnny cage lao very much is still that kind of team now of course scorpion chameleon just gives scorpion extra things that he's usually kind of missing right we've seen a lot of scorpion from javier he typically plays a very hit and run slowed down style and chameleon just helps that in a, a number of ways right just for, for extensions to damage more confirms that good projectile and neutral just all the usual chameleon stuff, of course, Scorpion is going to benefit. But we didn't see much of it there as Kanamani with quite the start. Already taken that first round. I mean, this is kind of what we expect to see. These are two players who have a significant amount of leaderboard points. I'd say Javier is probably sitting the safest on the leaderboard right now due to his offline successes. But, you know, the better they can place, the less work they do for themselves or the less work they have left to do in the long run. Oh, wow. Well, the one big thing about this matchup is I actually spoke to Javier rather extensively you know when i was in brazil he really does not like the johnny cage matchup for scorpion it's actually the kind of matchup that he doesn't even use striker for anyway these days like this was a matchup that would say right i'm picking chameleon for this um just because of the extra range and the fact that you're not really building your whole thing around death spin or armor or whatever into strike grenades where johnny cage can just shadow kick through the whole thing like the different kind of oh style my goodness chameleon yeah i mean i've seen this so much my god i've into him enough times in combat league this chameleon is just oh ridiculous my God, a man yeah. knows how to hit hard let me tell you my with punish. amazing every single drop of damage there is to be squeezed out of this team 
Acknowledging. Oh, another one. Oh, missed the jump kick this time. That would have been rather horrible damage. And by horrible, I mean horrible to take. It would have been a lot of damage. Melina, ready. But we're probably not going to have a chance. In the neutral, though, changing oh over to... It. Yeah, That's it. Changing over to Chameleon uh, with the Jade, sorry. Like, that was actually best case scenario. Like, when you're at that range, for the most part, especially against Cage, like, Melina's not going to give Scorpion what he wants. You want that Glaive. So, uh, it actually looked a little bit like perhaps he even... Um, manually swapped to the different disguise i don't think it was up for i'm not gonna lie i find enough. it really hard to keep up <laughs> with like that th that's how you know these players play at that highest level because when especially when you've got someone who's got a lot of time into the chameleon cameo this is a cameo that rotates between three significantly different styles after a matter of seconds yes you can manually change between you know by, by doing various things with the attacks but it's hard enough to keep up when you're watching it let alone playing it or defending against it of course we're seeing this change to raiden which is i would say the more a uh, common Kanamani character these days. Uh, so definitely, you know, not a huge surprise of a change here. But I just love to see what Javier is getting out of this chameleon, right? So much neutral control, that, that projectile, the full combo off the tracking low hellfire. It's just, it really just... These things that Scorpion normally lacks significantly, suddenly he doesn't now. And we're seeing Javier, who is a true Scorpion specialist, really thrive with it. As we, okay, we've got the armor up. Can take a bit more risks now with that reduced damage. Or actually, if, if anything else, just looking to swap forms, perhaps. Oh, now, can this you is... No, actually, yeah. It's Kano! This is starting to be reached! This is a matchup that Javier has played time and time again. Not just because of the you know the amount of times he's clearly fought against Kanamani, but even in Brazil, a uh, massive, massive result for him was defeating one of the Chilean twins. It was Nicolas uh, to secure grand finals, you know, to prevent a, a twins grand final. It was this exact same matchup that Javier was able to conquer. However, Kanamani, even Sonic Fox has said that they believe that Kanamani, when they last fought, was, you know, possibly the best raid in Kano that exists in the game right now. I mean, Huge. that's the level of pedigree. There's the breaker. Punish. What? Javier hesitated on the punish and ate a down two. That statistically should not happen. But Javier was not fast enough. But Kanamani was. He was absolutely <laughs> ready. Oh, huge low here in the corner. Meteorless pick up to Kanamani with the awareness. That is not a bad amount of damage to get with no bar in the corner, I tell you what. I mean, we're about to get another Kano. There was the flawless block. Acknowledges, though, that Kano was far too close. Even if Javier wanted to get a down one there, it just was unlikely. Kano's right in your face. He's going to hit you. Oh, now you are going to be very careful going for too many of those Hellfires against someone like Raiden, though, right? I'm, I'm imagining that's a full screen punish with the electric fly, but the reward for it so huge if it does work out again too slow on the punish even if he got the punish though the kano knives were going to cover that yeah. i think that that's the only situation you'll see someone hesitate especially a, a player of the caliber of javier is if they know that well i can punish the teleport but have you called a uh, kano or, or have you not right it's, it's so difficult those little decisions in the meantime nice armor option huge again those wake up neutral jumps are just paying off huge for Javier in this set already. Look at the damage he's going to get for this. It's two different benefits. You know, we're going to get big damage from this situation. We're also going to make sure that we have a fully recharged Chameleon. The next disguise should by all means be Jade, if I'm not mistaken. And now with the Jade. Oh, went in for the different one. If that was Kano Knives, I reckon the 2-1 would have caught. But because it was Kano Ball, there was no safety to be had. That was actually really smart. You know, two different reasons. The first, Kano was unlikely to get hit by the standing two punish because it's a different startup time. The second is that uh, if there wasn't a 2-1 coming, I mean, it's a mid rather than a high. I mean, it's just there was classic no adaptation 101. Round one, he did something and lost for it. And then the final round, he changed it up and then won. That's what you got to do. Now, I can't imagine we'll be seeing any swaps from Javier. I mean, I obviously, so. Scorpion... I would be surprised if we saw him play anything that isn't Scorpion in tournament period, but like, it, especially if we're talking cameos right now, Javier seems to really hyper, hyper focus on whatever cameo he thinks is Scorpion's best and pre pretty much play that whenever possible, which right now I'm, I'm fairly sure is going to be Chameleon for Scorpion. Oh, there it is again, the knives, but too far back this time. Yeah, at that range, it looks like you're not going to be safe regardless. Chameleon. I will say Javier playing a lot more aggressive in this match. I feel like he definitely has reputation as much more of like a slower player right now, you know, willing to play. Oh, that's still punished! That yeah, that was huge. 
I cannot believe that's still punished. Normally, your direct answer is to uppercut that, but I guess from the, you know, you must just have to time it correctly. Something that I'm sure Kanamani has dealt with a million times over, right? I mean, you fight Raiden Kano, you see teleport, you tend to uppercut punish it. It's just what you do. But if you can time it so you punish them for doing it, that changes the whole matchup. No, absolutely. No, have you? Oh, okay. This time, guess the right time in the standing one. But again, paying respect to that Kano knife that is definitely going to be following when it's ready. There's the safety again. Okay, that's actually not terrible for Javier to hit by that. Normally, you, you can see Raiden players, when when the Kano ball comes out and they take the hit, you can teleport to chase it down, but if the Raiden player doesn't do it, it does get you out of that pressure game. Oh, huge hit, but the break is ready for Javier. Oh, he gets the pickup. Oh my goodness. That was a really impressive pickup. I feel like that was just a matter of frames from dropping. That must have been right as the end of the move was coming out there, but able to get himself that first round here, must have. Again, I mean, they take a trade. It's not the end of the world. A bit more damage. Oh my wow. goodness, that was definitely a commitment from Javier, right? That didn't well, like, confirm to me. Did he just know it was going to hit? Did he see Kanamani whiff something? You, you can knew? sometimes just, you know, have a feeling like from that distance, like because he moves so far forward, there is an instance where you kind of expect them to maybe try and whiff, punish, even like right there. Like if they try and stick out a button, that is the only range that 2-1 will actually hit them. So there are some minute situations that you can just dedicate. It's still a bit of a risk, but, you know. This is a great position for Javier. 100%. Yeah, he's just defensive. Very defensive. But now, oh, tries to down two. That that down two actually would have just won the game if it hit, but Kanamani covering it with a knife, even a jump forward. Uh -oh. Back three. Meet E. Kano ball. Lovely grab as well. A smart throw out of the corner because it is, you know, less likely we're going to see a throw tech from that direction. <gasps> Big micro duck. You can break though. Waits for the fatal blow. Let's it be on cooldown. Yeah, and now Javier we definitely break. waited for the fatal blow just to make sure that it's gone for the next 10. And still gets the down two. I love that from Javier. You know, Javier, like that. I, I don't want to say mistimed down two because. It was timed right to anti-air the jump, but it lost to the knives that came forward. In that instance, he saw the knives had already missed, so now the down two works out. So well played from Javier to stick to his guns there. But like I was saying earlier on in that match, I feel like this is a much more aggressive match that Javier is playing. I know he definitely um, has earned a reputation gameplay-wise as being a very slow player, right? He's, he's willing to slow the game down, that hit and run style with you know emphasis on the run because that's how he has to play a lot of matchups with this character right scorpion he can't commit to the mid without taking a huge risk a lot of the time his standing two goes really fast spear such a good projectile and with punishing tool his back movement so good there are a million reasons why scorpion can play that way and needs to in a lot of matchups but this set is completely different he's slowing it down when he's got a huge life lead to sit on but when he's looking to obtain that life lead he's taking some, some ah. big risks a lot of jumps a lot of use of that katana lift and we've seen it pay off. That is the adaptation that you talked about in the previous game, though, is that Kanamani can look to see that Kano Ball is hit and will then just simply do a teleport to keep Oki. And, you know, you're not always going to have to do that, but when your opponent isn't afraid to take the Kano Ball, that's kind of where you have to add that to the list of stuff that you do. Grab combo. Free damage because it is fan lift. Fast cooldown. Damn, he'd really already hit good damage. near enough 200 before the spear even connected. That's actually crazy good for a throw combo. That, that'd be the round, though. Kanamani, nice and aggressive. I mean, nothing in particular that's really sort of taken anyone by surprise from Kanamani. It's just that everything is brutally efficient. He plays the character just shy of perfectly. Even down to these confirms. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Like, that was perfect, pretty good. That perfect was pretty good. demonstration. All right, there's the respect. Waits for it to come back. Fan, I mean, Phantos probably wasn't exactly what Javier wanted. Might have tried to squeeze out one more glaive. That's one of those situations where it's like, it doesn't really matter if, if the, the stance changes. And again, huge neutral jump. And it's always a neutral jump kick too. Like, uh -huh. He knows that's his best option at, at countering those standing buttons after it. And like 360 for it. That damage is not bad at all. Yeah, the thing is, Scorpion's jump kick, low key, oh. that move is cheap. It's I, I think it's like top three jump kicks. It might even be the best <gasps> next to Johnny Cage. Who has probably the best one, in my opinion, but wow. Okay, match point Javier. Been playing this matchup phenomenally well. There it I is. mean, we'll take that trade all day. Big jump. Whiff that on it! Massive whiff that Javier is able to capitalize off. Right. I mean, Javier, so many of these jumps are right on the money. Not even just down to the timing, but like the direction. He's always just getting the right decision. 
and looking really good here. Gets that break from Kanamani. There's so much bar left to go. This is a, a, a commanding position for Javier to be in right now. Kano just got oh. sniped. Uh, very little damage, though. Going for the corner carry. Optimal situation when damage isn't a factor. Oh, we gets that breaker out of Javier. Now we're down to more of an even playing field. <sighs> that was a risky forward 3-2 as well. There was no Chameleon to make it safe, so Kanamani just erring on the side of caution for that one. Still no bar for Kanamani, though, so he's, he's kind of having a hard time building that. Oh, but I guess Kano. That will open up enough. Is that enough damage, however? The second it knife, is that... Oh, my goodness! The optimal from Kanamani. No bar, doesn't matter. Kano's there. Just enough damage. That was clean. Just really, really, really efficient. And of course, we're going into a final game between these two, but Javier, still life in that Scorpion. You know, you talk about playstyles before. What I find interesting about Javier, I've watched him in three games. Um, you know, I've watched him in MKX when he was really sort of just dipping his toes into the whole world of competitive. Uh, MK11, where many of us saw him for the first time, and of course this, which has been his most successful currently. I wouldn't say Javier has much of a playstyle. His playstyle is, play is, is Scorpion. It's built it's around what Scorpion, Scorpion does the best. If Scorpion's rush down God, that's his playstyle in that game. If it's a game like this, where he has to be a lot more neutral focused, that is a, uh, a very, very different story. You know, we got a term for that in fighting games as a character specialist. There's uh -huh. not as many around these days, but when you see someone of this caliber, it is a treat. However, Kanamani, much stronger start this time. Let it go. Uh-oh. Rush down, rush down, rush down. Uh-oh. We're just mixing it up. Back two, forward four. Chip damage with the, uh, the Kano just to keep us. I mean, look, you've seen this before. Kanamani's just not going to stop. Wake up, ball roll. Get the hell off me. Had enough of it. Invincibility too, so Javier's low life. Like, if you armor in that situation, you have to be careful because you still take the damage. But if it's one of those invincible cameo wake-ups, and rare enough invincible cameo wake-up that launches, not many of those left in the game. Oh, there oh, it is. Oh, and who cares oh, about that so Kano? Smart. That was so smart. Doing just the standing one into Fatal Blow, knowing that he could absorb the Kano and do the damage. However, a decent, decent spot after. Brave, though, because he has not much health left. There is almost two Kanos. If it were anyone really else, afford the block. It. Oh, Kano! It's Kano again! He landed on the knives, like one for each base of his foot. Oosh. Unfortunate to lose the Fatal Blow, Oh, though. no. Definitely going to make the rest of this game a bit harder. Must have Kanamani timing the knife into teleport where if you uppercut, that's actually all part of the plan. I have never seen a Raiden do this before. Gen I've seen so much Raiden. I've never seen anyone time it so that if you uppercut, he's Ooh. got Kano just in time to get a combo regardless. That drop. was so good. Ooh. Oh, that was so good as well. All have four characters so on the screen at once. Oh, no. That could be a problem. Yeah, no resources, but still has to break this Javier. Thing is, I'm not sure about that break because there was it was only an electric fly and you're in the corner anyway. Actually, that's not good. Mustard. Mustard, it's, it's not good. No, no, didn't have Kano. Has to flick. No, couldn't get the flawless block. I was about to say, had to get the flawless block. Couldn't do it. And Kanamani with the pop-off at finish him. Going down game five at least, but is it just me or is that quite a short game five? That was an aggressive set. It was all Kanamani. That, that's, that's what it was. It was pure just... I'm point blank. I'm doing all the stuff that you know I can do well. But honestly, like for me, the biggest takeaway from that match uh, was Kanamani's anti-punish tech. Like it's ingrained in so many of us as players of this game now that when you see Raiden teleport or do electric fly or anything like that, you know the Kano knives are coming. Either Kano knife or Kano ball. Most of the time it's knives. You just know, I have to uppercut this. I have to take my biggest single hit damage outside of a few situational instances, like, you know, armor or the fatal blow that we saw Javier do in round one at the final game. Like, you uppercut. That, that, that's just part of it. Kanamani has looked at that situation after the countless, probably thousands of Raiden Kano games, where no doubt that uppercut has been a constant thing to deal with. And he's gone, can I still somehow turn this into advantage for me? And lo and behold, time your Kano into teleport just at the right time, if they uppercut you, the knives are still plus enough to combo. And that, like, 
totally changes the game because That's now cheap. you can't punish him anymore. He, he can just teleport his way in and you can't do anything without getting comboed besides like a low poke. Kanamani will take that all day. That was definitely an optimal set, however. You know, we're seeing so many of those decisions, right? Like waiting for breakers at the right time. Um, like you said, right? Timing the assist. I mean, look at that. <laughs> Still ready to combo from it too, especially after such a crucial play as well from Javier, right? It was, it was such a big decision to go for that fatal blow. And I, I, I kind of lost count of the amount of times we've seen Javier go for like what could be like a risky resource spend, whether it's a break or a fatal blow. And we'll think to ourselves like, oh, is that a right idea? And then he'll just pull off the huge comeback, right? So Javier is, is so confident when he does make those decisions, but not every time is it going to work out as Kanamani moves forward to a winner's finals, which we'll be seeing later of Boki and Kanamani. However, for now, it is time to go down to our losers round one territory as we'll be seeing another couple of returning faces in Josh, TQ and Fabs. Two players, again, they've been around. They both play a lot of online. I would expect they would have played quite a few times by now. Um, what do you reckon we're going to see here, however? Because Josh... I mean, I really feel like most of the time Josh has kind of settled down with the Liu Kang as, as like the real main, whereas Fabs is Kenshi all day, for sure. I mean, Fabs is just a pure Kenshi loyalist. Um, the only thing that might change, it might be, you know, maybe a different cameo for a matchup. I've seen Fabs use kind of like uh, similar to like a Hayate. Uh, when you watch certain Kenshi players, they play like tons of different cameos that... You know, the Sento stuff is universal when the hit is landed, but it's kind of how you activate, you know, what you what you start with that inevitably leads to the Sento stance situation. So Josh TQ, plenty of different characters to play. So Cage is one of them. We I've seen him play Cage. I've seen him play uh, Smoke and mainly Liu Kang, but Johnny Cage definitely fits him as well. Johnny so Cage and Chameleon this too. time. Yeah, Johnny Chameleon is a team that we haven't seen as much, but definitely solid. However, speaking of cameos, you don't see as much. Kenshi, one of the characters in the game that keeps that Cyrax dream alive. Oh, try to go in for a grab, but we didn't actually have the ghost available to sort of punish you for trying to do something about it. And we've got to say the Cyrax cameo. Yeah, there are probably some of you watching right now. Oh, that was cheap. Yeah, oh, nice. that was cheap. There are probably some of you watching right now thinking, you know, right, Cyrax with Kenji, why is that? The big thing about Cyrax that made a lot of people stop using this cameo was that the helicopter spin, the one that's horizontal, now costs both bars. It's very expensive. What a cameo does for Kenji is it gives me the center activation. And even here, meterless pickups from his overhead on yeah, its huge. own, that's huge for He the gets character. a lot of use out of the vertical one when he's in Sento stance, even if Sento isn't out. So, you know, if he finds himself there, he's not completely out of options. You know, overhead into Cyrax spin for combos, grab combos. And of course, you know, if he just wants to get into Sento stance, he can do it on block with the chopper because, you know, it doesn't matter that it costs the whole bar. Hey, huge decision. That actually might kill. That might kill, because that's it's a 950 tough. health, and this is Kenji's Fatal Blow. Kenji's Fatal Blow might, does know. hurt a lot. So, oh, are we close or just enough? I, I'm not going to lie, I think, it's, I think it's over. No, I think you'll survive. I think you'll survive, but it's going to be tricky, because they're mash. They're All both right, mashing. Fair enough. fair enough. I wonder if it Medium. came down to the little test your mic. Oh, no! The forward two was too slow, and because Chameleon Cameo, the Glaive was the fast-ranged option that we so desperately needed. You have to be so careful though, right? Because Kenshi... I, I feel like most of the time we see Kenshi players, it's like whenever they encounter a matchup that seems to be difficult, it's a character that really plays that kind of runaway Ooh, full screen nice. game against them. Johnny is the exact opposite, but you cannot overcommit. Huge combo actually there from the Katana fan lift. Nice extension. Not a tremendous amount of damage, but still cool. All right, from this range, you have to inevitably watch out. Punishment. Josh is not letting Fabs get away with any of these whiff buttons. Looking for more of those staggers. Johnny Cage did receive a few changes. You know, a couple of small changes in the recent patch. His 1-1 one, one is now plus one instead of three. And uh, his down there one is. is now seven frames instead of six frames. So very small changes, but they have mat they've mattered in a way that certain matchups are a little bit different, you know, because of the 1-1 one, one on its own. However, Fabs, the sandwich, has to make this comeback. Now, Josh TQ is going to break here. So this makes things even worse. Oh. The problem is, though, is like making the Kenshi comeback without access to Fatal Blow is easier said than done. Because normally that's where the huge reward of damage comes oh. from. However, there's going to be no last breath in this round. Chip damage can be enough, and it's not going to be necessary as Fabs manages to find the hit and ties things up one round apiece. I do love to see it, though. 
I like the way that Josh is playing this matchup, however, though, because now Johnny has lost the plus three from one one, and now it's just plus one. That forward one, that plus on block individual advancing normal that leads into confirmable launcher, huge. Like, that is such an important button, like, more now than ever before for Johnny Case. So if you're using it as your main whip punish tool as well, um, you will find yourself being ready for these whip punishes, and that is one thing that Josh is getting away with so much. It's just huge whip punishment. Expecting the flawless block, opting to go for block pressure Ooh. instead of mix-up, and then uses those plus frames. We still have a little bit of the Sento ready. Oh, that clean. Uh, resummon. Resummon, Mustard. That actually would have right. been such a nice confirm as well. If nice to finish it off, but actually has enough to kill? Sure. Yeah. Yes, there it is. Clean play. Ah. Ooh, the Brutal as well. Nice. You already know. You already know. It's tournament top eight. That's the best time to do brutalities. Always has been, always will be. I swear but... they're like the only finishing moves we see in tournament is brutalities. I prefer cool brutality combos to fatalities, personally. Like, what? fatalities are cool, but in, like, tournament, when you're doing these, like, really cool combos and stuff, it's just the extra little sprinkle, the seasoning right at the end. I'd say my, my favorite time to see fatality, which is usually the only time I remember seeing them, is grand finals. End of grand finals, we usually see fatality. Ah, so we're going to go for a cameo swap. It's going to be Kung Lao. This team actually in the latest patch, this team in particular took a pretty like substantial hit, right? Kung Lao's low hat. Uh, when you charge it now, there is a longer cooldown than there used longer, to be. Longer, but still fast. So it's not the end of the world. But I think it says a lot that, you know, this cameo and main character together, they keep getting adjusted. You know, they do keep getting nerfs in patches. And it's still a very, very, very good team. So, you know, I think it kind of says a lot for how strong the team was originally. Anyway, for now, perhaps like the way, good again. the way he is able to construct a game where he has the Sento out really as much as possible. Like his his just know-how for when to resummon, when to activate again. The Cyrax cameo to obviously help that a substantial way. Just, I love it. Because it just means you spend so much of the game where Kenshi is at his strongest. And, you know, funnily enough, you're dealing with his weaknesses the least. Against someone like Cage, you know, not having Sento out and you're stuck in the sword stance. Versus Cage, that's a little bit miserable. So Fabs is doing a great job just mitigating that. Josh TQ. Okay. Oh, really nice confirm on that low from Fabs. Oh, huge combo here too. Gets the sandwich. What are you going to do with it? We're seeing Fabs get a lot of overheads in this pressure, like in this set so far. Of course, though, it is just true mix-ups, but you know he'll be recognizing that. Oh, good luck. My goodness, that Wonderful low hat. Stuff. Yeah, into the overhead string. We still have meter. Defense. Wait a minute, Josh GQ actually, 420 health. Oh, that was a greedy resummon. Wait, he's yeah. gonna come back. No, he's back. He's back. Oh, no, oh, punished. That was fatal blow. Oh, Johnny Cage, you got what you wanted. Was it worth it? Absolutely for uh, <laughs> for Kenji. Can you I believe just... that? Johnny Cage goes in and just does his little, go on, punch me in the face. And then like the spirit just comes up from behind and says, I'll have a go. Can you blame him? Did you see what he did to the spirit just moments before? He did. He punched him in the nuts. He's like a ghost and he can still feel that. For sure. I can't blame him. Do that. Vengeance. Get revenge. Pure Pure vengeance. Johnny Damn. Cage. So actually, here's the choice. Does Josh TQ stick cage. with the cage or do we change? Because there are well, it's... various characters and it's loser's bracket, right? So no other opportunities to think, right, shoulda, woulda, coulda. Like, it's either now or never with the character choice. Well, the good news is, you know, well, good news, depending if you're a glass, like half full or empty kind of guy. The good news is that Fabs is not going to be going off Kenji. So, you know, you have to, whatever character you go with has to make the full, the full comeback. Because this is loser's bracket. There's no more second chances here. But Josh, you know, we see a lot of that, a lot of the Johnny Cage. We've also seen a lot of the Liu Kang, but he's going to be sticking out with the Johnny Cage now. Must be confident in the pick. However, there's a pickup. Bit of a weird one, though, to actually capitalize from. Uh-oh, the sandwich has been established. One thing Fabs has been so good for in this whole set, ooh, even though that wake up standing one, yeah, Josh unfortunately, they just squeeze it through. One thing that Fabs has been really good at is like any sort of like dropped combo or dropped opportunity, immediately stabilizing it and turning it into like continued pressure or setup. We've seen that like at least three or four times so far from Fabs. 
has to watch out for this overhead. Oh. And there's Cyrax again. Oh, I love that. Using the the hit time on the juggle not to continue and get damage. Get the resummon. Get Sento back out. I really love this usage of Cyrax from Fabs, but never mind. Is there enough? Can you kill on this? Just enough. As Josh finds the extension, spends the bar. Staying alive in this set. No three zeros yet. Star power's been locked and loaded. Massive oh, damage. Wait, yeah, that too. Getting that against Kenshi, easier said than done. Uh-huh. Lao still does provide some rather insanely cool combos. High damage. Good situations. All right, where do we go? Looking for the mix-ups. Just, yeah. Safe way, you know, just stick out a down one. Just neutralize that spirit. But every time he's back, you have to be so careful. He's going to be back now. Oh, it just disappeared. Never mind. Fabs. Oh, try oh. with punish, but no, Fabs did not overcommit. Recognized he was out of range. Oh, oh this time, though, I, I love that adjustment from Josh. Was trying to whiff punish with forward one, just out of range. Now go for the launching kick instead. Instant I change. I think that was meant to be a uh, summon. No, he didn't have the meter. What am I talking about? Can still make stuff happen here. Overhead is again. Yep, so it. many I overheads. Say. I mean, they're unseeable, aren't they? Still a risk. Cyrax is there. The overhead gets a lot scarier. <gasps> oh, that would have been fatal blow, but Fabs was too late on the whiff punish. Uh oh, that's I think that's it. it. I think yeah. that's it. Unless we see a drop, which we probably won't because it's Josh DQ. Cleans it up and manages to get a game on the board. I do love the way that Fabs <clears throat> is uh, really just putting this offense together, though. Because obviously, you know, when, when you see a Kenshi in Sento mode without Sento out, you might think, well, it's, you know, he's got no he's got no armored reversal. Obviously, just overhead and low is just individual. But it, it's almost that kind of like Goro Lao effect we were saying earlier with Boki, where it's like, as soon as Cyrax is there, the overhead becomes a combo. So suddenly it's like, well, yeah, low usually is the more dangerous option. So you kind of just take the overhead, whatever, who cares? Can't do that if Cyrax is there and ready to be used, right? It's, it's, it's so much more dangerous. But this uh, choice to stick with Johnny going to work out well for Josh so far. Mm. And also just the Johnny Lau, right? This, this is, I, I feel like this is like the main comfort zone for most Johnny players at the moment. It's just such a fundamentally strong team. Some players still just generally don't enjoy it. I, I was speaking to King Gambler a lot when I was in Brazil, and, and you know we were sort of on the subject of the Goro that he plays on top of Cage, and it's like he actually said himself. He was like, one of the reasons I, I played, you know, Johnny Goro, and that is, I just I just can't work with Kung Lao. That he just said there's something about this team that I'm just not very good at figuring it out, and it just doesn't. It kind of works against how I want to play, and you know, rather than sticking with something just because it's meta he just opts to go with something different so it kind of goes to show that just because something is like meta it can still work differently from player, player to player player comfort plays a huge role in, in what you play and, and how well you can use it 100 percent. but right now as you can see a huge block on that shadow kick but not in a position to get massive damage from Ooh, it i love that but... i actually love that punish though because it actually deals with the cooldown that uh, the Sento stance had. That special move means regardless of whether Sento got hit or not, it's ready. Ooh, oh, huge grab. parry. No drop. Must have the drop. Unfortunate, but not the end of the world as uh, Fabs is now back to the wall. No cameo ready to go. Not a great position to be in. Johnny Cage corner game. One of the scarier in the game, but an instant catch. Oh, hello. Again, I'm pretty sure that uppercut was meant to be a resummon. That, that's two different instances. I almost wonder if Fabs expected them to go into a different direction after the chopper. Possibly. Oh, good block that last possible minute. Problem is, though, Sarak's getting hit there. He's going to be out for the count for pretty much the remainder of the round, I think. Ten seconds on the clock, but Josh GQ. Patience. Oh, this is going to be hard to win. I don't even know if Fabs can do it. Oh. Yeah, the grab ain't going to do anything. It's going to scale. Oh, the breaker. Oh, uh, you know what? I actually think... And this is going to be like super hindsight. I don't think Josh needed to break. I think the only thing, because that was like a, a, a combo there, I think the only thing that could have done enough to get the life lead was probably Fatal Blow. And you can break that as well on reaction. But you know what? Don't take... If there's even a remote chance that you calculate it wrong and you lose the life lead and you could have broke, do it. You know, Especially when your opponent's 2-1 up on you too. You don't want yeah, exactly. your match point. That would be a terrible way to end up losing uh, what otherwise would have been some pretty killer momentum. Fabs. 
Making it work, but overcommitted there. The combo was over, but got a little bit greedy with the button. And that's going to be a big punish now. Kung Lao, locked and loaded. Hard oh, to fly. Nice worked, yeah. Gross. Half block. We saw Oof. Fabs get it before, but not this time. Huge catch. That's it. That is Good it. Day. Oh, hang on. Wait, that was a bit low down. Yeah, it does connect. I was worried that would drop. What a catch from Josh TQ. Not only getting the confirm, but hitting Cyrex in the meantime, just to add some extra damage to get more. And that is, I feel like we were down 2-0 just a few minutes ago. And now suddenly game five. Just taking that little bit of time, you know, that little bit of time. It's so underrated when you look at the character select and it's not just like, right, game's over, pick the same characters, pick the same cameo, right back in there. Even like 30 seconds can just refresh. Yeah, well, I think it helps in online tournaments to because there's so down. much like loading screens in between, right? It's kind of like, yeah. even if you are the kind of player to just like, you know, quick hit start, mash rematch, get into the game as fast as possible. There's kind of, there's a lot of like forced downtime. So you kind of get that moment to breathe, even if you don't normally go for it. All right, final game. Now, Fabs was actually kind of hovering on some of the different there was, a, there was a little bit of a movement over to Sub-Zero in the last game. And you know, I'm a commentator. It's my job to overthink and overanalyze. But perhaps he sneezed and hit the D-pad with his thumb. Perhaps. It could have been many different things. Maybe a spider was on the desk. I was like, ah, spider! And moved and the D-pad. controller to do it? I don't know about that. I mean, like, you're like, ah! And, you know, you, you lift your hands up and then you press the Oh, I understand. Oh, but look, he did it! He went and swapped his cameo, the mad lad. Benches to be fair, friend. this is like the main Kenshi team we see though, right? Like, I think like this is one of those instances that I see a lot of Kenshi players talk about how on paper Cyrax is kind of his quote-unquote best. But Sub-Zero is just the old reliable, you know? Good damage, good confirms. Um, especially, and, and as well, the sub-ice armor has continued to be a great answer against the uh, low hat. So uh, in this instance, absolutely understand it. Especially when you've got one game left to do just to seal the deal. It opens up some of these different buttons as well. Um, just being able to buffle them into like, you know, Sub-Zero Freeze and stuff like that. Can't quite do the same thing with Cyrax. So it does open up in the neutral, you know, the back two a little bit more, the forward two a little bit more. Forward two with Cyrax only really is, is like that usable when you have um, fully loaded cameo. Otherwise, you know, the, the chopper doesn't really do much else oh. otherwise. We always have to remember, Josh has been blocking a lot more of those overheads in the, the later part of this set, so... Indeed. Perhaps that did uh, play a part in the switch, as it's looking good so far. Oh, there's the overhead, and... No! Okay, the that's break! Oh, this is confidence, because, no, he's just about to lose Sento. No, but he's Sento's just running away. He's, take, he's taking the trade to resummon. He's going to have half of it back by the time this combo is over. Can Sento get here in uh, time? Hang on, hang on. No, this, this could be a real comeback. He could Sento reach just... him. Oh, no! He just reached! I was just about to say I don't think he's in range, but just enough. He just comes in with the diving assist like, no, Kenji, I'm coming to save you. And he was right. As and that's going to be match point. Cal, can Fab stop this reverse 3-0? Oh. Josh is in the middle of doing, obviously, quite the break, but he's already built back almost two bars. Uh-huh. Overhead. The threat of that becomes real thanks to the low hat. A little bit more sandwich. Oh, he knows. The smart stuff. Keep the corner. Now, are we going to have an opportunity here to just get a cheeky resummon? Any hit will do it. Yep. That's All right. Catch. Resummon time. Yep. Ends the combo in it just to be sure. Uh oh. Yeah. Has to break again. But the problem is, if he goes in, there's Sento is going to be behind him. <gasps> no. He caught it. Can he get a combo? No, he dropped it. That could have been huge. Won't matter, though. I was saying before, Fabs, he's been so good at making the most of those situations. Drop a combo, doesn't matter. Immediately turn it into continued offense or pressure. And that is exactly what we see to close out the set. And the reverse 3-0 is denied. Really well played there from Fabs. Really well played. And look, I mean, look. Changing away to the other cameo made the world of difference here. It just lets you play a little bit differently. And against Johnny Cage, I guess those extra buttons that he got use out of um, was just beneficial in every way. And that's kind of one of the reasons when you see top level Kenji players, you know, Fabs playing this character at the highest level you can possibly get. Like the different cameos, you can be a Kenji loyalist. You know, let's not really ignore the fact, yeah, he's a top five character for a lot of people, if everyone, you know, agrees that he's really, really good. But he plays with so many different cameos that can allow him to open up the Sento stuff in different ways. And it entirely depends on who you're fighting. You know, it looks really good at the very beginning with the Cyrax. You know, he made the uh, 
the sword stance overhead a little bit better. It gave you more threat from that. But you kind of lose out in the sort of footsies department just a little bit. Because without the horizontal chopper, uh, which requires full cameo, you're a little bit more limited. You're not quite as safe. Whereas the second you go in with a Sub-Zero and go, right, I need to use forward two more. I need to use back two more. I need to just have more range to play around with and still turn it into like huge reward. Sub opens up that on top of the ice armor, which was great at neutralizing a uh, full screen. Honestly, I, I feel like the ice armor was um, one of the more important things considering that was a game five situation. Always is. Josh was locked into the Lao cameo at that point. So yeah. Fabs was able to specifically look at what do I need for that team? And uh, yeah, it was two rounds in a row. That was well played overall. Josh getting clipped there uh, just by the meaty Sento hit. Just did not want to sit there for an extended sequence, but didn't have the opportunity. As that is going to be a win for Fabs, who moves on three to two to fight MK Javier in the next round of losers. But before we get to that, we have one more match to go in this losers round one of this Europe West regional qualifier number three in the MK Pro competition. We are getting very close now to the regional finals territory in April. Combo breaker soon to follow. But before we get there, Law Corridor versus Jackson. The return of Law Corridor as well to these top eights as he's become quite the uh, regular name. You know, had a decent showing at UFA. Of course, uh, has done well in these online cups as well. I believe playing mainly Raiden Chameleon at the moment. Uh, so I'm expecting to see that at least uh, at some point. Yeah. So there is still a Raiden Kano. I've seen Law Corridor play it, but Law Corridor really seems to like the Raiden Chameleon. I mean, she gives him pure mix-up. So many mix-ups. You know, Melina is by far the scariest of the uh, uh, the disguises. And... Could it have anything to do with his triple safe low? Yeah, because it, it's it's the triple low. It's the fact that even after the low, it's not even a mix-up of forward four, three, four. It's like you can do overhead. You can do like EX down back three for another low of a different time. And Jackson, uh, a player that we haven't really seen as much of here. You know, this this is the first time I've really seen him compete. But had a really good path in this tournament, yes, though. Yes, indeed they did. And it's uh, Kung Lao with the goal. They had some big wins to qualify for this top eight. You know, some real competitive games against some of the more kind of regular faces we see. Oh, an instant up block there. No way in for you. Oh, went in for the wake up and Goro just able to completely take that out. All right. Interesting range here. Letting the whole thing go. The safety of that. The counter poke, I mean, we're just happy to spend meter at the moment because after Melina, it's Chameleon. Right, mix-up time. Makes the read, but Goro still gets it. We pick wow, it up. That still picked up. Was that down one? Yeah. My goodness, that was nice. We'll say the Law Corridor being extremely aggressive to start off this round, which you know, definitely fits his style of play, but I think it's important to kind of establish that when you are fighting against, you know, the usual kind of like Lao Goro team. Is they no way. Team? Oh, my goodness. Surely he doesn't kill off this, right? He wouldn't have the option to. It won't Surely kill. That doesn't it's not do gonna enough. kill. It will scale. It will scale. But we're gonna what have Chameleon this up ready, with, right? Because he's gonna be in um, Jade mode when this is finished. So how do you close Wait, this out? Is Jackson mashing? Wait, is that doing Jackson? Enough? Jackson, why aren't you mashing? Was he not pressing? What? <gasps> no. If Jackson was mashing, it would have appeared on the top of the screen. That is. I, I mean, that definitely did a lot more damage than I was expecting to see. So I almost wonder if um, if Jackson just thought that was going to kill regardless and wasn't trying to fight back and I like, test your might. I don't understand, but that was really good damage for a throw combo with punish on the dive kick. Unfortunate, but here we go. Massive damage to return the favor. Splat for the knockdown. Mix up time. Good block on the low. Oh, good staggers. Couldn't get a huge amount of damage, but this is quite the lead. However, Melina. Uh oh. Greedy. Oh, no, that actually didn't punish. Surprising. And just must have been too late. No, getting caught. Lord Corridor did not have time to see it connect, though, and turn it into something. We will here, though. Oh, Lord Corridor. I'm sure he was so convinced we were going to be having, like, just enough time for that glaive. Change to Katana right near the end of it. And that's an, a weird element of Chameleon, right? Is that if she changes and gives you the wrong move, you're already mentally ready to do a certain combo that now isn't possible. I mean, Chameleon, she's definitely like one of the stronger cameos in the game, but she is a high maintenance cameo to play. There's so Whoa. much to keep track of at any given time. That read, by the way, standing one into Shocker and her armor broke. 
Oh. Try to up block. Nothing off it though. Grab combo. That's so sick, man. <laughs> that's so sick. And that's it. The hesitation. One bar and Goro was all Kung Lao needs. Ooh. Oh, no mix up needed. Forward absolute. four just hits on its own. That was like the absolute tip of that forward four though as well. It's normally kind of difficult for Raiden to pick up from that range, right? Especially, I, I don't think he can shock her from like a max range forward four. Did you oh, press? He the pressed! Counter poke fatal blow. That is a call out. I know you're going to press right here. I'm going to fatal blow and do all that damage. Jackson with a hard read and it's going to pay off. I'm going to be honest, like, you know, fatal blows, they do have armor. <gasps> He's alive. Oh, oh never mind. Goro raised the roof all the way to the top. My goodness, that actually did enough too. I'm actually quite ridiculous. surprised he survived the fatal blow. Yeah, me too. I was thoroughly expecting that to be, but we did see shield mash. In fact, actually, did Jackson mash for fatal blow at all in that game? I saw two different fatal blows in that game. So and not a single icon appear We should probably take a quick bar. second to explain this. So it's, yeah, it's yeah. not one of the more obvious mechanics of the game, but in this game, um, much like MK11, there's a little mini game where if you're in Fatal Blow, uh, hitting any of the attack buttons as the attacks of the Fatal Blow connect in the animation, you can make the hits do a bit more or less damage. Now, in this game, it's pretty significant how much damage it will add or reduce. So if both players are pressing their attack buttons as the Fatal Blow you know, animation is connecting, you can add or reduce that damage significantly. If one player does it and the other one doesn't, you will notice a massive amount of damage compared to normal hits. It doesn't look like, and that's maybe it's a spectator thing in King of the Hill, I don't know. Maybe. It looks like maybe Jackson isn't doing that at all, and Law Corridor is like reducing a lot of damage, you know, uh, or adding adding such, but we'll definitely have to keep an eye on it through the rest of this set, because that's a pretty important thing if that's not happening. Either way, Law Corridor going in for the wake up. Makes it way safer thanks to fan lift. Melina time, but we are getting zoned out. Trying to press down ones and buttons at weird times. Jackson not afraid to just constantly let it rip. Good block on the overhead though. Kept Law Corridor in this match. 2-1-2. Two, two. The passive's activated, so Raiden's going to take less chip. Oh, the read! Wait! You're dead. Is that enough? No, Ooh, no. Mel it was no Melina. Melina. Melina mode. Couldn't do it. Oh, oh no. Oh. So if we still had Katana there, that uh, baited up block throw would have been enough to kill. So many, there's so much respect always being shown. Whenever you get down to that kind of like safe but minus territory, you, just, you cannot afford to press at a bad time, especially against the Lao Goro team. Oh, and there it is. Exactly yeah. why. But at you the same time, you can't just never press. <laughs> that, yeah, exactly. You can't never press. It's, that's, that's why it's such a, a dangerous dynamic to fight against. Oh, we're huge punished. cash. Actually, by the end of this combo, we're going to have Melina. So unless there's armor, we're going to mix up. Oh, that would have been nice. Brave throw. Two bars of meter and a Goro locked in. One, two, one, wake up. A good block on the low there to keep Lord Corridor alive. Overhead, Ooh. bad news though. Uh, finishing the job. We are going to build another Goro in due time. Not quite enough. Or perhaps just didn't want to spend it just in case. Oh, down one. Oh. This is a really stressful end, but Lord Corridor must have had way more patience for that one and was able to be benefited from it. 1-1, one, one. Lord Corridor. Easier said than done um, when it comes to, you know, being that patient against, yeah. like, w when you've got that little life left, right? When you've got, like, a couple of percent in it. And chip damage can be pretty significant in this game. So uh, definitely respectable patience there from Lord Corridor. Looking good. Continuing on in this set, we did say before we were, we were hoping to see this kind of Raiden Chameleon. I know this definitely has been the main team that Law Corridor has been going to uh, as of as of recent, but it's nice to see it work out, especially when you can see the synergy in action. It's one thing to theorize it, but then you see it in gameplay. So yeah, this is working out. Not a, a completely impossible situation though for Jackson. Yeah, we have seen um, potential comebacks all day, in fact. But definitely a, uh, a, a, a lot to ask. In the face of some like or corridor but still one game of peace and jackson just hasn't been afraid to just you know sit at that full screen if we need to and if we have goro we can sort of aid the zoning just a little bit with that 
It is costly, of course, because the up punch has such long cooldown on it, but... Ooh! No! Law Corridor did not commit to that one. Should have been a full combo with his name on it. Either way, though, that's a 2 on 2 hit confirm. Forces the breaker. Interesting situation now, though, because no meter but two Goro. Oh, Jackson's flawless blocks have been really on point. Oh, there's a counter hit into Goro, too. I love the awareness to get that Goro, because that's like respectable damage for no meter spent. Get out of here, Chameleon. There's no reason to overextend if you're Jackson here. Quite a good amount of life to have. Never mind. The roll comes through. Now this, well, yeah, won't won't give the life lead, but the positioning advantage guaranteed. That oh, one though. Yeah, challenge with the down one. Take the advantage. Oh, just meeting this time. Oh, that was so good from Law Corridor, baiting out the up block and immediately punishing for the round. The fact that Raiden gets a substantial up block, like, oh, sorry, throw combo makes his bait of the up block really dangerous. It'll be quite hard to get it 100%, though, because, I mean, obviously, you know, if you... The up block bait comes from a fan lift, and then you need the fan lift to bait out the up block and then use the second lift. So you kind of need to do it the moment Katana becomes available, which is unlikely, but... Wow, Ooh, oh, still was... there? That would have been such a good trade combo, but could not quite find it. Get off me. Oh, Ooh, micro oh micro the micro Instant, yep. Huge damage. Never mind the drop. Oh, crucial drop from Jackson. And oh, that's a counter corridor. Hit. Yeah, he's, he's going to be closing up this life lead. He's getting out of the corner for free. I love that bait. Lord Corridor. I see him do that a lot. Uh-oh. I think that's going to work. Uh, uh. Right, please mash. Please mash. I, I don't think he's mashing. I don't I, think he's doing it. I think that would have done enough regardless. Yeah, but, but try. Oh, no. Yeah, I definitely yeah, I definitely don't think Jackson is doing it because um, that I was definitely expecting that to get the kill for sure. But that got the kill like and some change. Hmm. Now, I don't want to just sit here and say like 100%. Jackson is not partaking in well, that it, it's, game. A, it's a very but bizarre I've thing never to seen not it. do, right? So which is I've why just... I would assume maybe there's something else. Because <laughs> it's a weird thing to not do. I've never not seen the icons appear, though. So, you know, I, I, it's, it, it's various different predictions, I guess, as to why that's the case. But it's also being reflected in the extra or reduced damage. So that yeah. kind of adds to that. Um, but it, it's making all the difference, though, Mustard. It is making a significant difference. Well, the I'm important thing is, um, you know, if, if, if we're talk, talking hypotheticals, Law Corridor definitely knows it. Yeah. Law Corridor is uh, making the most of it, for sure. Oh, and, okay, again. This time doesn't overcommit. I respect that. Punish. All right, by the end of this combo, we're going to have Jade ready. Ah, we want Katana as fast as possible. Law Corridor wanted nothing to do with the Jade disguise. To be fair, I mean, grab combos. A little bit more pressure, more stress, and... The options now, mix up. Low or overhead, mate, you gotta guess. I'm backing off, yep. Keeping that neutral. Going in safely with the glaive. Oh, there's the low. Okay, Jackson, an opportunity. Yep, chose not to overcommit. Didn't want to drop and get punished on hit again. We have Molina ready. Jackson cannot allow Raiden to get within forward four range. Well, he does have a breaker, but you do not want to use it here. Like, at all. Like, that is a lifeline you don't want to be without. Katana. Are we going to super jump and introduce the bait? <gasps> wow, no need. No need, Mustard, because now match point law corridor. The electric fly just hits on its own. And now one round away. Now Jackson definitely had some real moments of strength in the, the early portions of this set, but the longer it goes on, the more law corridor really seems to have found his groove. And that, right, right there, we see Jackson with the adaptation. I think that's the first time we see him not attempt the up block. Really trying to make sure he doesn't continue making the same mistakes. Uh -oh. He's very much not out of this. Obviously, it's not looking great, but it could be worse. This is a winnable situation. He's got Goro. He's got plenty of meter. Still Lord though. Corridor's not playing perfect either. I mean, we've seen a couple of combo drops here. That's a full combo, though. Fan lift. Has, has to, to break. Really, yeah, has to that break that one for sure. Difficult Ooh. otherwise. Can't mix up. She's oh, not ready. That's it. That's it. Counter poke, EX, Storm Cell. 
There we go. Law Corridor gets enough. And the patented Law Corridor finish. I mean, both Raidens have done that today. Maybe it's just a Raiden thing. You can't make me... Raiden in MK1, he's like a nice man. You know he's what I mean? He's the chosen one. He's the chosen one. He's, he's a lovely, lovely man. And you're making him do these things. You think Raiden in the story would do that? You know what I mean? He's too nice. He never would. Why are you giving him a bad image? I mean, I guess it. Well, it's, it's, it's the old, the old classic, right? Like players or characters, they have like the nicest characters have. They're like the biggest dirtbags when it comes to gameplay. I think this is just a continuation of that. Horrible people, aren't they? Uh, the characters, not the players. Yeah. <laughs> yeah Before sure. that sounds hilariously judgmental. I mean, the, I mean the characters. So you're saying that MK1 Raiden is like he's he's putting on a front. He's like he's making. Don't, it up. I don't believe him. I don't believe him. Not with that gameplay. He 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 like his storm cell very much. His best friend Kano in the story, you know, his best friend Kano. <laughs> they're just, yeah, I, they're I must like, have missed that part. They're like two peas in a pod. <laughs> yeah, my, my copy of the game might have there been was a, There was a cutscene where he let Kano wear the hat one time, and it was you know a great comedy routine. Yeah, fantastic. Anyway, great from Law Corridor though as he's going to be advancing through. Another player who, again, you know, very competitive, definitely um, holds himself to a high standard, right? I, I remember when we were we were at UFA and Law Corridor, I know he didn't get the result he wanted. He, he didn't place poorly by he any means. He wanted top eight. That was his yeah, goal. Yeah, he, he, he wanted the big result. So I think he's the kind of player that, like, if he doesn't get it, he's going to beat himself up over it. Um, but, you know, always playing, always putting time in, and we're seeing the, the consistent... Rise of success from event to event, as he his next opponent is going to be video games. Yo, that is a match I very much look. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing. But that does it for round one of games. As uh, winners finals, Boki versus Kanamani. That's going to be a good one. Um, I guess I could say that about any of these games because they're all going to be great. Javier versus Fabs, and of course, video games. Yo versus Law Corridor. But I have to absolutely stress the importance again. This is the third and final regional qualifier before we go into the regional finals for EU West. If you are the kind of competitive player who is willing to travel around, you're in a position, maybe you can go to Combo Breaker and try and get some more points at you know one of the offline stops where the points you get are, are greater in number. This is an important day. You know, this is very important, right? And I can think of at least three players in this top eight that I can realistically see making the trip to Combo Breaker, right? Video Games Yo, Javier, Kanamani. I'd be very surprised if they didn't make it, but maybe Boki will be able to. Maybe Law Corridor, right? Like, there's so much potential. And of course, last but not least, Fabs. You know, I didn't leave you out. Um, there's just so much potential for this tournament to change everything for the future of the pro competition, right? because uh, it's, it's going to be difficult as we get to the end of the season. So this, the points you get today will make all the difference. But we are moving on to Javier versus Fabs, as it's going to be Scorpion versus Kenshi once again. Uh, i got to say, I love how... Wait, is he actually going with a striker? Oh, okay, we are. I was under the impression that Javier was all chameleon now. I know that Javier just was, you know, not a huge fan of, of playing Striker since the change because Scorpion's one of those characters that really only uses Grenade. It's not like one of the other Striker pairings where you might get benefit out of other stuff. Like, it's all about the Grenade. Yeah, it's, it's not Scorpion plus Striker cameo. It's Scorpion plus Low Grenade. grenade. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the thing is, <laughs> against Kenshi in particular, it's... <laughs> Again, to rewind back to when I was talking with Javier uh, in Brazil, he said, of all the characters that are like, you know, the top tier characters, he actively likes fighting Kenji. And I think Striker. I actually think it's that. because we're seeing right here. Kenshi as a character, very powerful, does not have a great time at fighting characters that want to play the long range game against them. You know, when, when he is in non Sento stance, his long range options are kind of limited to the overhead, uh, you know, just the, the overhead spirit. I'm fairly sure Scorpion can up block that and punish it from just about anywhere on screen. So from that range, it kind of eliminates that yeah, option that's why for he was doing Kenshi. It. Yeah, and Kenshi's got great backwards movement. So does Scorpion. So if Scorpion has a life lead, I feel he can sit on it easier against Kenshi compared to most. And if you go in too close against Kenshi and he gets a hit into Sento, you're now dealing with Kenshi's optimal range where he's doing the Sento crazy damage and the mix ups and the chip damage. And we know Javier likes playing the slower style. And this is absolutely a matchup. I can see him doing this every single round. Get a life lead. Keep that life lead at all costs. 
And he'll take those hits, you know. All He does not give a damn about those, like, falling spirit moves. Because, yeah, if you punish my spear from full screen, you get a bit of damage. If my spear hits you... Oh, yep. hang on a minute. Oh, I'm nice. sort of pick up there. And oh, yeah. Huge! Oh. Oh. Down three to underneath the Sento mid. I wonder if that was just mistimed from Fabs, or if that's a thing of low profiling it, perhaps. Free side switch, jailing EX teleport. Just waiting out that timer. He knew Sento was going down. Ooh. We just somehow jumped over. But also a matchup where like the, the much, I mean, let's be honest, much longer cooldown of low grenade compared to before because the matchup can be played slower. And this is definitely going to be it, by the way. Game one is, is finished. Because of how slow this matchup can be played, um, with how Javier plays it, you can definitely buy those seconds back um, of the, the longer cooldown time on those grenades, you know, compared to a lot of other matchups. So, you know, in hindsight, actually not quite surprised to see him go back to the striker here and happy to see it, in fact. I think the matchup is going to be, like, ever so slightly better for Kenji, thanks to the changes, because, you know, the stuff that's going to make the matchup harder to deal with is used less frequently you're not going to deal with as many back threes you're not going to deal with as many um like spears and stuff well, like especially that. if we're talking kenji cyrax cover. yeah because yeah, because yeah, yeah. kenji cyrax is a you know cyrax is a close range cameo you know he can do net but there's no reason kenji would throw it um and um obviously it's just it's one of those things that if you can hit a net you can use it to activate a sento it's just you know, if you're picking Cyrax, it's not just to hit nets in the neutral. It's just very unlikely to happen, and you're, you're going to want to keep that bar for you know for other purposes. Um, but if you're not using that, he is like nothing he's got is long range. Like he is he is point blank, and that is exactly where Javier wants to avoid being all the time. Dash in, throw, just to keep things nice and simple. I reckon you're going to spend all of these matches, like every match that you see between these two, most of it's going to be spent here. At range. As long as Javier's got the life lead, absolutely. Oh, but there it is. And, and that one is why... spear, 300 damage incoming. And that's why Javier doesn't give a damn about getting hit by the falling spirit. Like, he doesn't really have to care about the damage. It's barely any damage compared to the full Ooh, combo the spear lands you. <gasps> no! Yeah, I can't afford for those kind of drops, however, if you are fab. Unfortunate to see it, but that is what it is. Every drop combo is this kind of situation taking longer to get to. But when you can, overhead, okay. Yeah, goes for the resummon. And again, that wake up down three, Javier. <gasps> In the face of Sento, EX Hellfire. Javier with the confidence, and it paid off. A great choice, though, because it completely bypassed the spirit. Who cares? Yeah, I'm going to win the round whether you like it or not, mate. Right, full combo. Uh. Get the down back fall, the slash. We're going to start Sandwich pressuring. is there. Oh, instant armor. That Sento's swinging. I don't know what it's hitting, but it ain't Scorpion. That's oh, challenge. what a confirm. I okay. wonder what he was challenging from that range. What do you reckon he was expecting to see? Still wow. got there in range for the punish, though. Oh, and the pickup into the stance switch. I love that from Fabs. Oh, oh. Huge hit. no, couldn't combo. Never mind. Almost so dead. three bars. This is uh, potentially quite a lot of damage if Javier can find the opening, but without Striker, I was oh, about dead. to say easier said than done, but never mind. As one Javier just confirms the, the two one. There he goes, Anna. Yeah, absolutely. Didn't even need a second bar and the brutality finish because why not? Overall, a very comfortable matchup for Javier so far. You have to just ask the question, what is Fab's answer to this? Because, right. As much as I hate to say it because it's me, I think he might have to go away from the Cyrex cameo for this one. Because it's like, I un I completely understand the Kenshi Cyrax synergy. It definitely is powerful. I don't think it, this is the matchup to bring it. As we saw before, um, when we saw him make the change to Sub-Zero cameo uh, against uh, Josh, for that kind of like more kind of consistent ranged options. Obviously the ice armor can be good against the grenades, 
um, as well as just having more consistent damage on hit when you do find it, or maybe something else. Okay, we have seen a rise, a significant rise of Kenshi Striker as of the last kind of real couple of months. So uh, this is also not a huge surprise to see. We don't see it as much in EU West, though. This is much more of like a kind of Middle East um, strategy, as we see it a lot in Pro Comp Middle East. But uh, Fabs put a lot of time into Kenji. I definitely know he's going to be ready for this pit, but this, this pairing. Shoutouts to the uh, Middle East and uh, Oceanic as well that we saw yesterday. We had some really, really fun results there. Faisal just absolutely impressing with the Katana Chameleon. Waz was able to secure a first place finish with Shang Tsung. So uh, the unorthodox characters have definitely seen their share of spotlight recently. Let's not forget Brosip winning uh, one of the League of Latinas and going to final combat with Quan Chi. Yeah, I, I mean, love to see We're seeing it. some variety here. Oh, but an instant resummon. I love that. And the punish. Yeah, couldn't do anything more, but this is what you want. Get the sandwich. Look at all that center up time. And again, Javier's awareness to go for the <clears> armor, <throat> like armoring out of these extended Kenshi sequences is not easy. Like, if, if he just blocks, he can punish safe moves with Sento for massive damage. But Javier, he is just on the money every time. Let it rock. Oh, that's be punished. Oh, just got Striker back. Never mind. Just got him at the very end. But Mustard, he called him in so late. I'm sure Fabs was just... He mustn't be doing it. He would have done it by now, surely. And then boom, well, grenades well, Striker the wasn't even ready. Like, uh, he only just came off cooldown yeah. right as Javier used it. Oh, All right. Wait a minute. Again, the challenge! I, th what's even so, uh, more surprising about that is that was like the grenades occupied the armor. So like that was like, could have been risky, but Javier, again, he, he's just, he's on the money. The call out, he knows when to go for the armor. Magic range. Uh -oh. You try to press and you'll pay the price. Javier only needs one more round in this hit confirm. It ain't going to win the round, but it's going to create a horrible situation for Fabs. I'm looking at that EX Hellfire and I'm getting nervous. Does he have the chance to build? Oh, Didn't need it. Doesn't need to. Javi, yeah, making short work of Fabs there. Three to zero. And, you know, when we saw the uh, striker cameo, I know your first thought was, oh, damn, he's, he's actually going in with the striker again. This had to have been one of the very specific matchups where they're still cooking because i mean it was exactly the way we described that matchup was exactly how it went yeah, that that's just how javier approaches things keep kenshi from being at his effective range keep him far away make him struggle to find a hit find a button i've got really good backwards movement so i'm kind of zoning you out i'm zoning you out without like the traditional projectile game it kind of goes to show that zoning someone takes many different forms projectiles are just kind of like the the standard way of enforcing it but if you have a move that keeps control of your opponent from a ranged point of view keep them at a distance in this case it was the standing two it was the back three that played a huge part in this matchup and of course the uh full screen spears that i get hit by one of your specials as a punish and it's like 80 damage I hit a spear and it's 300. So, like, that's a trade that's in my favor all day, every day. I mean, say what you will about Scorpion. You know, obviously, he is one of those more kind of, like, um, debated placements when we're talking, like, overall tiers of the game. Is he good? Is he not? You know, competitively speaking, of course. Um, one thing you can't deny is spear is pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Spear being, like, that restand for combos, for whiff punishment. It's a projectile. You can EX it to be mid. And getting, like, 300 plus from just a spear, that's scary. You know, it doesn't matter the matchup. That is a game changer uh, for a lot of situations. But, of course, Javier now moving on to top four once more. I mean, going into this event, he definitely had, I think, the safest amount of points on the leaderboard. So, you know... At a push, I think he kind of needed the points from this the least. But hey, if you can get yourself into that territory where eventually you've got so many points, you cannot be knocked out of that kind of top nine threshold, which is oh so important on the leaderboard, you want to do it. And Javier, one step closer to doing so. But now we move on to our next match in the loser site, which is going to be Video Games Yo versus Lord Corridor. And I am smiling because I've seen Video Games Yo go back to one of his early days teams. Of course, he's back on the General Shao, which is the character most of us associate Video Games Yo with. But Motaro, the ultimate MK3 boss, is back, ready to go. So much synergy with Shao. 
Oh, hopefully we see it. Of course, you know, we, we, we are VGY supporters. You know, I've known him for a long time, doing it for the UK, but, you know, we'll try not be biased here. And that's a nice pickup. But definitely looking forward to seeing this one. And especially with, with Xiao in general, very much a people-pleasing character, I think. Very spectator-friendly. Lots of cool combos, lots of cool buttons, interesting cameo pairings, and uh, Motaro, definitely one of them. We are going to get an early breaker forced, however. And still technically get a few pickups there from the teleport, but it really depends on what move Xiao's going for. EGY is going to be content to just look for his turn. Wait patiently for it. You have to be patient. Oh, wait a minute. We just straight up spent all of it just to get the uh, turret mode there Not from Motaro. Huge... Obviously, it costs everything, but the cooldown time isn't super long. And obviously, as you can see, BGY used, you know, free axe activation. Um, Escape the corner yeah, too. Not too. Not too bad, honestly. Not something you'll see too much, but not to be ignored. And there's a throw combo again. Law Corridor. Again, can only really go for that when the Katana mode is available. So that's really... That is, is that the most damage we've seen for a throw combo in the current version of the game? I don't think I've seen more than 240 for like a normal throw combo. I've seen more from... Oh, wait oh, a hang on. Wait, hang on. Fatal Blow. Oh, you'll break. He has you to. Yeah, he has to. Break. Oh, he spent it again. The jump was so Ooh. smart. The jump kept you from having to hold the mix-up. That was a crucial break from Law Corridor, though. That fatal blow was def- Ooh, goes underneath. Never mind. One of the weaknesses of Xiao's reversal game is that the uh, the knee is prone to being low profile. Oh, that would have been so smart there. Law Corridor tried to time it to side switch as well as combo. Well, I, I can't say to like certainty because it's been a while since I checked, but I'm fairly sure that knee is a high. So I actually think it's one of those things where it's not even a case of low profiling it. It's just crouching or going under it. I could be wrong, though. You know, don't take my word as gospel. But uh, we definitely see people go under it a lot. Oh, hello. No, actually, that, that's not terrible for VGY because he still gets off the ground without uh, having to deal with too much meaty. Wake up, fatal blow. Hang on. Oh, he walks forward. Just make sure he's in range. Yes, he is. That's going to be enough to kill for sure. I'm not sure if that fatal blow was intentional. It's hard to explain, but there are some instances when you're... You know, just the buttons that you're holding when you wake up, sometimes you, you kind of just accidentally get fatal blow. Always down to the player, of course. I would assume game, but... it was just a big call out that didn't work out, honestly. I don't think that's the kind of mistake Raw Corridor would make. We shall see. But it definitely isn't a, a normal time to go for the fatal blow there. It, it, it wouldn't have killed, dare I say, it wouldn't have even got the life lead. So perhaps it was a mistake. But either way, we must move on as Law Corridor gets Eats hit by the, the overhead. overhead into teleport. Yep. More of that Motaro synergy. Smart oh, positioning from VGY, by the way. Like you know, the, the corner escape for Raiden, you always have to kind of dance at that jump range because his jump back into electric fly is so common lovely pickup of that entire forward four string okay goes out of the corner just into katana mode as well lord corridor the perfect timing on the throw combo oh this is quickly adding up for lord corridor oh there it is melina roll gets the break out of vgy and suddenly a great position for lord corridor to be in No, no, that's not going to work. It did. No, it, it did, Motaro. You Motaro. smart man. You smart man. If that was the axe, it wouldn't have worked. But you forget. Well, I forget. Motaro <laughs> has the much faster Fatal Blow startup. Regular Shao would not have got that. But thank you very much, Motaro, for the assist. That's such a specific thing that Motaro has. You know what I mean? Like that—that that is something that you, you'll look at on paper and be like, "Well, you know, it's—it's it's cool that Motaro has his own fatal blow into." But I wonder how useful it could be. Put him next to someone like Xiao, who has one of the hardest to combo into, like slowest startup fatal blows, and suddenly it's a game changer. What was that? Just standing two, hit the cameo, yeah. fatal blow, hits the character. That was gnarly. I mean, you have to just factor in that. One of the weaknesses of Xiao is that his fatal blow is very slow. Might even be the slowest, actually. And suddenly it isn't. <laughs> if and then, is yeah, there. all of a sudden, so many buttons that you would not be able to confirm into fatal blow before become safer and better. But it's, because not, of no, it's not just any attack, though. It's Motaro's just punch. regular, normal MK3 punch. 
Yeah, Mate, the I'll one spend... that sent so many of us down to the continue screen. Mate, I spent a childhood picking Motaro and Trilogy and just doing that move. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Only real ones remember. Oh! Hit confirm now. Oh, the whiff? <laughs> no, <Wow. it> connected. <laughs> that did not whiff. The last hit connected. Oh, yeah, get off me. There's the reversal. Plus frames. Oh, quick backdash, though, from Lord Corridor out of it. Yeah, Lord Corridor is a fan of those backdashes. He does it a lot after Glaive, too. Mix up is going to be successful. Well, yeah, Lord Corridor, he'll throw a J Glaive of, um... and then back up and do forward four yeah. just to beat it down one, you know? Well, it's dangerous to do it after the Motaro low shot because it is so plus, like double digit plus frames. But hey, if you read something specific, definitely still work out. Not a terrible spot for video games, Yo, to be in. Lord Corridor, breaker available. Do you think he uses it here if he gets a chance? He's going to have to be very confident. Oh, punish! Oh, Comboed! That actually comboed. There's a lot more to this matchup than... Oh, Ooh, oh, oh, sniped. There is more to this cameo pairing than meets the eye, especially against Raiden. I don't think there was anything Law Corridor could have done to survive that. I think the second he left the ground, it was over. Because if he did electric fly to avoid the orb, I think he would have just been blocked and punished. Uh-huh. If he charges his uh, electricity as well, I don't think oh, he, he missed cancel it. it in any way, so... Unfortunate. First time I've seen Law Corridor drop that, I believe. Still, though, much better round this time. And an instant break from VGY. Wanted to hold on to the meter for as long as possible, but winning the round is still a possibility, and VGY wants to keep himself in it because of it. Fully stocked Motaro. Patience. The punish yeah. as well. Matchup knowledge. Overhead. Side switch just to keep the corner. It's going to give us an even bigger combo because of it. I didn't know that Motaro had so much, like, such little recovery after the teleport that he could actually do a full jump punch to get a cross-up. Not cross-up, but like a side switch from that. I've never seen that. That buffed low shot from Motaro makes him so much better. Nice oh, mix up. This kills, right? EX Shocker into Fatal Blow. There it is. That's got to be enough for it's sure. It's going to scale, but at this health, I'm fairly positive it wins the round. Even with the mash. Now this definitely has to be enough. I'll be very Absolutely. yeah. He, he's like super dead. Right. So, how do we end this round? VGY has full cameo in two bars. Same thing for the cameo of Law Corridor, but we only have one bar of meter. We are even mid screen. Uh, Law Corridor has learned his lesson not to charge the projectile against Motaro again. Too far away this time. What? <laughs> Cheeky stuff. Yeah, Lord Corridor rip. has been getting mileage out of the Count of Hope roll. Ouch. That's going to hurt. Yes, it will. Side switch as well. Right, Motaro time. <laughs> Bang. Oh, that hit an up block. Oh, Lord Corridor went for a, a, just an up block on wake up. That must have just been a hard call out on otherwise safe overhead. Oh, huge. Okay. Big situation. An instant break from VGY. Not wanting to drop that life lead. It's always a bit of a decision, right? Halfway through a combo, do you break or not? Then again, Lord Corridor would have built mad meter. That meter, no doubt, would have gone into possible mix up. <gasps> that was uh, almost a costly input error. Has to break. Can't break because Melina. Yeah. Chameleon got hit, so couldn't break. Never mind, though. No Confirm. Oh, that should be it. No, no, no. We have extra health. We are going to spend two bars here, and we are going to meaty at the end. VGY has got to flawless block. No! Plus frame. Plus! Into just the overhead. I don't hate that decision either, because like, like that Motaro low shot is so advantage on block. Normally, you know, when you get advantage, you have to do something quick to guarantee a frame trap. But that is so advantage going into the overhead, even though it's not a, it's not a true block string. You're so advantageous that they kind of have to respect it more than other options. And if Lord Corridor went for like an EX electric fly for armor, would have died anyway because didn't have the health to absorb it. That was a uh, a calculated time to go for a not true block string, especially if Lord Corridor was going to be maybe looking for the flawless block. Well, well, well. We have to make a decision now. I've seen Lord Corridor play different cameos in the past. It's been a lot of chameleon recently, and it has been all the way through this tournament. But if you change now, it's kind of your last chance. So chameleon all the yeah, way. No yeah. hesitation. Absolutely no hesitation. I respect right it. Back in with it. I respect it. I mean, it is a wonderful pairing. Why then, General, did you lose to me? 
All right, this Motaro has been helping him so much in this matchup, Mustard. I mean, VGY, he, he's put a lot of time into this character. He's played all sorts of cameos in tournament. Obviously, you know, streams the game a lot too. Obviously, YouTube has all sorts of like, what, cameo guides for Xiao? He definitely understands the pairings. And we're seeing that here with this Motaro pick as he's currently 2-0 up on low corridor. And the Reflect having just such a fast cooldown. I mean, th that change Ouch. to Motaro was so useful for him. The Reflect is now the best cameo Reflect you have. He's now got that fast shot, which is now considerably faster than Lao Loha, although... Oh! Oh! Confirm! All right. Where do we go from here? Do we spend Motaro for pressure? Turret mode! Oh, Motaro, turn around! Yeah, too close to catch the electric fly, but won't matter as VGY... Now looking at a potential match point. Could be 3-0 over Lord Corridor here. Unless Lord Corridor can find something here and now. Yeah, nice catch. Definitely okay. expected the overhead there. A hundred percent. It's a weird one. Like this set is going down to potentially 3-0, but it doesn't feel like it. I feel like we're getting so close in most of these rounds. It's just BGY is able to just clutch it out a bit more. But this round, this is more like it for Lord Corridor. This is what you need. Big life lead. Good management of uh, Cameo as well. Always has some Chameleon ready. Oh, actually, just lost it there. This could be a problem. Didn't absorb a hit, so full combo. Wait for the jump out. Trying to establish something. But again, a reaction. Wow, it goes through the Chameleon as well. That Reflect is just so good for this team. Oh, he is walking him down. <laughs> He's holding forward. Punish. It's standing too. Right, I doubt he is going to spend it now. Motaro. Well, he, he spent it there because Law Corridor was one hit away from building a breaker. So using it there guarantees a chunk of damage, gives the life lead. This won't kill, but this is life lead for sure. And even though Law Corridor has breaker, he might actually just die to a single hit here if he's not careful. How's he find it? There's a turret. Couldn't chase down. Expensive read there for BGY. Let's the turret mode go. Didn't work out. Has to watch out. Ooh, huge decision from BGY. Just goes for a reversal knee. Would have won the set on it, but... Law Corridor, the patience. Slows it down at the final moment and stays alive in this set. Could we see a turnaround here? Now that fatal blow has been spent, so VGY doesn't have it for the rest of the game. Plus frames. Plus frames. Not needed. It's just connecting on its own, that low shot. That's a punish. He punishes, right? Yep. Yes, sir. Not many characters get a full distance punish on that EX Storm Cell, but... Shao standing to an axe would like to have a word with you. General Shao, don't give no damn about that. Punish uh -oh. again. Can't you break. can't break. Chameleon got hit. This is this, this is all oh. damage. Ouch. The final, final situation for Lord Corridor. Plus, challenges the plus frames. Plus. Oof. Okay. Has to do everything perfect. Molina is not going to work it. Oh, you're dead. See ya. Oh. <laughs> and the flawless block from VGY, just to be absolutely sure. VGY with a 3-0. Really looking better from Lord Corridor in that third game, but especially with that kind of like penultimate round, VGY just seemed to be in the groove, man. Uh, that, for me, was some of the more impressive just display of the Shao Motaro because I don't really it was see clean. it much these days. It was really, really popular early days, right? And then as people start playing more cameos, we've started to see more cameos be used in competitive. And Motaro, this was a huge moment. So the reason I immediately, before I forgot, you know, that, that the, the Motaro Fatal Blow exists, that would have whiffed in any other circumstance. But just all of these replays are just showing situations that only Motaro is opening up in this matchup. Like, I love it. Oh, my MK3. I, I love my just how, how the team... Yeah, of course. I love how this team has kind of developed, though, right? Because early on, yeah, as you correctly said, we saw a lot of Motaro because it was basically just Motaro all out. And it was pretty much just for, like, you know, the fact that Overhead could do teleport into full combo. Tyler showed the world that combo, and the world just was like, <laughs> I want to do that too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But that was obviously, like, the main reason people would pick it. But as things have evolved, you know, obviously Motaro got a pretty chunky buff um, you know, a few patches ago. And as, as people have learned and explored these characters and teams more, you're seeing more synergies. 
And I think um, Xiaomo Tara is a perfect example of that, as we will be maybe seeing some more of it a little bit later on as our top four is decided. Winners finals of Boki versus Kanamani is going to be coming up and loser side once more, another run back, MK Javier and Video Games Yo. We are getting down to that point territory. And the players left, I think, are the most looking for it. Th these are the four players who I think are most realistically in need of those points, right? So honestly, if you ask me, couldn't have had a better top four than what we're about to see. It's a perfect demonstration of what EU West is providing from a competitive sense. However, we're going to go for a bit of a break. And when we come back, the tournament that you're watching right now has its conclusion. So, see you in a few minutes. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Final Combat. That's where Kanemani is looking. There it is! Oh, he waited for it! It grand champion for Mortal Kombat 1 here. No, not again. Oh, no. He tried to get... Oh, and why Gemini tried to get away. With the pop off I am so sorry. What? You want to get that into the orb? That was disgusting. It's so big! Combo in the yes. combo! Oh my god! And Sonic for three! It's your trip! Big like it all when it came to mind is covered once again for full combo conversion. E aí, meus amigos, hoje é dia de Pro Competition no Brasil, olha que legal. E eu vou mostrar pra vocês como que funciona a estrutura aqui, ó. Eu tô gravando um pouco antes do momento de começar o evento, os Pro Players já estão chegando, olha só, o Zeus aqui na fila, beleza, Zeus? Beleza. Tá preparado? Como é que foi o treinamento? Tô, foi, foi pesado, preparado. É, hoje o negócio vai ser difícil, eu vou mostrar pra vocês. Valeu, Zeus, já a gente se vê, olha só, tem aqui a parte do credenciamento, eu peguei essa pulseira aqui, eu não sei por quê, o que quer dizer essa pulseira da minha cor? É, da equipe. Ah, da equipe, que Bom, ainda bem que se fosse de pro player, tava lascado, não ia dar certo não. E aqui já tem os pro players fazendo o cadastramento. E aí, como é que você tá? E aí? Beleza, eu sou rando, eu não sou pro player não. Mas vai jogar hoje e, e pelo que você viu aqui vai ser fácil, né? Com a galera que você viu aqui. Ah, né? Minha segunda partida é só contra um dos chilenos aí, né? Ah, mano. Tá certo, olha só, os irmãos chilenos aqui, mais uma vez. Bem-vindos, olá. Olá. Muito, muito, muito bem. Tudo bem, tudo bem. Preparado? Prepa eu não, eu não estou preparado. Vocês têm que estar preparados. <risos> Mas olha, eles estão fazendo aqui o cadastramento. Ó, tem um monte de PlayStation 5 aqui para o pessoal jogar, mas logo aqui na entrada, o primeiro que já tem, já tem um monte de gente jogando. Ó. Vamos ver. Tekken Master BR, você? Eu mesmo. Vim lá das Arábias e agora em terras paulistas. E nos corredores a gente encontra muitos nomes famosos, como por exemplo, ah, Rubuiu, que vai entrar ao vivo daqui a pouco, beleza? Isso aí. Com certeza, papai. Tá animado hoje? Demais, cara. Pô, momento histórico pro Brasil, né? Pro Competition, um dos maiores campeonatos né, do, do circuito. Vai ter uma etapa brasileira. Muita gente boa, vai ter os gêmeos, né? Que são considerados aí, com certeza, os favoritos. Mas, ó, os brasileiros vão fazer bonito, hein, cara? Que Lestinó, que tá com o Kung Lao, que, ó... Tá, tá registrado, não tá, Olha Ariel? Olha só, Ariel tá por aqui. Ariel, que legal ver os caras do mundo inteiro pra aqui, né? Pô, cara, é uma pena que o Sonic Fox não pôde ver, porque ele já tinha é, inscrito pro, pro torneio, né? Mas a gente tem, como o Buiu falou, os gêmeos. Tem outros gringos aqui também, argentinos, muito fortes. Inclusive, se eu não me engano, a primeira partida vai ser do, do, do Scorpion Prox, que é um dos chilenos. Mas é como o Buiu falou também, os brasileiros estão muito fortes. O Killer, o Page, o Gui e todos os outros que estão chegando. Tem um aqui que no, no offline, no online, ele faz muito bonito, que é o Mano Phelps. Fica de olho nesse menino aí, rapaz. E agora eu convido vocês a conhecer aqui a parte da stream. Vem cá. Esse aqui é o lugar onde os casters brasileiros vão ficar. Então tem aqui o Stream Master. Ali atrás vocês estão vendo a dupla brasileira de comentaristas. O troféuzão tá lá dentro, tá incrível. E é o seguinte, ele pisca. Só ah, não, o troféu spoiler. que pisca. Spoiler. Não é possível, a gente vai ver isso. Hoje não, a gente vai ver amanhã. Que pisca, né, <risos> Esse lugar, vou até falar mais baixo, porque é aqui onde a mágica acontece. É, essas são as duas, dois locais de transmissão onde as partidas que vão pra live acontecem. Então aqui é o lugar de tensão. Você consegue perceber que aqui o clima tá tenso? 
Aqui tem os locais de entrevista, então eu também vou fazer entrevistas aqui, ó. Resolveu conversando com os pro players e os convidados aqui. Então hoje é um dia muito especial, espero que vocês estejam gostando, pra gente tá sendo muito legal ter todo mundo aqui no Brasil na Pro Competition de Mortal Kombat 1. This is no time to smile. Hell yeah it is. Fight a fire god is coming off my bucket list. monster chick I've met. You think me a monster? Eagle. I bet shits take more effort than beating you, Will. I will so enjoy killing you. Peace unlocked. Fatality. Peacemaker wins. Flawless victory. Pro Competition 2024 reuniu jogadores de todas as partes do mundo no Brasil nos dias 2 e 3 de março de 2024. E foi uma oportunidade incrível dos Pro Players brasileiros conhecerem os de fora e também reunir todos esses amantes de Mortal Kombat 1 aqui no Brasil, na Login House, na Vila Madalena, em São Paulo. O evento foi dividido em dois dias. Primeiro dia, no sábado, as eliminatórias para ver quem seriam os 24 melhores colocados que seriam classificados para domingo, o segundo dia. Com, obviamente, 24 pessoas disputando o troféu de primeiro lugar na Pro Competition. Muitos brasileiros se classificaram para o Top 24 e 50% da Winners estava com o Brasil. Eu já participei de campeonatos dos Estados Unidos e tal. Acho que o campeonato de maior nível que eu joguei do Mortal Kombat 1 é esse aqui. Não. Só tem gente forte, não tem luta fácil. Não, que esse nível tá, tá alto até demais aqui. Se você olhar ali a tabela ali do top 24 ali, que todos os jogos, os confrontos vão ser super é, emocionantes, né? Só tem jogador de, de alto nível aqui. Olha só, o Murilo BDS enfrentou o campeão da Evo, Scorpion Prox. E o Murilo trouxe o General Shao e Darius para enfrentar o Barak do Scorpion Prox. Quase venceu, mas o Scorpion Prox ficou com a melhor com 3x2. O Killer Schnock com seu Kung Lao enfrentou o americano King Gambler com um Johnny Cage muito bem treinado e não conseguiu passar por ele. E também pela Winners, o Conqueror enfrentou o Nicholas, chileno, com seu Raiden. E deu muito trabalho para ele, mas Nicholas seguiu pela Winners. E sim, tivemos Brasil vencendo na Winners com o Brian, 
com seu Sub-Zero, que venceu o espanhol Javier com seu Scorpion. E tivemos várias outras partidas insanas, como a do Conqueror contra o argentino Chocolate. Tudo você pode conferir no Warner Play, a live tá lá. E passando por todo mundo, o chileno Scorpion Prox consegue chegar na grande final pela Winners. E o brasileiro mais bem pontuado foi o Brian, que foi pela Losers, depois de perder para o chileno Nicolas, venceu na Losers o veterano Killer Shinnok por 3x1 e ao enfrentar novamente o Javier pela Losers, ele perdeu de 3 a 0 e o Javier disputou a final da Losers com o Nicolas. Javier venceu e foi para a grande final. E tivemos Scorpion Prox do Chile contra Javier da Espanha. E o Scorpion Prox venceu por 3x1 utilizando seu Baraka contra o Scorpion do Javier. E recebeu o grande troféu da Pro Competition 2024 do Brasil das mãos de Raiden e levantou a taça. Muitas felicitações! Muitas graças! Sim, sí, quero saber... Como te sientes al ganhar a Pro Competition? Feliz e aliviado porque esto me sirve mucho para la Final Combat, para clasificar porque va a dar muchos puntos este torneo. E você pode continuar acompanhando todos os principais torneios de Mortal Kombat 1 aqui no Warner Play. A gente transmite tanto para YouTube, TikTok e Twitch também os principais torneios. Vem com a gente! Hello everyone and welcome back as we enter top four of MK1 Pro Competition EU West qualifier number three. We are Ketchup and Mustard and we've been talking you through some of these games we've had so far today and there's plenty more where that came from as we are ready to go into our winners finals and beyond. The uh, important thing today is of course so many points on the line for the players but for those of you at home We've got some merchandise to talk about. If you want to support the pro competition, pick up some cool looking merch for yourselves in the meantime, head on over to wbshop.com and grab some cool merch. And of course, check us out on twitch.tv forward slash netherrealm, TikTok, Mortal Kombat, and YouTube, Mortal Kombat as well. Would recommend it, especially as we get towards the end of the season. There's not much time left. So grab it while you can, get some cool stuff in the meantime. And of course, support the pro competition. And it ain't just merch we're talking about. We're talking about Combo Breaker taking place in a few months. And it is the fourth and final offline major event for the pro competition. And it's the heart and soul of the FGC, I often think. Combo Breaker is my Breaker. favorite event of the year, man. I'm really happy to see it get not only to be a pro competition stop, but like one that is going to be so... What's the word I'm looking for? Impactful. There's, a, There's yes. a lot on the line, man. There's a lot of players that, by the time we have Combo Breaker, many, if all, of the onlines will be completed. So we're going to know where the points are. So the players that are within that leaderboard and a good performance at Combo Breaker sends them to final combat. That is where the most impactful matches will take place. And they're going to be the greatest ones from a viewership perspective, but obviously... You know, some players are going to be absolutely thrilled at their result, and some players are going to be crushed because it's just but the nature I, I of the final well, stretch. Even though we're all looking forward to seeing it for the level of competition and seeing, obviously, you know, who will be making it to final combat on points and everything, even if you are just an enjoyer of fighting games, you know, maybe you just like watching Mortal Kombat, maybe you want to see what some of these FGC events are all about, Combo Breaker can absolutely recommend it wholeheartedly, even as a spectator. You know, it's a great social event. You'll meet a lot of people. And I love the arcade. Lots to watch. Yeah, lots to watch, lots to, lots to do. They've got, like, the arcade, um, you know, retro area as well. That's always a good time. And uh, lots to enjoy if you just like fighting games overall. So highly recommended. But it's time for us to get down to business. We are in top four territory. MK1 Pro Competition EU West. Qualifier number three. It's down to Boki versus Kanamani in winners' finals, and Javier versus Video Games Yo, uh, Video Games Yo in losers. Sorry, I'm tripping over my own shoelaces. This is important. You know, I, I really don't want to sound like a broken record, but we're talking points. You know, that's how it works. That's what pro competition is all about for these players. You want to get points for the global leaderboard, or you want to get points towards the regional finals. Win the regional finals, you guarantee direct qualify for final combat. Only one player per region can do that. And for the four players we've got left in this tournament, these are four players that have been around. 
They've been competing. They were all at UFA. They all got top eight at UFA. And a couple of them have even been to other events as well. So these are players who are realistically looking that even if they don't win um, the regional finals, they can make it on points if they get enough. But they need to get as much points as possible. So every match from this point on is so important. Now, this match in particular, I always find really interesting because it's just about who can establish that game plan the best. Because Kung Lao, Boki wants to be aggressive, he wants to rush down, he wants to like constantly establish his own mix-ups. The basic Kung Lao stuff, and then Raiden, of course, wants to get in, chip damage all day, every day, hard to keep out. It's who lays that on first, and these two players definitely able to do that. Boki, immediately going in with the down four, just trying to stay safer, but a bit too hopeful on that overhead, not covered up by Agoro, so that is going to be a clean punish. Kanemani definitely scoring first blood in this winner's finals. But we also noticed that the, the opening play from Kanemani, which of course was to go for, you know, the, the advancement covered by Kano, Boki went for a down four punish, not down two. So uh, maybe he's been paying attention to the matches as well as we saw Kanamani get so much out of the uh, the punish of your punish as we saw before. I wonder if we'll see that here. Still though, a good round. Nice to see uh, Kanamani playing the kind of more distance game. Of course, we know Lao Goro is such an aggressive team, really thrives from that kind of sweep distance. You know, looking for gaps, looking for anything to armor into launch. But Kanamani is playing far away not letting himself get in a position to deal with that whatsoever. This Especially runaway game, it's a clear game plan. Like, if I have a life lead versus you, I'm going to stay at the range that you're going to struggle and just keep working at it piece by piece. Boki has been able to do the one thing he needed to, get in and start to establish. The had problem to go is for the be less... staying in, yeah. yeah. He had to go for the less likely throw direction, so he did have to give up corner positioning. Can't punish that. Raiden doesn't have a fast enough button. Can you imagine if he did? <laughs> no, I for the longest Raiden time was one of the six frame characters. I for the longest time thought maybe that would be where the use of his down back two came from, but it's nine frames. Yeah, you know, that special move doesn't really get used by anyone. But I thought maybe it's I often speed forget would be the it. benefit. Yeah, yeah, me too, me too. Oh, there we go. A nice catch from Kanamani again. Oh, huge up block for Boki. Yeah, has to spend Goro to get damage here, but definitely worth it for the uplock. Especially after seeing how Kanamani was making the most of a life lead. Boki cannot let that happen again. Good block on that overhead, by the way. The overhead off that back three from that range was the only thing that could have connected. So good awareness there from Kanamani. Uh-oh. Ooh, oh. didn't pick up from that. Maybe he just couldn't do it in time. Down one into down back three. The classic. And a man, he spends the second bar. Are we going to spend Kano as well? Nah, we're keeping him. No, Kano for chip for sure at this life. I like that meaty down back three, though. That would have armor broken Kung Lao wake up. Okay, importantly enough, Kano got clipped there. So he was down for quite a while. And Kanamani, yeah, there, he's gone again. Kano might be down for the rest of this. Has the force block. Can get it again. Oh, one too many times. Yeah, that was actually looking like a pretty good spot for Bogey because he managed to hit Kano, like, not once, but twice at the end when he when he got called out, which pretty much would have kept him away from the round for the remainder of it. But Kanamani instantly, when you're looking at chip damage and there's not a lot of last breath to keep you alive, that charged up Raiden Fireball. It's not every match that you get to charge it for a significant amount of time, but when you've got that much life left to do, it's definitely an attractive option. The electric fly has been a consistent answer versus the Goro, too. Let's not forget that Goro, when he comes in to do the raise the roof, he has to physically jump in, which means he starts up above. And if he's coming in and the Raiden Superman's coming out, he's going to get hit. And if Goro gets hit and he has to deal with that six second penalty, that's unfortunate for Kung Lao. Even then, doesn't work out. Looking for it. Low poke there. Boki now starts the mix-ups. Good block on the overhead, though. Keeping it simple. Kanamani does not have to fear the armor. There is no meter to spend on the side of Kung Lao. Ooh, hello. Counter, uh, counter poke up kick. That is not something you see every day. Micro backdash into forward four, by the way, to clip Boki's button attempt. Uh-oh. Saves the Kano and uses it to meet it. Yep. Rainy day situation, that one. I think that's what really separates Kanamani's Kano Raiden from a lot of other Raiden Kano players. It's just the situational awareness and just squeezing every ounce of optimization, no matter where it comes from. 
Yep, meaty, meaty. Everything is, I said it before, brutally efficient. And it's the same thing here. I mean, you said right at the start of the broadcast, a lot of players in Western Europe consider Kanemani perhaps the best player from this part of the world. And of course, you know, one regional qualifier, number two, looking well poised to do a similar thing today, perhaps. Like this player definitely deserves the accolades he gets given from the community. Still, though, it is Found only 1-0 up. Even though this game is looking commanding for Kanemani, it is Boki, and I do not want to count him out because Boki is one of those very consistently reliable players. Oh, but unfortunate. That was definitely meant to be a dive kick, that one. Looked like it. Free jump in. Thank you very much, Kano and Meaty. Boki is struggling to just find a way in here, Mustard. Just can't find it. Zap! Well, you did mention Kanemani is going to have a game plan going into this. You know, th th these are two players who are no stranger to competitive MK1. We know they've played before, and you know, Kanemani is one to learn from those past sets too. What but that's a good, it is a good way this, of though. playing that's against question. not only like the the Kung Lao Goro team that we see so so often, but also against Boki. You know, Boki is. You know, I, I want to be respectful when I say this. Boki is a phenomenal player, but not usually the most patient. You know, if, if, if you can look through some of the matches Boki has, when he has to play those matchups where, you know, he has to chase, he can keep up with you, but it's definitely not his first choice. Uh, but Kanemani here is has a style where he can go for the, the slower pace and, you know, really force Boki out of that effective range. And again, even though Boki can play like that, he does, you know, he's definitely not going to be his, 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 uh, his go-to as Kanemani looks for another good, strong start here. Even though Boki already at three bars... So even though he took quite a heavy hit of damage, he's uh, got the resources to make it work, but I don't think he's going to have okay. an easy time finding it. Found a hit, though. It's not going to give him the life lead, but it is going to give him a situation. A meaty. Good block there. The respect being shown. The duck on Goro. Doesn't matter, though, because we just eat a couple of hits regardless. Here comes Kano. Tries to teleport our way out. The pushback. Kung Lao cannot punish from that range. Another Kano knife to cover the jump empty, in. Yeah, empty jump as well, though, from Kanemani. I almost wonder if he expected an up block following up those knives. Maybe armor. Ooh, jump kick. That's, that's something that Boki is going to have to just be so aware of. Now, you know the down. electric fly is coming. What is your answer? I mean, no we, are, we are seeing Boki like, adjust towards it and just try and find something to chase it down. Even there, the patient's waiting out to hit with a projectile on the other way. <clears throat> Boki gets a crucial round. Nice catch. Yep, instant break from Kanemani. Raiden is not a character that's going to struggle to build that bar back from a distance, so you know he's happy to do so. Nice catch on the armor. Not afraid to pull the trigger on the armor even without Goro, and I think that's an important thing to have as a Kung Lao player. You need to have the confidence to still establish that as a threat, uh, you know, an option that someone can go for. Otherwise, they're going to just overwhelm. All right. No armor this time. Tried to make the Kano just a little bit tighter right there. Fill that gap. Kanemani looking for an The issue here. is, though, with this kind of neutral war of attrition where Boki's not getting substantial hits. It's like, you know, a, a hit of armor here, a string there. Kanemani's kind of keeping up with that damage on chip damage, whether it's like the, uh, of course, right yeah, here, the Storm Cell, Kano cameos. Nice catch. Boki really trying to have that constant, consistent stream of damage, but yeah, there it is. Nice down two. Okay, that's more like it. And there's armor. the armor again. Boki finds one on the board. Now, again, a, a, a dangerous way of having to bring the life lead back. But again, yeah, we're talking about adaptation and how Kanemani has been adjusting on the fly. Boki's doing the same thing. You know, a, a lot less commitment, not looking for those massive hits. It, it's dangerous to play for the, you know, one hit at a time. But hey, he's playing the cards he's dealt. If that's the I'm way impressed. he's got to adjust to the matchup, that's what he's doing. And again, you know, on the board. I said at the very beginning of this set that these two characters, it'll be about who can establish game plan first. Boki has immediately had to switch where, right, clearly, Kanemani is in charge. When it comes to the pace of this neutral, how everything's being approached, the Raiden is running rings around the Kung Lao. So I know that he's going to basically make the first move all the time to keep his dominance. What do I do when there is a situation I can capitalize on? Unfortunately, they're just eating the Kano knives. That is going to be a full combo. But Boki's ability to just work around what Kanemani was doing in that game played a huge part in it. You know, looking for, right, can I armor here? Can I chase down the electric fly with a hat toss? Can I do something weird into Goro that he might not expect? Now he's in the position that I can do something. 
Yeah, couldn't chase down Electric Fly this time. But again, on the flip side, Kanamani is responding in kind, slowing it down even more. More of a life lead, more distance, more chip damage threat. Kano keeps me safer. Again. Play real careful here. Overhead. They add up, they do. An overhead here. A block down back three there. But in this no case, not commitment blocked. of any kind. Unfortunate drop from Kanamani, but again, you're not overcommitting whatsoever. Just looking to keep the life lead and just grind the match down until All right. he's got nothing left. Wants to keep the close range. The other ender would have sent Raiden full screen, and that's not where Boki wants to be. So a tactical use of meter. No, Kano was spent. Yeah, no, Kano was cool, but Boki didn't even attempt to punish because he was waiting for it. Wait a minute. Armor oh. powers through. 10 seconds on the clock. Goro is available. No, he guided the hat upwards. No, I think that's it. Oh, oh. So, okay. So unfortunately, Kanamani just wanted to play for the life lead at the end. But Boki, there were three different attempts to chase down with the hat. The first one was simply done too late. The second one, I think, was done in time, but he guided it upwards. I, I think maybe Boki expected it to be late. So Boki put it upwards, and it missed completely where it otherwise would have hit. Oh, that is unfortunate. Well, Boki no. was like 99% in the right there, but just a crucial mistake. The momentum for Boki continues. There's a proper Boki round. Let's go. Wow. Pressing out of 2-1. I mean, if I'm not mistaken, 2-1 is plus for Kung Lao. It is, but that's the stagger game you play, right? It's, it's, it's advantage, but it's not advantage enough to guarantee, like, huge reward. Especially when you're doing this kind of round, Boki. Yep, there it is again. Still alive. This is still match point for Kanamani, but Boki has all of the equipment, right? Goro fully stocked. Two armors at our disposal, if that's what we want to use the meter for. I feel we say often Boki is not one to be counted out, and this, this is the kind of set I think really shows that off. He just never gives up, no matter what. Just never gives up. You never see the lack of morale or whatever else. Sometimes a player can almost deflate during a match and Boki just, I feel like he can play for a hundred games. Overhead, hang on. Kanamani, watch your head, mate. I promise though, both Goros are gone now. It's gonna be down for quite some what? From time to but he still let it go. Still let it, Rocky did. Oh, interesting. Wait, Yama, Kanamani gets out the corner. That's huge. I promise Boki has no cameo, no breaker. Kanamani. Ooh. Down on life, technically, but he does have... No. Oh, he got moved away. Does that catch the jump back? The conjunction. Oh. Boki went for the greedy punish with the 2-1. Ate a Kano for it and then instantly got caught trying to jump. Kanamani was ready for the hit confirm. And that is going to be Kanamani, winner's side of Grand Finals. And really well played. Really, really well played. And again... It's optimization. I don't mean like crazy optimal combos and stuff like that, although we have seen some of those from Kanamani today to squeeze out the extra damage. Even little things like that. How many Raiden Kano players in that instance would have been ready for the forward two hit confirm? It's a tight, it's, you don't have a lot of time. It's a two hit string, yes. But in that instance, especially catching a jump, you had to be on it to pick that up into Fatal Blow. And a lot of players I see don't do that. So if Kanamani can find an inch, he'll take a mile from it. And that is one of the things that separates him from so many other players. And one of the many reasons he currently lies now in the comfort zone of winner's side grand finals. So three players remain that can fill up that grand finals to fight him. That's going to be Boki in loser's finals now, waiting on the winner of Video Games Yo and MK Javier. I'll tell you what, it's definitely a top four that I would have been happy to see. And uh, I'm not surprised to see that's how it has kind of fleshed out. And even there, Look right, yeah, you that, see, mate. could have like, I, I guess maybe could have done EX Shocker, but what's the point? If Fatal Blow is going to work, maybe Shocker would have missed from that range, right? It looks like it's got an amazing hitbox, but there are certain ranges that it kind of just whiffs. So either way, Kanamani, optimal stuff to finish things off in commanding fashion there. As now Boki awaits the winner in losers finals of Javier and Video Games Yo. I'll be honest, I have no idea how to call this one. Javier and VGY, this is not the first time they've played. I doubt it will be the last. And once again, they do tend to go the distance. Uh, the main thing is they are two players who are not afraid to put the work in. 
Uh, obviously, you know, Javier, true Scorpion specialist, VGY. I feel like tends to play Scorpion. Uh, not Scorpion, tends to play Shao against Scorpion, I should say. Uh, but, as I was actually just about to say, has had a tendency to pick other characters here and there as he believes, you know, is the right choice. And it looks like here, going with that Johnny, which we know is a matchup that Javier has said he does not enjoy, but has played many times and is comfortable with. But VGY going straight to the Johnny Lau instead. I mean, one of the players that Javier was preparing for in his pool when he went to Brazil was Chocolate, and he was thoroughly expecting to have to fight that matchup, and the only reason he didn't was because Brian, the Brazilian Sub-Zero player, was able to sort of pull off such a uh, crazy, insane result and, you know, oh, defeat huge the opponent Javier was worried about one, though. VGY starting off real strong here. Big damage and the wake-up armor. We're going to test the waters with it early. Well, VGY, he is a you know he is a player that well, we know Shao is like his main go-to character when he can, but he has actually got quite a lot of experience with Johnny Cage you know, as a character. Has played it in this game, of course, but even MK11, I remember seeing a significant amount of Johnny Cage uh, from VGY over the years, and uh, is a character he enjoys. For sure. but some again, people might talking. not even know that v one of VGY's all-time favorite Mortal Kombat characters. I actually think it's Johnny Cage. It's not even Shao. Yeah, it's true. But that's what I mean, though, where it's like, we know he's willing to do it. That's probably going to kill. Yeah, I'll be very surprised if uh, if Johnny survives this. 950 health. Big fatal blow to finish. It might all come down to the mash. If VGY survives the percent, it's because he mashed Surely harder. not. I think he's dead. No, it's not enough. Narrowly managed to get through. Yeah, I gotta say, this is actually the first time I've in game seen Ultimate MK3 Scorpion. I'm a big fan of it. It's just, it's making me feel so nostalgic, and it suits him. A little bit of MK4 in there with sort of like how the head's designed as well. Your fa your favorite of the classic game. <laughs> no Jarek here though. Sorry, mate. Maybe one day. Imagine if there was. What would he even do? <laughs> <laughs> I can't answer that question. I don't know. <laughs> oh, actually gets caught with that preemptive standing too. But you can see Javier didn't preemptively do 2-1 this time. BGY was ready with the whiff punish before. Oh, that's a confirm. Let it rock. Well, you will, it's like I said earlier on, you will be seeing Johnny's go for a lot more of those forward ones post-patch because it's just a good source of, obviously, plus frames. But you can see it's with punish something. Get those quick confirms. Smart grab there for Javier. With punish. There is a breaker forced out there by Video Game Joe. However, one more hit will kill you. Oh, that oh, was an no! It might have just cost the game. Oh, yeah, you're dead. Uh, 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 ouch. Ooh. Owie! That is a uh, misinput that I must say I've never seen before. Maybe. Uh, that's, that, that's definitely just a good old fashioned mistake. <laughs> Did he think... There's no two ways about it. Did he that think is he not had the star movie power? I wanted. Because was, he was so close to it, or maybe he was only close to it because he did it by accident. I'm not sure. Either way, it definitely lost the game. As Javier is going to run away with that first one. And now 1-0 up. Looking good. Again, Javier, he really has been on quite the mission in competitive MK1 from launch to now, right? You know, known for so long as just being a, a threat in the online space. Competing in UFA, doing well. You know, his kind of debut offline major tournament. Flying all the way to Brazil, getting second place over some of the best players in Latin America. And now back to that online space and... Again, looking to try and get that top three. Oh, instant challenge from VGY. But i got to say, I am next level impressed with Javier's overall, like, progress in MK1 so far. Definitely one of the players to look out for should he make final combat. Looking for the glaive. Has to wait. You know, Johnny Cage, a catastrophic nerf. He has a seven frame down one now instead of a six frame. But he can still find his way to interrupt glaive if he needs to. Oh, that's staggers too, yeah. It is going to change the offense. 1-1 so is not as plus as it was, but Johnny Cage does still have plus buttons. That's why even the standing two on its own. Ooh. Grab combo. The breaker there, not necessarily for the damage to save, but the situation afterwards. Big jump. Saved himself with the teleport. Beautiful throw tech there from Video Games Joe. Says, nope. Don't want any of that. The glaive isn't going to return. That was some delightful safety from Javier, though. That grab has just brought us into Fatal Blow territory. If VGY gets hit now, it's Fatal Blow. The grab again. Time. Not afraid. Especially against someone like VGY. Like VGY, 
every grab, you know he's teching. It might not always be successful, but you know front or back is getting teched. Look, Again. every time. Yo, this Eight is seconds. actually the, the 100 grab comeback. Underneath, finds a down one that should be enough. Yep, without the flawless block, there's nothing keeping you alive. VGY, very close. So let Javier get that full comeback. But again, that, that was the kind of comeback that I think is just difficult for Javier to make, but very characteristic for him to do. You know, he really has been like the comeback kid in MK1 tournaments so far. Oh, went for another grab. He's going to eat a forward three for his troubles, though. This round looking kind of all VGY right uh -oh. now, and Javier made a big call out. Has to break, but... I mean... Oh, Whoa, wait, hang on. wait. Jade Glow used. I repeat, Jade Glow has been used and it worked. That might be the first time I've ever seen in a competitive MK1 match, like Jade Glow be used for its intended purpose and not just used to like cycle to the next, uh, the next dance. Well, we're going to be going into Jade after this fatal blow's done. You know, I was talking about the comebacks from MK Javier. We might be on uh, the precipice of Oh my of God, here. again. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, yep, has to break for 400 life. Yo, ooh, never mind. Oh, I won't be able to get it this time. That would have been such a fitting time to do it, but that's what I mean, Javier. You are saying before about Boki about how he never gives up. MK Javier, he, he plays every round like he can't lose it, you know? Like, it doesn't matter. Like, he, he will always be capable of bringing it back if you give him an opening or if he finds one where there normally is not. Not going to happen this time. As we tie things up, one game apiece. Johnny Cage looking pretty good here from VGY. Both a matchup and I think player matchup, possibly, as to why the Johnny Cage was selected in the first place. Well, the thing is, Javier is very open about how much he hates this matchup. Like, he doesn't like it and he's very, you know, he doesn't keep it a secret. So if you are someone who is competitive and you play Johnny Cage and you, you know, it's like he's not going to play Scorpion, then you know, right, I can play something he doesn't like fighting. Unless Javier is on this like galaxy bl galaxy brain next level reader, he's like, oh no, don't play Johnny. Don't, don't play Cage, Johnny. I Turns hate out. that yeah. matchup. He's like, oh no, don't pick Kenji versus me. Strike has been nerfed. And then all along, he enjoys the matchup. Yes. Minus frames, expected a button press though, hence the back away, the little back dash. Oh, huge Striker spear. cameo. I thought you were dead. <laughs> That's so good. Ooh. He's dancing. The dash in throw tech there from VGY. VGY would much appreciate a chance at revenge versus Kanamani. So would Javier. At this stage in the tournament, it's always going to be a run back somewhere or another. <laughs> whether it's the same tournament or My whether hit. it's from previous weeks. Now, this is much more the style we're used to seeing from Javier. Punish! Oh, full punish, yep. Yeah. That's gonna hurt. And as uh, he still breaks, yep, Javier doesn't want to let this round go. Breaking right at the end of it, though. <gasps> oh, the chameleon! Fatal blow. Uh -huh. Oh, that's it. That's enough. Now, you know BGY is kicking himself. Because that wasn't even the first hit of the Molina roll for the overhead. I think that was like with first, then second comes out. He blocked the hard bit, or at least managed to bypass the hard bit. And that's going to be now. One round on the board here for Javier Chameleon. Man, Chameleon, the second she made her debut in this game, she has shifted that meta considerably. You know, before Chameleon, it was loads of Kung Lao, loads of Striker. Here comes Chameleon, and now she's just doing all kinds of crazy business for all kinds of characters you never really saw that much. It definitely feels like she's established her place amongst the strongest cameos, because it's not like she's completely replaced anyone, but like, you know, she's definitely up there with the strongest, and I like that. So we're seeing a lot more of the variety from the other characters because of it. I simply, I would love to see all the cameos follow suit. Tremor has been able to cement himself with some characters. You know, Reiko, Ooh, for hang instance, on, is the big one. Hang on, hold that because MK Javier might uh, add uh, just one on this spear. One, uh, that yeah, is yeah. enough. I mean, look at the damage. It just comes out of nowhere. You cannot ever afford to get hit by those spears, Raw. Because if you do, that is a third of your life that you ain't seeing again. Last chance for VGY to change something. Will he go for a different character? We'll see. Well, it's honestly, I, I think it's a continuation of what you were mentioning at the start of the, the show, where, you know, VGY is a player who 
He's got two offline top eights in pro competition, right? East Coast Throwdown, UFA. He's won a EU West online, and obviously he's top eight in all three of them. However, his best result was the first place online. You know, considering the amount of events he's he's been in that give points, you know he wants more points than he's got currently. So this kind of result is he needs this win, like for sure. Javier's got more points overall because Javier's been a bit more consistently like, you know, top end of tournaments. Like VGY definitely needs this result to be like more comfortable going into what will, I imagine not again. Will combo breaker later on. This is definitely not a win that VGY wants to let slip through his fingers, but Javier, quite the opponent in his way. The unfortunate thing there is, Mustard, the same thing happened again. He blocked the easy bit, and then the second overhead hit him. Can't fault him too much. I use that stuff all the time. I fact, he's fought Javier it's, enough it's times. It's tricky, but you have to make sure it doesn't happen. I fought Javier enough times in Combat League, and I get hit by the exact same thing. So, I mean, look, it happens. Look at that damage. 450. That was set up. a big <laughs> number. He went in for his dash to parry the standing two, but the standing two was oh so far away, Cage didn't point. move. Yeah, MK Javier is looking on fire right now. Three to one, potentially, unless VGY can stop this. All right, Mad Plus uses it just to stick out standing two again. Parry. Oh, he turned around. We recovered in time. What's going on? It's pandemonium. We're back. We stabilized. I did not expect Scorpion to turn around after that. Some of those cameos are really good at doing it. They, they can actually function pretty effectively versus Cage Parry for that same reason. These grabs are adding up. He dashed forward. Oh, there it is again. Okay, the parry once more. This time it works out. Minus frame. Another escape grab. Frame. I'm telling you. Javier, he just... He spots a weakness. Again! VGY just cannot get the right direction any time these throws are coming out. He's always getting the button, but it's just the wrong button. The problem is he's now approaching. Oh, there it is. He's approaching throw will kill territory. Set up. That looked... Was that set up, do you think? I don't know. Because on one hand, you have to go for something maybe a bit against the grain when you're in that kind of comeback scenario. However... We also know that players that like to end combos in Lao Low Hat for a possible setup can sometimes get the teleport by accident. I, so. I, I, I feel like you typically see <clears throat> Low Hat in that instance instead of teleport. But regardless, MK Javier, he was ready. Absolutely ready and waiting to get that full punish the second VGY appeared on the other side. And But that's one of the... I mean, yeah, even there, right there, we, we definitely saw... Uh, actually, no, he was... He was just about what star power or is it just about active? I wonder if he just did the wrong input. Yeah, I couldn't tell if it was miss input or whether he just was missing like 1% of star power and just in the heat of the moment didn't know. Maybe. Either way though, MK Javier, I mean, this is one of the reasons why I, I say he's for sure, if he's one of the players who ends up qualifying for final combat via points, which, you know, that's not even saying whether he just, he might end up winning um, yeah, the, the online pro competition for EUS, there's absolutely a possibility. But he is one of the players that I'm definitely expecting to see make the qualification to finals. And if he does, keep your eye on him. That's all I'm going to say. He has been so consistent from launch to now, doing it all the way with Scorpion. Um, makes this character look like a million bucks. But uh, for now, that is going to be it for Video Games Yo, who manages to get a respectable fourth place. But that is going to be it for him today. As we go now forward to our losers finals, Boki versus Javier. What do we think here? Hmm. Because the know, last time, the last time we saw this matchup, Javier slowed it down to a crawl. And clearly, like Boki was able to play, but much like I said before against Kanamani. He didn't like he was enjoying it, you know, like, look, like Javier was ready to play at that pace and Boki was kind of having to like begrudgingly do it, right? Because that's just not the matchup. He'd rather not have to chase you the whole time. Like that much is obvious when you watch Boki play. He'd much happier, close range, bullying you, being the one that's kind of leading the charge, if you will. But and yeah, by the way, actually watching that replay back, it definitely looked like VGY was probably wanting to do low at the end. So unfortunate there. Uh, shouts to VGY for making it through and getting that top four finish. I know he's always looking for higher placings than that, but this is that third and final of the, the sort of qualifiers, I suppose, when it comes to regional. So no doubt we'll be seeing VGY in the regional finals, and there's still a chance to qualify through that. So the grind continues. So does the content. 
you know, check out the, the Twitch, the YouTube, whatever else that VGY does. Because now it's time for our top three. You know, you asked how I think this is going to go. How's it possibly going to go very differently to how it was before? Because now there are way more instances where we see um, Chameleon for Javier. The, I think it has to be a very specific matchup for Javier to still pick Striker. And I don't imagine Kung Lao will be one of them. Well, the main difference from Striker before to now is simply just a longer cooldown on the low grenade toss. It's a pretty significant, like, uh, longer cooldown than before. So, you know, you're definitely not getting as many grenades across the board. It was extremely important to have access to it against Kung Lao, and Kung Lao just as a character is playing a bit too fast to really stall out that time. So I would definitely expect to see the Chameleon throughout in this uh, from the side of Javier. But that is a very different cameo to Striker, right? I know they both help Scorpion in different ways, but I feel that Chameleon lends herself to being a lot more aggressive uh, as, as we're seeing from like, you know, large combo damage and extensions to things like the, the Hellfire, of course, you know, the access to Melina roll and whatnot, the Glaive for neutral, it definitely gets you uh, very far uh, in that neutral where you, you need so much real estate against Kung Lao because he's just always looking for that reaction punish, you know, with his armor, with Goro. Well, they can a little bit more extra damage if we could squeeze that out, but not quite. Not that it really matters. Javier's still doing exceptionally well in this first round. And the constant backing away. This is 100% how Javier's going to want to approach it. I mean, similar to how Kanamani did. Kung Lao is an absolute threat up close. But empty jump armor though, it. that's the adaptation from Boki. He right. knows you want to slow it down, but at some point you gotta press, and when you do, he's gonna armor it. Uh-oh. That actually might kill. Oh yeah, you're dead. dead. You're dead. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Oh, just enough. That's Thank that you. is that is awareness of damage. And able to keep all of his meter, too. Importantly. Ooh, oh, 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 Goro hitting made the Glaive not come back. Uh-huh. Yeah, Chameleon took a hit, so the Glaive's not going to return. Plus frames. Boki, a big fan of that string. Can't quite remember the input, but I know that it is plus, I believe. Let's take another individual buttons. A Goro misses. Beneficial for Javier because now he hasn't got to worry about Goro for a considerable amount of time. Even this, Kung Lao has to do it all on his own, and even then, still uh -oh. has no Goro. By the end of this combo, it's going to be Jade mode for the most part, unless we can squeeze out one more Molina overhead. Nope, it's Jade. Glaive. Whoop. Oh, hello. Flame into Leap, maybe. Here's Katana. Oh, oh no! Though Boki, he tried something specific, but I think that's what he wanted. A huge anti-air. That's it. What an anti-air from Javier. Clean as a whistle. That's gonna end game number one. My goodness. I feel like we so rarely get to see Javier even do that anti-air because he rarely stands at a range that he can get jumped in on. But when you do, my goodness. When you're at back two distance, it's a very scary anti-air. Very, very. And even here, you know, using the uh, the chameleon. Just every occasion, there's something. Whether it's... You get those confirms, it's either going to be button into ball roll, it's button into glaive, it's button into ground fire, into fan lift. Like, he can get big damage off any conversion, regardless of what the disguise is at the time for Chameleon. And that just comes with experience. He has played so much Chameleon cameo that it allows him to be so unbelievably versatile. And that's what Chameleon gives you. You see, it's so many different tools that every character has. But you have to be able to juggle them efficiently. Oh, actually spending both immediately from Javier. He really wants something big and he wants it soon. I mean, the cooldowns aren't that bad. Already got a fan lift. Punish? No. By the time Chameleon's back, it will be Jade available. Now the... Aggression begins. Armor immediately to answer back. Not an amazing no. answer, though, is to armor that. Because the, the the strike itself does about, like, what, 60, 70 damage? And then the armor's not a huge amount more than that. So it's good if you've already got a life lead, I think. But not an, oh, my God. <laughs> that was so good. Oh, no, he dropped the combo. Never mind. Still, though, has the life lead. There it is again. Goro. Cheeky, cheeky. You think I'm punishable? Here comes my giant friend. 
Oh, I actually was ready to pick that up. But that is a... know Javier is going to like the layers. Yeah, it is layers. It's something when he notices that you're starting to jump a lot. Oh, oh what a catch. That's what he tried to do versus Kanamani, actually. Fight. That is the same thing he tried. Acknowledges that. Oh, the trade. That is one thing fan lift does. It just puts you in a fresh animation regardless of if you've been hit. That was a full combo trade, my friends. That is and a big lot of damage. damage to get off of uh, practically full screen ground fire that he got a hit doing. Full combo trade, mate. Thank you, Chameleon. The Breaker, Boki, has to do this the old fashioned way. It's just me and my good friend, Goro. The Duck. Ugh. All right, combo number one. Weird Ender. I think it was prioritizing the Meaty over the Ender, to be honest, but have you managed to squeeze out? There's adaptation. Last time we saw Boki go for the Crouch. This time he goes for the mid ender instead to try and catch it, but Boki's not going to bite. It's now Jade time. A big oh, jump huge. in. That jump in hitting was not part of the plan. The breakup, oh. but no Goro. Ooh. That was good for Bar. Oh, was good for Boki. I and actually, now. even though Boki lost a round, that's a big break for Javier. So that's uh, that's actually not a terrible position for Boki to be in, as long as he doesn't get opened up. Kung Lao can't punish Molina from that distance. Not all of us have a Quan Chi standing for. <laughs> Imagine if he did. <laughs> I'd rather not. But he's got no pause. He just get a really long leg. Yeah, giant leg. Right. Four, three, two. Times three. Spear. Big plus frames. Oh, oh we just meaty. And that actually would have armor broken the wake up too. And just takes a restand with a massive frame advantage. Javier. Looking to close this one out. In what very a good corner escape. Style. Yeah, he's just not not taking unnecessary risks. Oh, hello! That overhead Goro throw, I mean, you you want to save it for a rainy day all the time. You can't consistently use it because it's reactable, but use it so little they forget about it, then you're in business. And it's one of those things that you can't you can't consistently rely on it, but you can throw it out amongst other things every now and then. No, no Goro, Goro, though. Oh, oh God! God! Brutality. That was disrespectful. That was one hell of a down two. I'll give you that. Off the ground. He was ready for it. He got up in the middle of the uppercut animation. He was, was even on the floor. He just existed mid uppercut. And he there we go. The, he was holding the button too. Yeah. He yeah. was holding the button. He to, knew, man. He was just confident. Just get the brutality requirement. He saw Boki doing this sick offense and he just said to himself, enough. And it was... And Enough here we are. Game this three. game is mine. That's all you need to know. I thought most people won't get that. Is that why you down to me? <laughs> Alright, you're fighting too hard now. Enough. <laughs> game three. games with my cameo. <laughs> game three. <laughs> Alright, the low. Back in for the meaty back three. Oh, you think you can press a button, mate? Guess what? You can't! Uh -oh. Big launcher. Nice pickup, too. Man, that whole combo looked like it was just inches away from dropping, right? Well, there are a lot of those ranges where Lao players, they'll actually forego the ender, because if they if they try and end in the flurry and it misses, they end up full punishable, but Boki, he knows. Still, though, we're talking combos. No need yeah. to go in. Much more comfortable at distance, because that is... Wait, I haven't got to worry about armor. Oh, no! Oh, you bro no. The EX hat has sealed your fate. Standing for Fatal this Blow. This doesn't kill, right? I think it does. It's 950 health. No, surely not. 950 health, mate. No, I think he's alive, but now EX Hellfire is a big problem. EX Hellfire versus Melina Air Psy, unless she changes. I, I think that's exactly what Javier wanted to do, but Boki called it out on the spot. He must have been thinking about that situation during the Fatal Blow. He was so ready. Well, you do get to do that, right? If you can see that the Fatal Blow is not going to kill you, you can think, right, well, I'm going to be alive. What are they going to do immediately? And it's, I mean, even you called it, right? So if the commentators are calling it, what do you think the, the, the top level players are doing? Yeah, they're 100% ready. Katana. Oh, no, that is disastrous because not only did Boki get hit, Goro got slapped in the face as well. 
He's not going to have Goro for the rest of this round. Oh. He's only just about to start coming back. Look how long that took. Oh, that was so dirty. Boki! Just ate three standing twos in a row. May as well have been match point for Javier, and Goro only just became available. Hitting Goro was a disaster. That raw overhead. I mean, you might think to yourself, like, you know, why is why is that raw overhead connecting so much when Scorpion doesn't have, like, the threatening point-blank low, but your, your, your natural state of defense is to crouch block because, you know, that's kind of the safest way to be on the, in the neutral. And then suddenly, here comes Chameleon Merlina. Yeah, not only that, but, you know, Scorpion's down three is down four. He's got a, he's got a really good down three, actually. Well, that's it, right? Normally, it's so, it's so safe. I'll, I'll, I'll finish my point later on because this, this match is... Uh... It's not finished, but Javier's looking good. Javier's down on life, but I definitely think he's winning the neutral. Oh, never mind. Oh, hang on. Super jump to save him. Boki was... looking all right, actually. Oh, I don't think Javier gets a break before the end of this round. That's it. Just enough. <gasps> hang on. Magic Pixel is Surely not going to do it. Sure, he has to dedicate and also not get hit once. Fire. Oh, no. No. Oh, God. Oh. What the hell was that? He tried to get revenge down too as well. <laughs> <laughs> that was a scramble though, if ever I've seen one. That was quickly a bit all over the place, but in the best kind of way. Which is great for Boki, because when you get that kind of scramble and you and you come off the better end of it, you know you breathe that sigh of relief. But for every sigh of relief after a scramble, there is a groan of disgust. Mate, that wasn't just spaghetti all over the floor. That was, you've knocked the, the jar of sauce on the floor, the pan's fallen off, <laughs> the kitchen's on fire. But still, I think quite a great way to start what could be a full comeback if you're Boki. Because that's not a great situation, right? Like, like scrambles, they happen. Even if you're watching top level play, scrambles happen. You'll, you'll go for a combo, you'll drop it. They won't expect you to drop it. They'll do something weird, they drop it. Like, it happens, right? At all levels of play, it will eventually happen. It's important to know how to recover from those situations. Now we go to the rest of the set, where it looks like Javier is none too phased about it. My goodness, the damage. We're in the 400s and it's still going. Uh-huh. I'm going to just meet you with another glaive, just in case. That would have been a delicious pickup if we managed to find it. Nice, nice counter this time. Plus frames. Challenges those plus frames and pays the price for it. Full combo now with your name on it. What's next? The Boki special. Up oh, block. Hello. Now, does Javier break? He does not. Now, how much wow. does Boki spend? Uh, now he breaks. Hang on. <gasps> you know why? Javier was not expecting that combo to do the damage it did. And the second he realized he risked losing the round, that's when he pulled the trigger on it. And he found the hit. Fatal blow. This one, folks, absolutely is going to kill. Do you think he was just waiting for Boki to spend a bar so Boki couldn't break if Javier then broke? It's a strong possibility. It was either that or Javier just wasn't expecting the combo to do the damage I can't remember if Boki did. actually had a breaker at the time. I think he did. Fine. Either way, Javier, match point once more. Empty jump, scoured out by armor. Wake up, that has just been a thorn in the side of Boki the whole time. He's been hit by almost every single one. Patience, Fantos. Chameleon aiding in that keep away game, that range potential from Scorpion. Of course, Boki squeezing out as much damage as he can. He knows he can punish full screen spear with a projectile. Yeah, he tries that again, the slower one this time. Oh, okay, no. Missed the up block, but the throw was not done in time to punish it, so Boki kept Could have been worse. a bit more. I like Javier's awareness. He knows that the ground fire isn't always going to hit. Oh, that no! Might be everything. Three bars. Done. One. Do we spend two? Do we need to? There it is. As Javier punches his ticket to another grand final appearance in a pro competition event. My goodness, Javier is on a roll, man. I don't know what it is about this player, but he has just gone from strength to strength to strength. With just that, just, just, just keeping the Scorpion dream alive. You know how he's doing it for the character loyalists out there. Breathing a sigh of relief. A Scorpion is uh, continuing to, to do well in the hands of Javier. But you know, the big thing about this is that Javier, he just, oh, look grinds. at Javier. It's just, mwah. He just so grinds, good. man. Like, he he plays 
I feel like if you were to look at it statistically, he must be in the top five of players that have hours in combat league logged. You know what I mean? Like, he must be. Kind of reminds me of, like, uh, going into Evo, uh, the second year. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Choking on my own rage here. Uh, Tweedy in Injustice 2, like, before the second Evo, where he had the highest amount of playtime online than anyone else in the world. It's like, it's a testament to players that are just practicing over and over and over. He All I'm going to say is I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Javier, on that flight to Brazil and back, had like a Steam Deck and tried to connect it to the in-flight Wi-Fi so he could play MK1 <laughs> while he was on the flight and back. On the plane? I watched movies I mean, on my plane and I slept a lot. Great. But he Javier, was playing. he slept, he dreamed of Scorpion Immortal Kombat 1 and new optimals and new routes. He woke up and went, wait, I've never tried this combo before. It came to me in a dream. But now he's in grand finals. He dreamt that too. Kanamani, winner's side, MK Javier, of course, has to run it back on the loser's side. Reset that bracket. Could definitely happen. But I mean, Kanamani and Javier, there is a very strong case to be made that these could be the two best players in, 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 in Western Europe right now. Uh, we see them being extremely consistent uh, in competitions, whether it's like community stuff online, exhibitions, and of course, all the way up to online and offline pro competition. Of course, you know, they, there is quite a difficult region to compete in to begin with, right? We have a lot of good players in this part of the world, but they do consistently rise to the top. And uh, today, that's a quite a fitting grand finals. They definitely seem to be the two players that I, I believe have played the best today. And I think uh, they definitely deserve it. But of course, we have to remember, as you can see on your screens, my friends, this is number three Europe West regional qualifier. That means this is the last one to gain any points to get yourself towards the regional finals. Where, of course, if you win the regional finals, that is a direct invite qualification to final combat in Canada in a few months time. So anything you can do now. These are two players that would have secured themselves for that finals probably by the time the second one had even finished. They were probably already confirmed. But you know, they're grinding, they're playing, they are hungry for that direct spot of qualification. And uh, we're going into it. Grand finals time to finish off today. Of course, we had EU East earlier on. And now it is time for one final match between MK, Javier and Kahneman. Let's go. For those unfamiliar with the double limb, let me give you a quick TLDR of it. Basically, Kanemani is still in winner's side. If he wins this three out of five, the tournament's over. If Javier wins this three out of five, he essentially puts Kanemani into loser's bracket to join him, and then you start again. So, short of it is, Kanemani has half the work. Or Javier has double the work, depending on how you look at it. Yeah, whether you're a glass half empty or full kind of person. I've said that already. Yeah, well... We're commentators, Jake. We're going to repeat wording every now and then. Fair enough. We look Big the same jumping. as well, man. Come on, we're twins. Hey, man, Kanamani's doing all right. Yeah, I said that once already. Stop copying me. I'm just trying to get you to move on. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, well, I can't catch the hint. I'm not smart. <laughs> <laughs> nice well, combo, those. by the way. Dude, those meterless Kano pickups are so sick. They're cheap. Oh, nice. Force lock. Gonna be protected from a lot of this. Ooh, not so much from the grab, though. And there's the meaty. That's gotta be one of the hardest flawless blocks in the game. I, I, I'm sure of it. It's just a meaty storm cell. It's just, <laughs> at any point, your best bet is to flawless block a string that it comes from. Ooh, too far away. Oh, you know who ain't too far away? That's standing two of Raiden. Nice whiff grab, mate. <laughs> Eat it. Knocked down now, Kano. All the patience. That didn't punish? Yeah. Okay, that's a surprise. You've got to be real quick with it. Oh, the catch. Couldn't finish it off, though. Kind of many. Low on the resources, but still quite the lead. All right. Let's see the numbers. Let's see it. Woo -hoo 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 -hoo! Oh my god, Javier, yeah, come on, mate. Look, I know that only did 240 because it was a scaled grab combo, but that was wicked. It looked cool, though, didn't it? It did look cool. If you think about it, actually, Javier yeah, won that run. But in reality, Kanamani won that game. The brutality as well. He's got the knives, knives in the him! Chest. Where are they going to go? Out. On the floor, apparently. <laughs> Imagine if he reappeared and Raiden had the knives sticking <laughs> out of him. 
I don't think he's quite signed up for that one. But he's a like, quick... Kano, we talked about this! A Kano quick game number one from Kanamani, though. I mean, we have to say, we, we've been talking at length about how strong Javier has been in this, uh, you know, overall kind of competitive season. And Kanamani just kind of walking through that first game. You know, Kanamani is definitely one to watch. But it's, it's, it's I, I think that the scariest thing about watching Kanamani is just, again, the optimization, the awareness. It's like he plays such a common competitive team, right? Like, like if you watch any competitive MK1, Raiden Kano is everywhere. But he truly is. Ooh, look at that. Yeah, but Javier sadly pressed the wrong button. Like, it yeah. actually looked like a down one. A down one would never have worked from that instance. Either way, the problem is a, a few miscalculations here from Javier and Kanamani is is on fire. On and there's form. definitely a huge amount of like benefits to being like grossly optimal with a character that is this. Oh, one, where that's a bad everyone break. is going to know the matchup, right? No one's entering a tournament and being like, hmm, Raiden Kano, I've not fought that before. But to like bring it to this level where you're squeezing everything you can out of every opportunity, it's, it's so scary. Hello? Mid what? That's a cool mid screen pickup. Is that double standing four? Oh, yeah, it's optimal. This yeah, can do yeah, a yeah. lot of damage. If you have the right kind of launch, the uh, double standing four is the most optimal. Not as easy as it looks, though. It's actually kind of tricky. You have to get like a little micro dash first, look like. Yeah, and you gotta have the height right too. But again, very MK Javier to like spend the fatal blow on what could <laughs> have been a confident comeback, but Kanamani immediately says no. And that's fatal blow. Back. Oh my good lord. Yeah, that, that fatal blow being gone is gonna be quite a problem for Javier in the rest of this game though. Ah, oh, Javier though, he got the up block throw and oh, look was at that. just minus like so small of a chance to get the katana that would have been a really big damage that's combo. not the first time we've seen kanamani go for the eye laser in this set and that's not a move i've ever seen a kano player do on purpose so i wonder what the source is here. yeah i mean i'm pretty sure trying to, like, go kano can, i think kano can spear it too not kano sorry scorpion <laughs> kano's gonna spear it he's gonna throw the scorpion spear stolen right a nice down one. Oh, did not expect the whole string to finish the threat of the storm cell is so extreme. Javier just froze up for a good five seconds. That is the testament of down back three. Oh, tried to flawless block. Held the Kano ball. Never mind. Kanamani looking so good to take this tournament. Oh, this is... How do you bring this back? Yeah, couldn't get the flawless block. But Javier, he's so good at flawless blocking uh, Raiden pressure, but 99% of the time, it's going to be like a string first or a button first. And Kanamani is just, he's using raw Storm Cell from ranges that it kind of connects, right? Using it on Meaty, that's a pretty common thing. But using it kind of like at sweep distance almost, just to only just connect, but not the full move. It's making it really difficult for Javier to find the consistent flawless block timing on. And it's such a, a crucial matchup changing thing is flawless blocking that move. And Javier is struggling to find it. As already, even with this kind of run we've seen Javier have, Kanamani, two games up. The tournament could be over in minutes. A problem that Javier has found himself with here is that he has not been as on point as he has been throughout the rest of this tournament. There's just been a few little mistakes and weird decisions that, again, they don't sound like much, but when your opponent's on the winner's side of grand finals and they only have to win now one more game, that adds up quick. Spends the Kano for the extensions. Yep, has one left in the tank. And an immediate... Oh, we even get away with down ones off of that too now. Kanamani really just brute forcing this continuous turn that never seems to end but javier finds a hit now this is gonna do over 400 not quite but still very respectable damage and another every single time javier finds any form of momentum kanamani just gets rid of it with electric fly instantly and that is tournament point kanamani has just been putting on that master class of the raven kano I've been using that that sort of talking point the whole hang on, time. Hang Lovely on. chase down. That is something Javier does. When you realize you're just starting to jump, he'll instant teleport to chase you down. That is a lot of damage off a teleport starter. Good lord. Yes, sir. Okay, Javier, signs of life. Backed against the wall as much as possible, but still adding. Not again! again! Definitely How many fine. times must we teach you this lesson, old man? No, but I, I think the down one might catch, like, it, it might be like a jump kick or something, but Kanamani's using kind of like the, the scooping jump punch. Yeah, whatever it is, it's the wrong option. And it, that is not the first time it's been stuffed. Big jump. That oh, one works, on. It's though. been a while since we saw that from Javier. Glaive number one. 
We're going to save the other. Does he have to spend the bar to open this up? Oh, and never mind. OTG off the ground with that EX Hellfire as Javier still alive for now. Can he clutch this one out? It's a mountain to climb. You have to win this round and then you have to win two more games. That's just to reset the bracket and start again. But Javier will not be thinking about that. He's thinking of this match and nothing else. Again. Oh, that neutral jump could have been huge, actually. I think. The... Oh, hang on. Kanamani's seen that one before, Javier. Instant up block, and now we are in trouble. Your All team, right. Javier. We're going to meet you. Uh oh. Staggering Plus frames. Standing two. It gets more and more dangerous now. We've dropped below that half health mark. Javier, he's got to find something. He's getting chipped down. So no! You're That's dead. It. Yep, just gets opened up. And with a swift combo, one, two, three. Kanamani is going to be not only winning grand finals, but getting back-to-back -back EU West Pro Competition Online first place victory. GG's. Scary display. That's what it was. I said at the beginning of the show, a lot of people out there are starting to consider Kanamani to really be possibly the best player in this part of EU. And uh, it's kind of hard to ignore the results that we're seeing. We're I mean, seeing it, that win is after a... win after win. It just continues to add up. That is just a hell of a result, you know, for, for Kanamani. Of course, you know, not only just winning the tournament, but a 3-0 over Javier, who's yeah. been on such a hot streak. Not only in this tournament, of course, but, you know, second place at brazil pro comp offline uh consistently well in online tournaments of all shapes and sizes in the in the competitive mk1 community um but kanamani looking completely unstoppable today and can you say a better a better like momentum shift confidence boost going into the next online cup for pro competition which is going to be i mean the regional finals you win that tournament you go to final combat simple as that kanamani has got to be feeling good about himself going into that. It's, it's the number one player to watch. And it is due to just pure success. That's all a player ever wants when they compete in a game like this, right? At the end of the day, you enter a tournament because you want to win it. And Kanamani is the kind of player right now that is not Look just having... Many. Three zeros, insane. three yeah, yeah, ones. Yeah. My goodness. It's not just a ridiculous path and, and constantly being able to dominantly defeat the best players in this part of the world, but... It's where you go from here, because should Kanamani be able to secure first place in the online regional? Um, and there's also discussion of points. Like It introduces such an interesting situation because some players are looking to get in via points. Some players are going to have the regionals. Some players are going to win a regional, but already be a, in a good situation of points. So I'm looking at Javier for that. I'm looking at Kanamani for that. All these players that they kind of have the best of both worlds right now. What kind of shift are we going to see in the coming month or so i think for me quite significant shift there's a lot to keep an eye on you know and, and even with that grand final set being a, a one-sided 3-0 it was 3-2 between them in the, the first round of the day so the it instant was. adjustment from kanamani is just so impressive um but no you're right it's 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 going to be an important month to watch <clears throat> if you've enjoyed watching competitive mk1 from launch to now this is probably the most crucial moment yeah, as we get towards combo breaker being the final offline tournament that will give points um we're getting now to the point that the regional finals are starting to take place of course some of legal latina is already finished um some of the other regions are now getting towards their finals as we go towards the month of april um and these players you know all eyes are going to be on the regional finals and combo breaker you know, they could be looking at who's going to win how many points do they have how much you know when they go to combo breaker where do they need to place to be in the safety bracket to get enough points to qualify and players all across the world that are competing in mk1 from the various different regions that are doing so <clears throat> they're all going to be having to answer those those very well i imagine are quite stressful and intense questions uh but that does do it for today as we have closed the chapter on regional qualifier number three the next time you see us for the pro competition online eu side of things it will be with that regional finals where again direct qualification stress pro competition hangs in the balance Do you have anything you want to say before we sign off yeah cheers that's it there's just you know these are always really really fun shows to do uh you know i've been very lucky that merely two weeks ago i was in brazil watching javier watching king gambler watching the best players in south america um come straight back do the american online tournament which was great up until 5 a.m 
all about Mortal Kombat. Love it. Not and quite now... as late of a finish today, though, I think. No, but it's, time. Uh, i got to say, a pleasure for us to be doing this again together. We actually don't get to commentate together as much as people may think these days, so it's always a pleasure to... to... Had fun, I mean, mate. Horrible for the production team. They've got to put up with both of us for a show, but, you know, all round, uh, had a great time. GG's to the players. Thank you to the production team for doing all the thankless jobs behind the scenes, making the show run and all that. Cheers, WB. Cheers, Netherrealm. Cheers, you at home for watching. Overall, this has been a fantastic tour. We are Ketchup and Mustard. This is Pro Competition. Next stop, for the most part, regional finals. We'll see you there. Take care of yourselves. Good night.